Dear colleagues, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all to Berlin for the 19th International Plasma Protein Congress. I would also like to extend the special congratulations to PPTA's new chairman of the global board, Charles Platford, who is serving currently as president of Plasma Derived Therapies Business Unit at Takeda. It's a pleasure to have Charles here today and tomorrow, and we look forward to his guidance and advice as we look to seize the current opportunities open to our industry. It always gives me equal pleasure to also welcome you to our first face-to-face -face meeting in two years, following the massive disruption brought on us by the COVID-19 pandemic. Aside from the all-important networking moments, it gives us a much better occasion to explore the challenges and opportunities that have arisen across the plasma collection landscape, and to discuss excess issues surrounding PDMPs. On the personal notes, I know how important good access to PDMPs is. I had an uncle who suffered with hemophilia and who died early in the 1950s because no treatment was available. As a consequence, I was never able to meet him. But my understanding on the value of PDMPs runs even deeper. I actually have hemophilia myself, and it's more than likely that without access to PDMPs, I would not have been here today. So I'm lucky enough to live in an age in which we have access to these life-saving products. Now today we stand on the brink of history in the European Union as far as plasma and the medicines derived from it are concerned. So what precisely do I mean by this? Well, there are a number of legislative and non-legislative opportunities that we should seize if we are to improve plasma collection and patient access to PDMPs across the European Union. First on the menu is the pharma strategy, which will look into how we can improve access to medicines as a whole by reducing our dependency on third countries for the supply of starting materials for these critical medicines. One such starting material lies at the very core of our industry, it's plasma and the EU continues to rely on the US for around 38% or 550 million liters of its plasma needs. The next thing we will need to address is the revision of the blood directive. This represents an almost once in a lifetime opportunity for us to ensure that plasma for manufacturing of PDMPs is awarded full recognition in the legislation as a unique starting material for many life-saving therapies for the rare disease community. We should also seize this very moment to ensure that the next properly and comprehensively differentiates plasma for manufacturing from blood products used for transfusion. Finally, the pharma legislation review offers us a chance to create further opportunities for our sector to streamline regulatory processes by recognizing the uniqueness of PDMPs, meaning we can get these faster to patients who desperately need them. How we will achieve all of this will form many of the discussion topics put forward by our distinguished speakers at the conference today. Given that we are in Germany, we have the perf perfect opportunity during this first session to learn about how plasma is collected here and to explore Germany's PDMP ecosystem. It is clear that Germany has a well-functioning plasma collection system where public and private sector coexist. However, because even well-functioning systems need regular updates to meet current or future needs, we will be exploring how this can be achieved efficiently and effectively. We'll then take a look at how plasma collection is organized in a number of other countries and explore how partnerships between national authorities and the private sector have been successful in their efforts to increase plasma collection. We know there is no one-size-fits-all model as each country has its own health system structure. So we will be looking at a variety of viable options to ensure stable and safe access to PDMPs for patients. We'll get further clarification concerning forthcoming changes in EU legislation, which we firmly believe could give momentum to increase plasma collection across the EU, and thereby helping us to reduce our reliance on third countries for plasma and ultimately fulfilling the EU aim of strategic autonomy. We'll examine how the legislation can improve patient access to PDMPs and how the private sector is committed to collecting more plasma in Europe. 
Next, there will be an in-depth discussion on the very value that PDMPs bring to patients and society. Patients are, however, facing challenges to getting access to these unique biological therapies. Whilst the debate on the prioritization and optimization on IGUs has in fact already begun, we know that restricting patient access would lead to a lower socioeconomic benefits, and it's not a solution to an ever-growing clinical need. We'll learn more about, increasing clinical needs, about the increasing clinical needs for IGs and other PDMPs and take a closer look at how precisely patient access can be optimized. We'll get an update on how, within the framework of existing regulatory policies, we can seize a variety of opportunities that will allow us to improve availability of plasma and patient access to PDMPs. We will highlight how specific provisions in the EU legislation which reduce regulatory uncertainty and make more plasma available for the manufacturing of PDMPs, ultimately benefiting patients in the EU. One clear option, for example, would be the implementation of an EU-US mutual recognition agreement on GMP inspections for PDMPs and plasma, which would help to avoid delays and duplicative procedures. Our final offering will be a portrait of the safety of PDMPs. As you're well aware of, next to donor safety, this lies at the very core of our mission. With this in mind, we'll have the pleasure of listening to a panel of experts as they discuss the latest developments in pathogen safety and pathogen reduction in PDMPs, such as SARS-CoV-2 and VCGD. They will also seek to highlight key regulatory decisions decision-making and challenges showing UK plasma as an example. Now, before I give away the first session and the opening speech to Minister Lauterbach, I would also like to say a few words about World Blood Donor Day, which we celebrate today. This represents an opportunity for us to also thank the countless and selfless people who donate millions of liters of plasma every year across the globe to help save and improve the lives of patients in the rare disease community. Our sector health authorities and of course patients express our continued gratitude for their compassion and generosity. Having set this wonderful scene, I would like to invite you to all sit back, listen, learn, and enjoy the conference and relax. But don't, enjoy, don't relax too much because we would really appreciate your interaction with your panels as well. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to give a welcome address to the participants of the International Plasma Protein Congress taking place today and tomorrow in Berlin. Blood plasma is indispensable. It's a very valuable source material for the manufacture of vital medicinal products. Its biological composition is unique. As a result, it cannot be manufactured artificially but must be extracted from plasma donations. The well-known slogan used by many German donation facilities, donate plasma, save lives, is therefore not just an empty phrase. For many patients with rare diseases, such as blood clotting disorders or immune deficiencies, plasma preparations are the only medicines available for treatment. Plasma preparations are vital for these patients. The importance of plasma-derived medicinal products also reflects the rising demand for such medicines. The areas of medical applications, especially of immunoglobulins, are increasing steadily, and the quantities used are growing year by year. Even during the pandemic, convalescent plasma donated by persons recovering from COVID-19 rose to significance as a potential immune therapy. This all goes to show that it is it very, is very important, important for us to secure, to secure the long-term long -term supply, supply of plasma preparations, preparations in Germany, Germany and the EU. With its, With its annual, annual collection of some, of some 3 million, million liters, liters of source, of source plasma, plasma, Germany, Germany is currently one, one of those EU, EU member, states member states that collect, that collect the, most the most plasma in relation, in relation to, to the total population. population. However, However, a large, a large part, part of the plasma, plasma collected in Germany, in Germany, Germany is not is further not processed here, here but, but exported, exported to manufacturing, manufacturing pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical entrepreneurs in third countries. countries. 
The COVID-19 COVID pandemic, pandemic outbreak has clearly, clearly demonstrated how indispensable it is for us to, us to secure the supply, supply of essential medicinal products, products such, as such as plasma preparations within, within the EU as well. As well. From my, From my perspective, perspective, it is therefore urgent that we address the need, the need to safeguard and secure, and secure the, the supply of plasma, of plasma preparations, preparations in, the in the EU as we as revise, revise its legislation, legislation on blood, blood and medicinal, and medicinal products. products. The, the aim, aim of EU, of EU legislation, legislation revision in this in context, context should, be should be to create, create prerequisites, prerequisites for plasma, for plasma collection, collection to take place, to place in, all in all and not and just individual, individual EU, EU member, member states. states. For the, for the total amount donated, donated within the EU to be increased, to be increased and, for and for the plasma, plasma collected, collected in the EU, EU to also, also ideally, ideally be further, be further processed in the EU. In the EU. At the same, At the same time, time, it must continue, continue to be to possible, be possible for, member for member states to use, to use suitable, suitable measures, measures to influence the amount donated nationally. One, One such, such measure is compensating donors, donors for expenses. expenses. Another, Another is conducting, conducting information, information campaigns. Campaign. Our joint, Our joint objective, objective in revising the EU legislation on blood, on blood and, and on medicinal products must be to ensure, to ensure an even, even more reliable, reliable supply, supply of plasma, of plasma preparations, preparations in Germany, in Germany and, and Europe. I wish you, I wish all, you all a very fruitful exchange, exchange at the Congress. At the Congress. Okay. Good morning, welcome. It's a pleasure to see you all here at the first session of this IPPC meetings in Berlin two years or even more than two years after the last one. For me, it's a little bit like a reunion of a family I haven't seen for long, relatives that were far away, I couldn't see during the past years. Um, in this first session, paving the way in Europe, plasma collection in Germany, tried and trusted, a success story. We'll have an introductory presentation and then a panel discussion. And I invite you all to participate in this discussion. And um, as our discussion will be structured in the first part on more plasma and the second part on PMDPs, um, after each part, we'll have questions from the auditorium. Let me first start by introducing our panelists. And um, I'll start with Professor Moog. He's a transfusion expert, has um, worked at DRK West, is an associate professor, was interim director at the University of Essen in the transfusion medicine, has then um, went into smaller blood, private blood banks, and uh, for a couple of years was in DRK Northeast as a medical director. And since 2019, he's a regional um, medical director for Octapharma Plasma. And um, not as a surprise, since 2020, he's treasurer of the ARGA board, the Association of um, Plasma Working Companies. And, um, I think uh, Professor Moog is a perfect example how coexistence can work even within one person because he's been in all of them, all sides, all kinds of, of companies. So welcome, um, Professor Moog. The next one, Svenja, Svenja Barkhausen. Um, we know each other for quite some, some years. And um, she started a career in um, pharmaceutical industry caring for active ingredients, then went into plasma, has worked for companies like Hirsch, Sanofi, recently changed to Hammer and with that to the Griffiths Group. There is now a member of, of the board, is responsible for plasma collection in Hungary and the northern, western, southern um, centers in, in Germany. And with her, we have a nearly 30 years of experience in our industry, and uh, I look forward to all the um, discussion we'll have. Then next to me, um, it's Dr. Gerd Glock. Dr. Gerd Glock is the representative here for the DSII, the patient working group for primary immunodeficiencies in Germany. He is active um, in the Frankfurt area. And the um, reason for going into um, this patient organization and supporting it is his son, who has a primary immunodeficiency. And besides um, the um, role in, in patient um, organization, he's a um, researcher, he's a scientist, he's been a lecturer at uh, universities in um, Darmstadt, Mainz, and uh, Saarbrücken, uh, no, Kaiserslautern, it was, sorry, Kaiserslautern, and is an expert in the field of uh, inflammatory 
diseases and cancer, and uh, also worked since uh, many years in biotechnological companies as project lead, as scientific director. So I bet he understands much more about proteins than I do. So welcome to this discussion. Michael Fuhr is a, has an interesting vita because he grew up at the air base in Frankfurt and uh, has a military background. Father is uh, multinational by, by birth, um, has um, an um, apprenticeship, has a, is a trained cook, has uh, worked in various um, hotels, restaurants in the Frankfurt area in um, Ireland, um, in Berlin, interestingly, at the Hard Rock Cafe, a very special one. And um, due to um, pandemic and, and restaurants being closed, um, he found caring for the elderly as his new um, profession, made a training um, on assistance for the elderly. And since then, you are at the Haus Havelblick on a daily basis um, supporting care for, for elderly. And the special reason you are here is not that you are a caring person by principle, but that you um, started donating plasma in 2015. So in my eyes, having been responsible for plasma centers, one of the lucky ones who started at an older age, most start younger. And your personal motto might serve even for the Congress, it's about being happy and helping others. So welcome, Michael. Last but not least, Stefan Proske. And Stefan Proske has a background in economics, has worked long years for Biogen in market research and uh, product management, then nearly a decade for CSL. It was the time before Bering came on board. And there he was a key account manager in immunology and um, responsible for hospitals. And then um, he went nearly 10 years ago changed to Cadrian Group uh, as a key account and now is a commercial director for Western Europe and uh, a truly expert in the area of, of PMDPs and everything around. So welcome, Stefan. And um, now I look forward, Professor Moog, to your presentation, which is titled Plasma Donation in Germany, Historic Overview and Future Outlook. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Chairman, thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, I also wish to thank the organizers for inviting me to this meeting. It's really a great honor uh, for me to be here and uh, to give you an overview about uh, the plasma collection in Germany and uh, at the end of my presentation, some future outlooks. These are my uh, conflicts uh, of interest. And let me, at the beginning, come to uh, the history of uh, plasma collection here in, in Germany. It uh, started in the 1980s uh, when there were programs uh, developed for plasmapheresis in both parts uh, of, of Germany at this time. Remember that we are here very close uh, to the former Berlin Wall and there were different developments for plasma collection in these both states at this time. Also, in 1980, there uh, was an um, informal working group uh, which was responsible for the establishment, coordination, operation of plasma free centers at this time. And later on, in 1994, there was the first national plasmapheresis uh, program, which was initiated by the former Ministry of Health, Horst Seehofer, and it was a consequence uh, uh, of the HIV crisis, which also resulted later on in the German Transfusion Act. Now, the reasons uh, for this uh, were as follows. At this time, there were no recombinant uh, plasma derivatives available, and that means there was a great need for factor eight or factor nine for hemophilia A and hemophilia B. And at this time, we had a very strong dependency on the US plasma market. And on the other end, as mentioned by Professor Lauterbach, there was a first call for European self-sufficiency, and there was a directive at this time. 
1996, uh, Arger was founded. Arger is a working group on plasmapheresis, which has been acting since this time. Uh, this slide uh, shows you how blood donation and plasma collection uh, are done in Germany. There are three pillars. Um, first, there is a German Red Cross. Second, there are state and community-based uh, blood donation services. And third, there are private blood banks and collection centers. For the Argel Group, there are 21 members, and I can show you that it is a very heterogeneous uh, group, but I can tell you later on that we have only one aim. And there are 92 donation centers here in Germany. Okay, let us uh, go a little bit more in detail about these uh, groups, uh, how they are acting here in Germany. First, uh, the German Red Cross. There are six regional German Red Cross donation services, and they mostly focus on the collection uh, of uh, whole blood, and uh, they supply about 80% of red blood cells uh, in Germany. And, of course, also they uh, collect plasma, and that's to say uh, therapeutic plasma, and especially in uh, the new states, uh, historically driven, uh, there is a lot of um, plasma freezes performed. On the other side, there are the hospital and university-based uh, transfusion services, and uh, usually they, of course, have the task of education, medical students and physicians, and they have uh, some special tasks uh, in the hospital um, focusing on the collection of blood stem cells of ATMTPs today, and uh, they collect also um, single donor platelet concentrates. Usually the collection of plasma uh, is, uh, is uh, in a low number, uh, at the state and um, u university hospitals. And third, we have uh, the private uh, blood banks and uh, plasma uh, collection center, which take care for the collect, uh, collection of plasma for fractionation and also for the collection of whole blood. And this means recovered plasma. Now, as I mentioned, uh, Agra is a very heterogeneous group, but we have uh, common aims and scope, and that's to say uh, we look for quality assurance, um, that's uh, the quality of our process for, for, for the donor, and at least, uh, of course, for the product. And we also do uh, some research, I will, as, as I will show you later on, and uh, we are responsible for education, there is an annual meeting where uh, staff uh, is educated, um, the nurses as well as uh, physicians, and we look, of course, for donor and product safety, and we know that we are responsible for the plasma supply in Germany. Well, this uh, slide uh, shows you the plasma uh, collection in Germany. Um, this is from the report of the Paul Ehrlich Institute pursuant to paragraph 21 uh, uh, the German Transfusion Act. And you can see that um, about um, 3 million liters uh, of uh, plasma are collected, most coming from plasmapheresis, as you can see in the blue uh, bars, and about um, one ha half a million is collected in 2021. Uh, from recovered plasma. This shows you on the other side, and this is a very important message here, the IGD conjunction in, in Germany. And uh, you can see that it uh, is steadily increasing over the last uh, years. And on the other side, uh, the number of plasma collections uh, is almost constant. And that means that we have to import uh, plasma uh, from abroad in Germany 
uh, to take care of our patients. Now let us come to the global perspective. Um, here you can see the comparison of two years, 2020 and 2019, and um, there is a drop in uh, plasma uh, collection uh, within Europe as well as in North America and all over the world, at least is in part due to the corona uh, pandemic and um, taken together from, it is about 14% for the US market and it's very impressive and we have to think about this. Now here, the European perspective, also for the two years, 2019 and 20, and you can see that there is an imbalance of plasma collection and uh, the need for IGD in the European uh, um, Union, uh, excluding uh, the UK. Uh, and uh, it is um, obvious that there is a striking deficit here and uh, we uh, have to, uh, we depend on uh, other uh, countries. Okay, this uh, map shows you the situation in Europe and you can see uh, that there are four countries uh, in the heart of Europe which are busily uh, collecting uh, plasma. This is Austria, uh, this is uh, Hungary, Hungary and um, the Czech Republic which have made uh, enormous progress in collecting uh, plasma and uh, this is Germany, which is also uh, busily collecting plasma within Europe. And on the other side, you can see that uh, the other member states where plasma is most often, um, the transfusion and plasma donation uh, system is also most often run by the states, is very poor. So this is also a forecast uh, about um, the IgG need uh, in 2020, comparing it with uh, 2018. And you can see all over the con uh, continent, that's the case for North America, this is the case for Europe, and um, the for the region of Asia and Pacific. And you can see that the need uh, for IGD will almost double in this year. So this is a cover page of uh, the German Medical Journal, journal and you can see that uh, there are um, excess issues for these pills but I had a look uh, and you can see it in the table that it's not only for these pills we have a problem with. Um, from the information of uh, the Federal Inf Institute of Drugs, I found out of 256 uh, drugs uh, with um, problems in the supply, nine IgG plasma components. And you can see this message is um, always updated, it's actual. Some of these uh, corporations are very optimistic and uh, hope that um, the end uh, will be at uh, the end of this month, while others uh, hope uh, that um, the lack of plasma uh, will be uh, at the end of this year. And this means action is needed. So what we do at uh, Agar is uh, to update um, guidelines. I will come back to this issue later. We have to raise awareness. And this means that every center has to make its own uh, promotion for the recruitment of donors. And there's a national plasma donations um, campaign which is funded uh, by the Federal Center of Health Education. And uh, AGA has also in preparation a uh, campaign and we are in close contact with an agency to do so. 
And on the other hand, there is a need uh, for staff resources to optimize it as well. For the moment, it is mandatory in Germany that a physician uh, is present for blood donation and as well as for plasma collection. And um, we hope that we can change it, but for this we have uh, to make a modification of the German Transfusion Act. First of all, we should um, look for specialized nurses, very well trained operators, and uh, we have the option to look for a physician assistant. This is a new job uh, group uh, with a university uh, degree, uh, degree, and they can uh, assist uh, the doctors. Of course, there must be a contingency plan for adverse events when there is no doctor available at the center. And for the next future, I think that it's very important to use more automation and to use digitalization. And of course, there are other options we have to discuss. Now let us back, uh, come back uh, to, to science and uh, to the update um, of guidelines. The background uh, is uh, for this um, scientific uh, paper. I uh, show you the abstract is that for the current uh, German hemotherapy guidelines, which came into force in 2017, there is a permanent donor deferral after three donations with an IgG level below 6.0 gram per deciliter. And when this came into force, we asked us why. We did found no reason. And that is why we had a look at the data of our ongoing uh, multi-center study about individualized plasmapheresis uh, group and uh, we retrieved the data uh, from uh, the study group with about uh, uh, one and a half uh, million donations and um, also from the control group with about uh, 100,000 donations. Uh, and um, we analyzed the data, especially for adverse events, that's to say infections, which might be due to uh, low IgG levels. And we concluded um, that the donor safety uh, is not uh, influenced um, in donors with very low uh, IgG uh, level. <coughs> and as a consequence, we made an application at the medical uh, German association as well as the PI, as the PI uh, to make a revision of these guidelines. Okay, so let me now come to uh, the conclusion. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has uh, made deficits very clear. Uh, it has shown that the plasma ecosystem is fragile. Uh, we need more uh, European plasma uh, collection centers and Europe cannot only rely on four countries which are busily collecting uh, plasma. Uh, the dependence on uh, the US market has to be at least reduced and uh, we think that there is a potential to make it better uh, the potential must be exploited and countries with existing dedicated plasma collection system, as I showed you, should uh, lead the way. And it is very important that other countries have to follow us. Public, private coexistence and compensation are keys for this success. The German plasma collection system is good, but it is not enough, and we are very busy to improve it for the first, for the next time, and we have to roughly explore and apply all options for treatments. 
So thank you for your attention. Are there questions? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Moog, for this introduction. My suggestion is that we take the questions and answers also to your presentation after the first part of, of discussion, because maybe we might answer already some questions or trigger new ones. Okay. So thank you very much. Yeah, now okay. let's come to the panel discussion. And um, as said by, by Martin, there's two perspectives on the German system. We do have the um, European angle, um, where the German system could be a kind of a role model for other countries to establish um, plasma pheresis in um, their countries. But um, also there's a national angle in which uh, we will see and we'll discuss that there is still work to be done in, in Germany. And we have got some, some ideas already from your presentation. And um, as said, please um, come up with questions after both of the parts, the more plasma-related first part and the um, PMDP part. Let me start with a question to Svenja. And uh, Svenja, from your perspective, um, what makes the German um, plasma collection system so special? Well, I think it makes it so special that it's um, the most liberal system that we have so far in the world when it comes to blood and plasma collection because also blood is, um, can be uh, collected on a private level. And we have proven that, we have heard it many, many times, the fear of a crowding out effect, what is not the case in Germany. And we have a coexistence. So the private and the public sector is working quite fine here, and we have proven so. And that is the, the biggest fear of those countries that are um, developing. And also we can see that uh, universities and having like a, a private collection center next to each other is not a problem. It's really a coexistence. And, um, but I do also want to stress out, it's, it's probably not the best model, it's a very good model because we are free to collect. We have um, 60 collections that we perform a year. We have a certain number of steps implemented. Is this thing working? Um, where we see we have a good system, but I also want to point out it could be still better because what Professor Moog was sending on ahead is that take it the, um, the IgG levels. I mean, how can that be that you're deferred in a lifetime when you're not even consecutively you donate? Saying for that you start your anking years, you start become a donor, and you like donating, but 21 is the first time you fall under the, the threshold. You go on donating. With 30, second time. And then with 51, all of a sudden, you deferred for a lifetime for the rest of your life. How, how can that be? It's not even in a consecutive manner. And this is what I don't understand. So this is something what I really criticize. Even though our system, I think, is a nice system because of the coexistence, and we are free to choose the place where we can open centers. But this is something where we have to work on. Thank you. Thank you very much. That triggers a question to me, to you, Professor Moog. Um, is there any justification for a lifetime deferral after whatever period in between three times low IgG in donors? You have, you have proven the opposite now. Yeah, yes, I, I think that there is no indication. Uh, we don't know who has made uh, these uh, guidelines without evidence-based uh, background, and we could clearly show uh, that uh, plasmapheresis is uh, safe uh, in these donors, with low IgG levels, and I would like to add that we have also um, personalized um, IgG management of donors with uh, low IgG level. That's to say, we talk uh, uh, to them how often they have uh, uh, or may uh, donate, and also about uh, the volume. And if you can do so, you can easily manage uh, and control this donor without any harm to them. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, you told me how you manage your IgG level not to be low. Maybe you can share this with the auditorium. Uh, certainly, certainly. Every fourth time I donate, a, I donate plasma, I always then donate full blood, and then I resend it to the laboratory. And if the rates are fine, yeah, then I go the fifth time to be checked again. 
Thank you, thank you very much. Another question to you, Svenja, as you are also responsible for centers in Hungary, and, and we have seen over the past years that um, the, let's say, um, average um, collection volume per inhabitant um, in some other countries, um, like Hungary and Czech, um, increased and passed by um, the German level. So um, what do other countries do better? Well, there's several reasons, but um, what I can see in Hungary that um, Hungary has uh, one advantage with, together with the disadvantage of that blood is being managed uh, prior, uh, publicly, but maybe that's not a disadvantage, but the collaboration of the plasma centers with the blood bank, so you're forced to have your plasma donor qualified by a blood donation for the public sector. I think that's a very, very elegant way to, um, to work together when the blood sector is not, pub, uh, is not private, but public. And what they do better, I mean, in Germany, a big obstacle for us is that we cannot commercialize the compensation. That every word we have really to balance when we want to put something in writing. And honestly, we can see that the driver for plasma paresis is a compensation, whether we like to hear it or not. And I personally think it's just fair enough for a donor that sits there an hour or a new donor, first time donor it comes in, take up to one hour and a half. So why not compensating? And then also to market that, or at least to say it. We cannot even say it in Germany. It's not allowed to put it somewhere in writing. In Hungary, you can see it right away on the, on the donation center we can put. We can even put the, the cumulative um, amount. So and that makes it a little bit easier. And also there the system is working from my perspective, is working very, very well with this private and public. I'm not saying that the German model is a role model for everyone when you say, I mean, you have to privatize also the blood, I'm not saying that, but at least allow us also to commercialize. It's really a big thing. We know from surveys that at the end of the day, a donor is not that altruistic and it's just fair enough to have, to have a compensation. And it's not, it's not a big amount of money that we're talking about. Maybe it's not that um, all donors are not altruistic, but um, for sure a lot of, of them are. And in my, my personal experience um, is that um, many donors start at young years because the compensation is part of it, but they keep going and later on they even donate their compensation to some um, organizations that um, are caring for cancer children or something like that. Um, question to you, Professor Moog. Is there any, any movement in, in the argument maybe towards um, getting rid of this um, legislation that bans any, any mentioning of, of compensation, which in, in, on one hand is, is yeah, I wouldn't say crazy, but um, contradictory. You, um, by law, can give a compensation, but by another law, you are not allowed to, to openly speak about this because it will immediately be regarded as um, commercializing, which is the ban? Well, um, I think it's a very um, difficult political topic. <laughs> As uh, Sparkle mentioned, uh, it's uh, very uh, important uh, to have this donor to come in for compensation. There are times um, of, of work, they have to pay for travel costs, and uh, I think uh, it is fair that there's uh, some uh, compensation for, uh, for this. And on the other side, as you said, we are not allowed to advertise with this monetary allowance uh, here within, within Germany. It's totally different than this is in Hungary. Yeah. Um, from my point, uh, Argo uh, does not uh, dare for the moment to make any change because there are the political power uh, not, not to do that from, from this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Michael, um, as a donor who started donating at the age of about 50, okay. as you told me, um, how, how did you get aware of, of donating plasma? Because you were not uh, at the university where all your mates um, went for um, donating plasma. So how do you came actually, into that? Actually, I found it out with a friend of mine who was donating plasma for a good while, and he told me about it, and then I got interested, and then I visited the center. And they treated me, they're very friendly, yeah. They gave me health check, and even I'm a trained cook, yeah. I, I saw and realized to change my nutrition, I live far healthier then, yeah. 
I lost, I lost weight, yeah, and I feel, my, I feel much better. And I liked it, and it's got a habit to me, yeah? I go there every two weeks, yeah? And if I need any medical information or anything, they're always, they're very helpful, they're really friendly, yeah? And I like to do it. And how many donations did you have since? Since that, I would guess about 350. Wow, that's a number. Yeah. You have, you've said um, the staff is friendly and, and you feel well treated there. Are there other factors that motivate you to take up the, mm -hmm. let's say, burden is too hard, but uh, take your time, take your way, maybe wait there a little while until you can um, donate? Uh, other factor, I read about it, there's a lot of plasma needed, yeah, and that we don't have enough, that we have to import it, yeah. And I think if people would help other people just a little bit, the whole planet would be a bit better. Yeah, I'm just a little, a little ice corn in it. Yeah, but it would be better. Yeah, we all can <laughs> agree to that. I believe. Svenja, um, you elaborated a little bit about the importance of um, compensation to donor motivation. Are there other factors, and, and maybe Professor Mook, you can also um, join in, that you would say that are very important? Well-being at the center, where it is one. Well, well-being at the center, of course, is um, very, very important. But also what uh, falls into place, what I really want to mention is that in Germany, we, we have an issue that we do need a physician on site. And I mean, really, these are healthy people that are coming to donate. And I think when you studied medicine, it's probably not really, really that dream job of yours that you want to work in a donor center and look at healthy people every day. So this is an issue. Of course, there, there are a certain number of arguments. We have, we've heard them all, and we know there is a base for that. But couldn't there be a different model, like we see in the United States or in other countries where the paramedics are there, or you have one MD that could come in case there is an emergency or a, a questionable situation for a donor? This is really hindering us. That's a big obstacle. Um, for uh, keeping a center open. When, when I say, when I see with, with centers where we have to reduce the opening hours, I mean, you have two doctors calling in sick, you either reduce the opening hours or they close the center for a day, what are you doing? And there's not so many doctors that are really available to do so. And looking now at the, at the situation of the employment situation, I mean, I say it would be more fair to have the medical doctors do their job with sick and ill people, not with healthy people. But that's a personal opinion, and I think that can be attacked, of course. But I mean, we see it in other countries, and the United States works well with the paramedics. So I, I would drop that for a discussion that we hear also we have um, something to do about, especially in Germany, because it's really, really difficult to recruit physicians for donor centers. Yeah, very, very true. Um, being a medical doctor myself and having worked as a paramedic in, in early years, um, I remember that uh, when we were sent to an accident or whatever emergency, there were some physicians that we hope are not there before we came because otherwise the veins would be gone. Um, so um, I wonder why to the critical ill people, um, the same medical association in Germany sends out uh, the paramedics um, and maybe a physician comes later with a second car or helicopter. Um, but the first ones to care are those, and they often do the better job than the general practitioner who's not experienced on a regular basis with those kind of, of emergencies. So, um, yeah, exactly. When you have a stroke, you, you call 112 and yeah. you get a paramedic taking care of you, and they yeah. take you to the hospital, mm -hmm. and then it doesn't yeah. happen. Um, Professor Moog, what do you think could be the resistance in the quite conservative um, medical association in Germany? that they still believe um, there are so many jobs that only physicians can do well, but still do not provide enough physicians. So if they keep it to them, they should care that there are enough physicians. But we have a crisis with respect to availability of, of physicians. Well, I mean, uh, there is a very conservative approach in medical education here in Germany and from the point of view how they should act as, uh, as doctors late, later on. But I think um, we have to change our mind. And that means for, for to taking care for these donors, 
uh, not only a physician must be responsible. So, as I mentioned in my presentation, we have to think, especially if, uh, even from the background of uh, democratic changes, we have, as you have, uh, enormous problems in recruiting uh, donors for, for the plasma con uh, con collection centers. Uh, we have to think that other um, groups can be respons uh, responsible and do the same job in a very safe way, such as very uh, experienced uh, nurses, specialized nurses, and as I mentioned, physician assistants. And only in emergency cases, a uh, physician must be able uh, to be contacted from my point of view Telemedicine is a very important issue, as we have learned from other, t uh, from other things during the pandemic. It is possible uh, to change these things, and uh, I'm going, I think Arga is going ahead to think about it and uh, to talk with the politicians about that. We have um, we've discussed um, the IgG as one obstacle on um, having more plasma. Others uh, might be further deferral criteria uh, like tattoos and piercing, who might elaborate on that of you too? Oh. Well, it, 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 can be, it can be annoying for a donor. I mean, really, if you get the question, it's, the donor shouldn't be offended. And we have to ask them so many questions that sometimes, I mean, when you look at the, um, the pie questionnaire, especially elderly people, I mean, you're, you're smiling, you know exactly what I'm referring to. So we want actually the donor to feel good and not that the donor has to expose him or herself in a way that makes the donor feel uncomfortable. That can be also the case in, in a piercing or in a tattoo. But well, there's, a, there's of course also a, a background why we do have to check it. But I'm just saying that the donor experience, what we at the beginning we, we were mentioning, that's a crucial point. And the donor experience is, is different, really different aspects. It's, do we make them uncomfortable with interesting questions, let's put it that way, make the comfortable safe to know, okay, if something happens, we can call a, an MD and he's there immediately. Um, we have a nice place where he or she can donate. We can assure we know what we're doing. We can also say we give something a compensation for what you're doing. So yeah, there, there are many, many aspects that, that fall into place here, but um, definitely the, the tattoo, like, some of these deferral criteria are an issue. And sometimes it's a very fine line that the physicians for first time donors, they have to walk on, not to offend the donor. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've seen complaints where you think, oh God, because it's also, the physician is, is not a moderator like you, and you have to balance every, every word, and sometimes it can be, it can be very difficult. For, for the donor. Yeah. I, I remember when I was responsible for plasma centers that we had physicians um, that had a very high rate of um, donors coming after qualification, and we had the opposite. So it's very true what you say. Um, they really make the difference, um, and some of them trend to tell everything they know, every risk, every danger, every question that could be difficult. Do you, Michael, remember your um, first first um, donation or your qualification, how, how did you feel when your mate brought you into, your friend brought you into the center? I tell you the truth, I found it interesting from the first time on, yeah, because they really looked after me, I had the feeling they really cared about me, yeah, and I learned a lot of things, um, I'm, but I'm anyhow the type who is interested in a lot of things, and it was a new thing for me. So I was felt well treated from the first time on, yeah, and they explained me a lot of things, yeah, what I should look about and everything. So I liked it. I felt welcome. That's very good. We don't say the center, but uh, they have done a good job because I think the first couple of donations are, are the ones that are decisive, how you feel there. And my feeling is that within the plasma centers, we are often masters of routine but we are cripples of individual care sometimes for the first ones. I've so often seen um, potential first-time donors or um, qualifications um, where they looked helpless, where do I have to go? The, let's say, routine donors, they know. They, it's like going into a sports club in a city you haven't lived in. And then 
nobody takes care. Um, I think that's extremely important. Was there a point when you um, decided, well, that's something for long term, or does it came by just from the beginning? No, first I was a bit scared of the needle, to tell you my truth. <laughs> I, had to, I, had to get, I had to get used to it, yeah. But I realized yeah, that um, maybe you never know. One day I can be in that situation in life that I need a donation from someone, yeah. And that made me very easily that I decided I keep on doing it. And as yeah. long as I'm feeling healthy, yeah. I'm doing so far. I got 62 months ago, I still go. Great. Okay. Keep, keep going. Um, what, what do you think is needed to, uh, to have more people being aware, the population being more aware about plasma donation? Um, I think the major, the major problem is here, people at school, I think people at school should be taught about that, yeah? that there's a need, that there's a demand of it, yeah? that we should do something, yeah? that kids, when they're growing up, yeah, that they they try to, uh, should be informed very well, yeah. What is going on, yeah? And think that this what uh, we opened up before isn't discussed enough in the country. That I think, yeah, we should do something more about that. Yeah, it's it's wondering me always why there blood donation and, and blood is is part of uh, biology in in school in Germany <coughs> mandatory, but uh, plasma not. It's mentioned as part of the blood, but uh, that it has a special role and, and can save lives is not mentioned. Do you have any idea why this came historically? That the plasma was more or less excluded? Well, it's not only the plasma, uh, I guess. It's only the donation of platelets, which is very important, for instance, for cancer patients. We don't talk about it. So if you look at um, school, they are only taught in biology about uh, the composition of blood, but uh, not what's going on later, how you need it, because uh, we have uh, no otherwise, we, 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 we have to rely on the blood components uh, still today. There's no artificial blood, for instance, in the, for, for red blood cells, there is no uh, solution at the horizon and as well as for most plasma derivatives, of course. And um, I think even today there was a call for more blood in the um, German newspapers. Do you have on, on the television? Yes, on the TV yeah, in yeah. this morning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was really interesting because uh, they, uh, it was an experience of a journalist who was uh, donating blood for the first time. I guess I, I missed the first two minutes. And you could get the feeling how it was and so on. And what I found really good, at the end they explained the three parts of can be taken from the blood, platelets and, and erythrocytes and, and plasma. And that was really um, amazing that they explained this, these details. Maybe I can add something to that. Um, here we see the problem. So there is an ad in the newspaper today that we don't have enough blood. But where we don't have enough plasma either. Have you ever seen that in a newspaper? Never. Have you ever seen that on a banner Never. on a bridge where you see there's a blood collection, please go to mobile on XYZ. This is, the, this is the issue. We cannot commercialize. We are, we are private collection is mainly driven by the private players. And we cannot commercialize, we cannot do the same thing like you could do when you're the Red Cross with, I mean, calling for donation. Yeah. So we all talk about it. We heard yesterday already that we saw that there was a call for more blood donations. But the plasma patients, you know it better than anyone else, plasma patients, your, your son I think has, has yeah. PID, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not a cure. He needs that for his lifetime. This is not a medicine. This is a lifetime support. And this is a different matter than, okay, of course we all need blood. Blood is treatment. But this is a lifetime. This is that he survives. It's not that he gets better, that he survives. And I think that's the major point that we always have to stress, that when you probably were first time donating, you weren't aware that you're just helping people to survive. That's right. I mean, exactly, yeah. I mean, constantly saving lives, not only to overcome an emergency, but constantly saving lives. And so I would love to see one day a banner over a bridge in Germany where they say, come to collect plasma. Mm -hmm. No matter where, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's Hamer, of course, it would be nicer. But anyway, it doesn't matter where, but um, go and donate.
I agree, hundred um, percent. Do you do you see any any role that um, donors can play in, let's say, educating the population or at least the mouse to mouse propaganda works? Yeah, but it's never enough because you have only a s small part. Yeah, you can tell it to other people. Yeah, and that's why I agree with Svenja. We should advertise it. It should be legal. Yeah, to advertise it and remind people that they see everywhere is written in Germany, spend it blood, spend it blood, donate blood, donate blood. Yeah. You see it everywhere, but you don't see it with plasma. That's really, yeah. that's a pity. What, that's a pity. What role should the um, Federal Center for Health Education should play in this? Because there was about 20 years ago the last uh, activity with respect to, to plasma. Can I answer that one? <laughs> sure. Exactly that role, because I mean, the, um, we're different private stakeholders in plasma collection, so we need um, a federal institution or a general institution that would do the, the general commercialization, like donate plasma. Because if it does, if one fractionary or one center owner does the, this ad, they could say, oh no, this is just for this, uh, for this certain uh, um, company. But we all depend on the plasma. We all want to grow more. And we saw per, per, cap, uh, per capita, there is still air in Germany. We can still do more. And um, so, yes, I see here a federal organization, um, general organization that would support more that question, that question of commercialize, of making it public. Is there, Professor Mook, any interaction between AGA and uh, the Federal Center for Health Education? Of course, we are in, in contact, but uh, we are not quite content about the activity of uh, uh, the central organ. I should we should we do more. There has been, uh, let me say, a very good start 20 years ago, but thereafter the curve flattened, and from now we need more input. Uh, I really think to to spread the information about plasma donation. What is the resistance you might feel um, with the Federal Health Education Center? So if you are in contact with them and they, let's say, do not go the way you want them, then they need arguments. Why not? Do they openly give arguments or are they just diving under the table? Well, I think uh, it's uh, the awareness about the situation uh, of on, on the plasma market, especially if the need of more IgG, as I pointed out in my presentation, it's uh, not not in their mind, and, but it it should be so, uh, so that we have uh, more advertisement uh, for plasma donors and to increase uh, the number of loaners. Mm -hmm. um, after having discussed a while the areas for improvement in the in the German system, um, the next question um, maybe to you, Svenja, is. Um, why could the German um, system nevertheless be a kind of role model or not a copy-paste, but let's say an idea for other countries how they could set up their, their system? Well, I think under, under the given circumstances that we have, what do we see? 92 centers and we have no chance at the moment to market and still we have nice an, an, a nice number of collections. I think that speaks for itself. So imagine if we would be able to, to, to market the compensation, how much could we contribute? So we are, we are already good, but we could be better. And this is where I'm saying, think about it, compensation for plasmapheresis. Think about it, letting it be private and the blood, yeah, I understand. I, I don't want to criticize those countries that say the, um, the blood collection has to remain um, uh, public. So I understand there are certain reasons for it. But then at least let um, the private collectors do their job. And then there's one more big, big argument where, where we can be a, a role model. You can buy plasma in Germany and you can sell plasma from Germany to other countries. Talking here, you said it in, in the initial um, sentence, you said they, the common market, there's no common market. And honestly, there is no German plasma market, no Czech or no Hungarian plasma market or Austrian plasma market. There is a European plasma, or there should be a European plasma market. So we show it's possible. So why are the big countries not contributing? I know we have this blood directive, and the blood directive needs to be transformed into national law, but why are other countries so hesitant? 
So we, we've heard already our dependency on the United States. And yeah, sure, because there is no European plasma market. And, and why? Why is that such a big problem? We show, we all contribute, we give jobs, we provide PDMPs by the, pl the plasma that we collect. We provide healthy donors. I mean, that was, I really like what you were saying that because it's very often criticized that the donors, we, we would exploit those guys that are taking drugs and they're anyway not in good health. No, it's the other way around. It's actually, you watch your way, you watch your nutrition, right? I, I see many students, young people here, they come there, yeah, the educated people. They're not going there to buy anything stupid. Yeah, just, just say it's simple. Yeah, this is, this is just not true. Yeah, or that the, that the donors, they come there, the donors do it for the money. I tell you the truth, if I would work extra hours, they would love to do it because they always need people to work in my, in my, in my work, yeah? The, this is, this is, this is just, just a thing what the people never estimate. Yeah? The people never estimate that, yeah? That's a collateral advantage. We create a, a benefit to the health system by creating healthy yeah. donors, healthy people, and, and also the awareness of what does it mean to contribute to a healthcare system for those that are, were just unlucky because they have a genetic disease. I mean, it's not that you catch PID. Like, you are just unlucky. And I think we have, we have the obligation to help those patients. Yeah, very, very true. Um, and I always wonder why compensation is regarded so bad by, let's say, a lot of organizations that are more public. Um, but a paid day off is regarded as fine. Um, I, that's I would, probably more I knew than what I would choose. 20 or 30 euros. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, Senja, what do you think, why are some or many of the countries where, let's say, everything is done through a public system only, are so hesitant to, to see and, and, and look um, what, what others do? Um, why are they not uh, open to plasma-only centers, as they trend to call them, um, and then reinvent them as a, as a great thing, though um, they have been around for, for years, but there's, there's so much... Um, fear to, to get close to the commercial world, um, but that hinders since decades to, except for, let's say, the, the German Red Cross, um, but uh, many others, um, to, to bring up plasma collection to a volume that's, that's needed. So what do you think is their um, problem? I think there's, there's one major, major issue with plasma and blood, it's very sensitive, it's very personal. So I hear from those countries that are not open, that are not trading plasma or giving plasma to, uh, for, for procurement to other countries, to other fractionators, is they say it's sensitive, we want the plasma to stay within our country. Well, nice for those that have a fractionator in the country, bad for those that don't have a fractionator in the country, and therefore they even discard the plasma. I mean. Look at that, we have a number of, of countries that just throw it in the trash bin. How can that be? How can that be? We have a lack of plasma, they throw it in the trash bin because it's considered a national product. And then what I very often hear from those countries in addition, well, we are altruistic. So I say, and I know that some here in the audience they will not like it, but how altruistic can you be when you say, you don't open a plasma process, you don't compensate but sure enough, you buy the finished product made from paid plasma or from compensated plasma. I think that's hypocritical. I mean, th this is something where I say, open the plasma market, help to contribute for every patient. And the finished product is not national. Now, the finished product is global. There are not so many fractionators in the world. Not so many, not every country has a fractionator and has lack of a fractionator. And also we see what happened to the fractionators that were just set on the national base. I mean, look here in the audience. We, we know what happens when you try to have a small fractionation facility and fill it with only a national selection. That's ain't gonna work. You never reach economies of scale you need in order to invest. So, yeah, I think the altruism and the sensitivity of the, of the subject, that's, or the pseudo-altruism, altruism, if I may call it like that. I don't wanna offend you anyone, please, but we see that those countries that have this argument that they say we want an altruistic donation, but they well 
need and buy and get the PDMPs made from compensated plasma. Professor Mook, um, what would you recommend to those countries? What might be the crucial point if, if, if they start from, and, and you have been in, in um, 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 commercial blood establishments, um, if, you, if, if you started there a uh, um, plasma organization or plasma branch as a part of such an organization maybe, um, if you would give them a kind of, of, of roadmap, not in too much detail, it might take too long, but um, some crucial points. Well, um, I think there, there must be um, a very good discussion with uh, politicians in this country, as has been pointed out. Uh, they must be aware that they need uh, the plasma uh, for the self-sufficiency, uh, not only to import uh, it, it again. Uh, and this, if you go this way, this might be an option. You can uh, increase the number of uh, plasma collection in, in, in these countries. As we have learned, most of them are run by the state, and personally I feel that there is no interest for them to increase the number of uh, plasma uh, collections. Uh, they are not aware about that issue. That's a very difficult uh, point. It is run by the state. There is no private uh, investigation, no private man who thinks about it, who has the potential and the money to Im improve it. And that, I think that's a very difficult issue. And in, in, in my experience, thank you for that, I would add that if you have a mixed operation, then what would you choose, half an hour for um, the day off with the whole blood? or one and a half hours in the same establishment for, for plasma. This is what, what I often saw that uh, it makes it difficult and the decision then is easy against, against plasma. Um, but, but plasma is not only, let's say, the, the legislative and, and political part. That's very important to set a, a good framework um, and basis. But um, as you said, there's no interest and in, in, in principle to be honest, plasma collection is boring in some way because it's like donating, 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 100, 150, 200, whatever, 300 a day. So it's like, like more like, um, like manufacturing. And this is not what the heads of, of, of full blood establishments like because they like science, they like cross match, they like being challenged. And, and this is for them, was my feeling, always kind of, of boring and neglect, uh, neglected and especially if, if it then comes to, to transportation, which is also a crucial part to, to get the quality um, of the plasma preserved and not uh, thrown on the way or wherever. What is your recommendation, how, let's say, to create this kind of awareness knowledge? Well, I think we, we have uh, to make aware um, <coughs> what our patients need. Um, and, uh, for instance, what we often tell them is about for immunodeficiency, uh, 130 plasma donations per year are needed for this uh, patient. And even if we go for hemophilia A, about uh, 1,300 plasma donations for plasma-derived factor VIII are necessary uh, to follow standard of care today, which is prophylactic. Uh, factor A the substitution. And this must be pointed out, and I think this is a very strong motivation for donors, for everything, to know that these patients are strongly dependent on our plasma and on, on the collections as well, and thereafter the fractionation, of course. Thank you, thank you very much. So, um, coming to our first, not end, but uh, um, to the end of the first part of this discussion, thank you very much. Um, I believe we have seen that at least the panelists believe that coexistence and, and compensation um, are key factors for the success and, and um, should be considered elsewhere um, where plasma establishment should be um, set up. Question is uh, now to the audience. Um, do you agree to this position or do you object? Um, I'm happy to receive questions if there are. If you don't stay up, this is regarded as full agreement. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question, great. Please go to the microphone wherever they are and uh,
give us your name and uh, affiliate. Yes, my name is Leni von Bonsdorf, and I come from the International Plasma and Fractionation Association. So as you understand, I'm a little bit on the other side of, of your panel here. I represent the not-for-profit fractionators and plasma collectors. And uh, of course, there are many things in your discussion I can agree with, so I won't repeat them. But I've picked up two words that you use as a mantra, and that is compensation and coexistence. And yes, we are also working on that part in IPFA. So for the coexistence, we are very keen on making sure that the public sector st stays very strong in this uh, plasma collection as well. They are, of course, the cornerstone of blood collection and have been so through the times. But they have, during the years, become very far away from the P PDMPs. When, they st when we started making PDMPs, it was really the Red Cross uh, organizations, and they were very close to the patients. But over the years, they have become more transfusion specialists, and they are very far in their, in their work from the PDMPs. And I think one of our missions and work is really to educate them and explain to them that these plasma-derived products are part of the public health system, especially in Europe where the public health is paying for these products. So when we are collecting the plasma, whether it's uh, public or private, it goes into these products, which are then mostly covered by the public health system. And we have to educate them on this connection that they are taking part in really treating the whole uh, scenario by having the donators, giving the plasma. It's going to help in the end, really, the patients. And uh, they, they, they don't always, um, let's say, they have become far from this, and, and they don't understand the connection. And here, one thing I want to stress in this di discussion is that, well, having plasma in a country is not automatically meaning that you have access to PDMPs. There are many other mechanisms involved. And uh, on a European level, I also agree we should have a higher degree of plasma in Europe and uh, we should, I want to make sure that the public sector is really contributing to that and for that we need also the help of the industry to educate the public sector how to become more efficient. In the end it will really serve you to have a good plasma source. So this was my first comment to your panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe. Maybe as you represent IPFA and, and uh, let's say the more public and, and non-commercial side, um, yes, I agree that the public should contribute more to um, to plasma. Um, but what would you would you say pro or against uh, having a private organisation as well in one of your countries? And uh, we know that there are already countries which have private. But it might not be the best model for every country. We know Europe is a very scattered area. It's not one area. And we have national legislations and traditions and systems. But I agree with Svenja, we shouldn't have any country that really discard their plasma. That is not in the interest of anybody. So I, I think we have to find the good models which also build on the public health system in that country. And that is something we want to work for, to look at what are good models for certain different countries, especially where the public sector can have a bigger role. Thank you. Dr. Weinauer. Hans Weinauer, German Red Cross. I have no question but a comment. Uh, talking about the public uh, advertising today that only mentioned blood, there might be a reason because today is the world blood donor day. Thank you very much. Any, any further questions so far? If that is not the case, then um, let's have a look beyond plasma collection and more towards the, the PMDPs because in the end uh, that's what matters for, for the patients. And um, maybe um, 
Get Clock, I can ask you um, the first question. So you are representing um, the patient organization. You have a son who is, um, has PID. Um, how were the recent years, um, not only the pandemic, but even before with respect to, to safe supply? Yes, um, we have had uh, difficult times recently, especially in the pandemic. And uh, in other words, many patients did not um, have access to the normal amount of uh, immunoglobulins. So we are talking about uh, primary immunodeficiencies where most of our patients need a uh, constant uh, supply of immunoglobulins from plasma. <coughs> Uh, so uh, we have made a survey and uh, about every other patient, so about 50%, were really strongly affected um, by, by the shortage that was, uh, that was coming up in, in recent years. And uh, so, uh, of course, we are very much interested, as we have discussed already, to, to improve the, the supply of, of plasma for, for the constant uh, uh, medication of our patients. Mm -hmm. And um, question to, to you, Stefan. Um, what makes plasma and PMDP so um, economically so unique and um, not comparable with other pharmaceuticals? Yeah, I think a lot of um, big things have already been mentioned um, when it comes to sourcing plasma. And plasma is more or less collected worldwide and um, with a strong dependency on the US. So we have seen uh, during the pandemic that this is a, this is a really fragile system, um, especially for Europe, and this confirms what you just said, um, that, the, um, yeah, that the plasma, you always have to have enough donors to meet the, the, the demand for plasma products. And this is not, a, not something you can easily plan because um, it's a very, let's say, a very inner system um, to build up new plasma fractionation capacities and then um, on you know no fraction and collecting capacities and on the other hand um, when you um, have situations like the pandemic um, that you suddenly um, don't have the, the raw material anymore this is completely different to to normal industry where you simply um, could let's say increase the production and try to meet the demand okay we have a problem with china now so the raw material, so they have similar similar um, um, difficulties at the moment, but for, for plasma it has always been um, that way. Then um, during the last years we, we have seen, um, because the, the, the demand for these products has increased um, um, rap dramatically over the years, um, that there was a price increase in plasma as well. So the price um, for, for plasma um, pure procured has almost doubled, or I would say has doubled um, in, in a few years. And uh, with an industry where the, um, the cost of the raw material that is included in the, in the final product is around 60% um, compared to um, a normal pharmaceutical industry where the, the, the raw material cost is between 10 and 20 percent, you can easily imagine that this has a dramatic effect on, on the pricing of the product as well. And um, coming back to the U.S., even on the supply, because sure, U.S. is a high price market, so the plasma stays there for production and, and, and for sale and doesn't go to Europe. So that is why it's very important that we have to um, try to get a, a better European system to, like, to collect more plasma here, not just in four countries. And um, one thing um, that adds to it is that you always have to see when you fractionate a liter of plasma, you have certain products you bring to the market. It's, for example, factor eight, it's albumin, and it's, it's immunoglobulins especially. And um, in, the, in the past years, so, uh, through to other therapy alternatives um, for, for hemophilia A, for example, um, um, you have recombinant, you have other um, therapy alternatives, um, the consumption went down and, um, and there was a high pressure on the price as well um, for these products. So um, it, then it comes more or less down to albumin and immunoglobulins um, to, to make the margin. And you, so you, you always have to see all these products together, not just isolated in all the markets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, question to, to you, Gerd. Um, what is the DSII, the patient organization, um, doing to secure, how, how are you working to secure supply in, in, in Germany and, and what are you, let's say, um, fighting with? Yeah. Uh, just uh, another point uh, to your first question. 
um, I think it's important to stress that for our patients, it's uh, really extremely important to have a constant, a constant medication um, because uh, they have an immune deficiency and uh, those people have uh, too little antibodies, no antibody response by vaccines partly. So and they are really desperate. We have really uh, comments that are, they are very really fearing for their lives. And uh, that is why we are uh, now trying also to, to, and we are doing that for many years now, to, to uh, in the public sector to inform about uh, about uh, plasma donations, as we have discussed that. So we are putting money into into that. Um, to uh, before we have done similar things about about the diagnosis, because it's a rare disease, and many physicians won't really know what the patient has. And now this is another stress um, on, on public relations sort of to, to inform the public uh, about uh, plasma donation. So this is one, one big effort that we are doing now. And one other point, um, I mentioned that about 50% uh, of our patients are affected now by the shortage or have been affected in the last two years and even before. And now we have another problem. We have, um, of course, we have new diagnosis for PID patients. And those patients won't get uh, medication. It's unbelievable, but we, I guess due to the shortage, it's very difficult for the newly diagnosed patients to provide uh, medication. So you see, uh, we are really uh, worried, and our patients are extremely worried about the shortage of plasma, and that is why we are very much interested to improve the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I wish you good um, success. What role um, do play um, the does play the current trend in Germany to make these um, biological products interchangeable at the pharmacy level even? Yeah. Um, I think this is a, a very critical point for us. I'm not sure whether this is really a trend, but I can imagine that some patients who urgently need their medication, they might be forced to switch to a different product. But the, the official uh, or the legal situation in the German health system is that uh, it's not easy and it's not uh, really plan to, to switch in the pharmacy, on the pharmacy level, to, from one product to another. Uh, the, the, this decision is still and should be, as we believe, uh, uh, remain on the side of the doctor and the patient. So the, the doctor can, can sort of make a tick for, for a certain, for this possibility to switch, but this is his decision and together with the patient. So we are not really favoring uh, this, uh, this option. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, Stefan, um, Germany, like um, many countries, has cross-contained um, measures. And um, what kind of risks do they carry for especially the PMDPs? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the, if uh, such cost containment measures are established, it's a political process that takes some time, then is going into legislation, and then this stays for a while. But very often, um, they don't take into account the, 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 let's say, the peculiarities of certain products. Yeah? So, so they, they're putting all the pharmaceutical products in one basket, and then they make a cost containment measurement for all of them, not um, um, respecting the individual situation. That is one thing. For example, if you take the, um, now it's discussed to have the, the manufacturer rebate increase from 7 to, to um, 16 percent again. That would mean from one day to the other, um, the, the, the revenue or the profitability of these products would go down not only 9% or even more. And this for sure is, is, will have to be, or it will have an effect on, on allocation, um, on, on contracts with hospitals and so on. So um, I would say, um, or that's at least what, what uh, we work in, in the PPTA for is really that the, the blood products are um, excluded of such measurements simply because of the raw material. It's not that easy to collect. The products are very, very um, complex to produce. And when it comes to, yeah, to the allocation to the countries, um, everybody needs them urgently. urgently. And um, such um, cost containment measurements can really lead to long term to reallocation to other countries and to shortage as you would just described. Like the, this exchange on the pharmacy level is one of these containment, cost containment um, measurements as well. So there are a lot going on in, in Germany, a lot of, um, let's say it's politically not 
um, favorable to um, um, work together with the industry, so it's always, they, they just try to save costs, not thinking about the background, not even willing to discuss sometimes from the politician side. So I was really surprised about the statement of our health minister. Um, so he did talk a lot about plasma, so it looked like he knew about that, but still um, the decision looked like they're going in another direction. Anything you want to add? No, I just want to uh, comment on, on Professor Lauterbach. He, um, he only recently became a minister, but we know him from over 15 years ago when we had a, a, comp a campaign about rare diseases, and he was very actively supporting us. And we had another problem with the regulations, and he was also supporting us. So he's very aware of, of, of us, of the DSIE, and he's also aware of rare diseases and, and so on. So it's not a surprise to me. Okay. Is it Does uh, it cross fingers that uh, okay. we will work in our favor? <laughs> <laughs> is it only saying, or will he take will he take action? So, do you think once this pandemic roll is over, he might uh, take that? Well, I, I hope so. I think he is a lot on his on his on his table at the moment. But uh, this speech really sounded like he, he has it on, on his list. Yeah, so on, I'm, on I'm more optimistic now. Yeah. Let's, let's cross fingers. Another reason for, for shortages um, during the pandemic was the parallel import regulation in, in Germany. Um, who of you wants to comment first? So what, what I heard was that the um, Austrian parallel import suddenly went dry. I think there are two issues with parallel import. This is, a, um, a, um, especially in Germany, we have such a system um, where pharmacies in the prescription market are forced to use um, a kind of re or parallel import from another country where the registered price is lower. For example, Austria or Spain. So we have products in Germany that um, um, in, the, in the prescription market are 50% um, provided through these parallel imports. Um, so one thing um, I think is the, is the quality um, assurance um, because they are buying the product in another country um, from a wholesaler, then they put it to the, the country where the facility is, then they remanufacture, repack it, then they reintroduce it into the country and we are talking about very, very um, delicate products. And um, this is why the, the biologicals have been banned um, for this kind of um, exchange. So the pharmacies are not forced um, for biologicals to use reimport. And um, I think in, in, in terms of quality assurance, I think it's, it's, um, this should be done for plasma-derived products as well. Because um, I know very often, because of during transportation, when we have temperature ex excursions, we have to throw a lot of product away. Um, and um, this is something that for sure a parallel importer um, will, will not do because they have to buy it um, at, a, at a, the registered price in the country. So this is one thing. The second thing is that um, the, the um, cost containment um, that was um, initially thought that would, would um, um, come reality um, didn't work out because these products are always only a few cents below um, the original products in the country. That means um, it's really negligible, the, the, the cost effect. And the third thing, is, um, as you mentioned, is Austria. Um, we had, um, so the idea was to have these, these re-imports or parallel imports and um, to have a, a better or a, a safer um, supply of products in Germany. But um, it, it, as soon as the pandemic arrived in 2020, um, Austria very quickly realized that a lot of product is going from Austria to Germany and from one day to the other simply stopped it. And if you are talking about 50% of the volume in the prescription market came from Austria, you can easily imagine what that means um, for the country. We are talking about dedicated packaging. We are talking about national um, and batch releases. We are talking about serialization in the country and so on. All these things, um, we have a time horizon between three and six months before the industry can react on such, such developments. And then you have the even, even stronger shortage in the country because of these parallel imports. Which one wouldn't surprise in an open common market in in Europe? Um, another issue with the um, PMDPs is tendering in some countries. Can you comment on that? What tendering in I think in for procurement of, of okay. So PMDPs. you have a, you have a lot of tenders um, worldwide national tenders. You even in, in Germany you have hospital tenders from purchase organizations. Um, I think it's a, it's a good instrument to bring um, supply 
um, um, the demand and the pricing together in, in times where, where the supply is normal. Um, then I think it's a very good, healthy instrument. Um, when you have a shortage, um, for example, uh, the, the tender negotiations for, for German hospitals are starting now um, are due and in, in mid of August, and uh, the contract starts in 23, um, sometimes even um, up to 24, so for two years. So, um, and, and you, you have to accept sometimes contract penalties um, in these in this, um, tenders. So, um, you can't plan, plan now for, for a sure volume with the, with the supply situation. On the other hand, you don't know how the prices for procured plasma will develop in that time. So it's, for the industry, it's not so easy to, um, to work in these tenders with the very strict um, rules at the moment, only at the moment. When we have normal supply situation, I think it's, it's a good instrument. When do you think we might be back to normal? That's a, good question. That's a good question. No, the, the Okay. okay, thank you. All right, um, Svenja, you looked like you wanted to comment. No, 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 no. All good, all good. <laughs> then I think we are open for questions from the auditorium, if there are, or comments. We have one question or comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I am Martine Bergeon, the, the president of IPOPI, and thank you for organizing this uh, session. This is very interesting. Thank you also uh, to Lenny to have the, the, the comments in addition to. As a patient perspective, we think that we need those products. And this is a very difficult uh, issue to consider that um, we need on the one hand plasma and more and more self-sufficiency in the country for the collection. But in a dedicated country, we need to have a panel of products because, of course, we need that the patient and also the physician have the choice uh, to the, for the treatment of the patients. So uh, this is something difficult as a message to, to have this because, of course, self-sufficiency in a case and not self-sufficiency in, in the other case. And I would like to highlight the need of cooperation between public and uh, private sector. I think this is really needed. Of course, we don't be naive because we know that you are also all competitors. So we need to have this uh, collaboration so to ensure that we have a framework, especially a legal framework, that allows the patients to access the treatment they need, and this is a vital need. And this is where we need to join forces, all of us, I think. Thank you very much for this important comment. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for the invitation. I am Cesar Garrido, the president of the World Federation of Hemophilia. So it's a similar comment about the previous speaker. Um, for the patient with hemophilia, for example, has been related to, they, they know the importance of the medicines coming from the plasma production, but I think that they don't think that their role is to get plasma. So that is something that we have to change maybe and to explore for the future working together, joining a force, and encourage them to consider that the lack of plasma could be the threat for them. But at the same time, it's important to be clear that for patient organization, at least in hemophilia, of course, uh, the, the most important is the, the quality of uh, the safe final products, the medicine, of course. But I think that we can explore different model, how, how it's possible to work together, encourage the, the society, you know, as patients, as the society, they can encourage the, their friends, for example, to, to be donors, all right? So that is a, just a proposal. Thank you. Thank you for the important comment. Good morning. Um, my name is Sarah Tasir Ben Sharif. I'm an emergency doctor as well as a health reporter at Political Europe. My question to the panelists is, it seems pretty clear that we have a supply and demand gap that's been established. The data's pretty net on that. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, there are patient populations, from my understanding, where PDNPs are the only treatment that they receive. And it's my understanding that there are patient groups where we are trying PDNPs either as a last effort or as part of um, seeing if they can provide some relief for their medical conditions. Um, so my question is, how much is experimental use of PDMPs and research contributing to the supply-demand gap, 
or is the shortage actually halting and um, kind of uh, cutting short any research into future uses or potential uses of PDNPs in areas where they might not have been established um, as being a first line treatment? Thank you. Yeah, no, I think this is a very good question. Um, The most of the product, what we see, because we do a market doing marketing research as well, so most of the product is really going to the to the um, vital indications that are um, in the label. Um, it's clearly CIDP, it's PID, it's SID, and I'm sure there is some some use of these um, drugs um, off label as well. Um, for, um, for example, um, we had in the past um, it was myasthenia gravis, it was. Um, um, dermatomyositis. Um, now they are in the label, so it's um, IVIG is really a treatment um, that um, has a lot of lot of benefits for these very rare diseases. And um, so research is for sure one thing where this, these products are going into, um, and just to see if, if that works out. For example, right now there's um, um, studies going on um, in. Okay, I don't know the right word, sorry. Um, but um, th there are more indications coming up um, really every, every, every year. And um, the question um, f of you was, um, shall we reduce this um, research and the off-label indications when there's a shortage and go more into the others? Um, I think this is already happening. Um, they are reducing doses, um, as you said, in the, in the established um, um, indications. Um, in the vital indications, for example, GBS, where you can, cannot do that, I think it's, it's used, you have to, and um, uh, what is not necessary to treat at the moment, as, at least as I understood it from the universities, um, um, it's, it's really not done in that extent that it was before when the supply was normal. Thanks. Thank you, Stefan. Well, not my field of expertise, but... Yeah. <laughs> Does that answer your question the way you would like? So the question for, for the audience was, if due to the shortage of IVIG, uh, trials for potential new indications are cancelled or postponed, correct? Not yeah, not happening at all. Mm, I think, it, because um, clinical trials are always um, not, you don't use um, um, drugs that are um, prescribed or sold, um, you're using drugs that are specifically manufactured or um, produced for these studies. And so I think this doesn't, at least in my opinion, is not an issue in all the studies that have been done before are continued. Um, I think it's only the, the commercial market of, pl of, of plasma products that is affected of the shortage. We have another question or comment. Uh, hello, my name is Adrian Gorecki and I'm from Poland, Austria. And I'm a, uh, I represent a um, health education institute, a think tank and NGO in Poland which deals with rare diseases. Uh, first of all, I would like to take a um, option that there is Dr. Klock from ZAI and say thank you for uh, ZAI's engagement and cooperation also with us with moving uh, patients from Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees with PIDs also to Germany. It's been a big deal in the last month, so I am really grateful for ZAI for uh, taking care uh, of uh, about couple of Ukrainian families that have been successfully secured with PDMPs uh, treatment in, in Germany. And of course I can only echo what my uh, fellow patient advocates from hemophilia and PAD field said. Uh, but I got just one question regarding the, uh, the earlier stage of the session. Stenia told that um, one very interesting thing. Interesting to me because we are in the middle of discussion in Poland about nationwide discussion what should be the system of plasma collection and fractionation in our country. There are many uh, different systems being considered by the authorities. And my question is regarding uh, the current legal state, legal situation in Germany. I'm also a lawyer and what, uh, what, is the, what I'm curious about is the fact that you said you cannot talk about the fact that there are private uh, plasma centers. 
And I would just uh, would like to ask if this is about, you cannot say about that you can compensate donors. You cannot say that you pay for, because this is a different wording also in German. Or you can, in general, cannot say that you are. I mean, you can only have the center, but you cannot do any kind of awareness campaign. This is my uh, question. What is the situation and why is that? Uh, maybe there's uh, one misunderstanding I can clarify right away. We can say they're private centers, but we cannot mention the compensation. That's the point. So but when the, we do the, the exit, uh, the exit amount or the, the, the amount the, the exactly, yeah. we we can say, come donate, be a hero. Okay. We can say, come donate, you make the life of another person better. And of course, every fractionator or everyone who is uh, who is running a plasma center can do that. So we can yes, mention the names like we do marketing as as HEMA, but we cannot say how much, and that is an issue. We do see that in those countries that can do it. Um, that's a benefit because at the end of the day you have to go in Germany you have to go to the donor center to find out how much you get okay uh, I understand so my last question is that that um, in the Central Eastern Europe they have been some uh, let's say recent developments in uh, plasma collection I mean Hungary but also in Czech Republic and uh, what uh, maybe you are aware of those systems and my question is mm, if you can Think about an ideal system in Europe. What should be the what what elements you will take from Hungary, from Czech Republic, from Germany, from Austria, uh, to create such kind of ideal system of uh, coexistence and plasma collection? This is my last and general question. And uh, a very very good question. Nice question, and uh, yeah, I'd love to answer to that. Um, I mean, that's of course also a personal view of, uh, of mine, but looking at First, you have to decide you want to drive the blood collection, public or private. Let's say we see also from the comments from the lady from IPFA that more common we find a blood collection on a, on a public sector. And then the question is, do you want to drive also the, the plasma collection on the public sector or on the private sector? I think the better model is to drive the plasma collection on the private sector because the investment is enormous. When you build a center, the investment is enormous. And this is for um, a state or public-driven um, organization. That's a huge investment. You can do it when you're sure you have the money for that. Of course, there are countries working on these models, fine. I mean, I'm not saying that it has to be private, but you have to make sure that you have the resources. And what I think is also a nice model to say, really consider a compensation because you would compensate anyway if you give a day off i mean what we were saying a day off is, is also money i mean we just see that a donor would rather take a voucher or a couple of euros instead of a day off because they have something in their hand so yeah it depends also on the sensitivity of the subject and if you have the um, the private collection centers we give jobs i mean how many jobs do we give in this industry 92 centers in Germany? Only HEMA is, is beyond 1,200 jobs that we give in, uh, all over Germany. So and then um, imagine how many jobs you could create in, in Poland. So think about it. I mean, I'm not saying there's, there's one model, but I think it's worthwhile to check it. Can you invest in collection centers if it has to be public? Or do you want to go to a private scale? And than even thinking about the compensation. Start, but start, at any rate, start, do it. I mean, because we've been hearing here for more than decades that many, many countries, they want to contribute. Then start, I mean, do it. If you want to start a plasma phrases on a public level, state-based uh, state centers, do it. Check it out and see how far you get. You'll see that, as we know from the numbers, from experience, it's probably not the quantities that you reach, and probably cost per liter is driving you crazy when you see it. But anyway, start it. Try contribute to the European model. Contribute to the European patients, because your son doesn't care where the plasma comes from. He wants the PDMP at the end of the, the day in his way. And, and so that's my suggestion or my idea. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, I cannot do it as I... I say NGO, but I hope that this message will reach our authorities. And uh, I hopefully, uh, I, I really hope to see a real plasma centers in Poland in the next yeah. decades. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Are there any further questions or comments? If that's not the case, we're coming to the end of this first session, a little ahead of time. Thank you to all panelists. Thank you to um, you, audience, and uh, for the good questions and comments. And I think we have discussed and, and hopefully um, brought across that Germany has some um, good model for plasma collection that could be a role model for other countries in Europe. We have seen that there is some need for improvement also in the German system, like the physicians, like IgG. Um, and we have seen um, that um, we have a single market for PMDPs, but not for plasma in Europe. And um, that, let's say, distribution economics of PMDPs is a very special thing and uh, needs a lot of attention to secure the access of, of the patients in need. With that, thank you very much. There's a coffee break now and then um, networking break. The question is, uh, Martin, when to reconvene? We are 50 minutes ahead of time. Schedule timing. So you have about an hour, half past 11. Um, we want to. So welcome back. Can I invite you to take a seat? We would like to start our next session. So welcome back. Um, we will now start our the second session. Um, this is about plasma collection models, seeking the optimum model. So in this session, um, we are having a look at different plasma collection models that exist. Um, as there's, of course, no one-size-fits-all model, we, we see that there are many ways um, of organizing plasma collection. There are various approaches, of course. Um, there's public, there's private, there's a combined public-private um, donation system. So we will get here an, an overview of practices um, that decision makers in national health system have considered and um, to contribute, of course, to um, implement a stable um, and safe plasma donation um, in different parts of the world. So therefore, I would like to introduce here first um, my first speaker. It's Dr. Miklos Zolnoki from um, Biotest. So he will be talking about uh, plasma collection in Hungary and showing us an example of coexistence model. So Dr. Zolnoki is an MD and a general manager of the Hungarian subsidiary of Biotest since 1996 and he led the company Plasma Service Hungary since uh, 2008. So he went to, to Semmelweis University um, in, in, in Budapest and worked for six years in the Buda Children Hospital. Um, after that, he specialized in pediatrics and clinical immunology. So he's also an active member of different organizations and the chair of the Hungarian Association for Biological Product Manufacturers and Distributors, the Pidicek. So please welcome Dr. Zalnaki. Good morning, everybody. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends. It's, uh, big opportunity for me after two years to uh, meet you personally again. Uh, after this lockdown, mm -hmm. I think for everybody is a very good uh, uh, emotional reaction, uh, that feeling that we can meet each other personally and discuss. Uh, many thanks, Alexa, for the invitation to have the possibilities uh, to tell something about the Hungarian successful source plasma collection. As I joined uh, Biotest uh, 32 years ago, I often ask myself whether I made the right decision to leave the hospital and join the pharma industry, and uh, can I help for patients also as member of the pharma industry? And uh, I think I can, and uh, therefore I would like to show you a short case, uh, a young boy. I got these slides from my colleagues. You heard that I'm a pediatrist and immunologist as well. 
So this boy was 10 years old as uh, uh, PID was uh, diagnosed uh, at him. And um, the diagnosis was the classical Bruton type uh, XLA, uh, agamma globulinemia. And uh, everybody thought it is an irreversible lung damage. You can see uh, clear here the uh, sick lung. Uh, and uh, however, after nine years regular immunoglobulin replacement therapy, we got after nine years a healthy lung. It means that uh, everybody who are sitting here in this room can have for patients. I reassure you that uh, our task or per performance uh, is very variable. So again, the sick lung and the healthy lung. <laughs> Clinical needs for immunoglobulins and human albumin has grown significantly <coughs> in recent years. What are the reasons? The reasons behind the increase of immunoglobulin use are very different, and I don't want to tell everything, but uh, it's very important that during the last three years, 54 new gene defects were discarded. It's a, a huge number. We are most uh, 500 different PIDs is known. The number of new drugs against B cells are increasing. It's cause secondary immune deficiency. It's very good products, but cause secondary immune deficiency, hypo, hi, hypogamma globulinemia. Three relative uh, new registered indications we have, you know, and approximately 50 or more off-label indications. If you see the German National Registry of Primary Immune Deficiencies, then you can see that uh, uh, 57% of the patients uh, have uh, hypogamma globulinemia, and uh, approximately 50% of the patients are treated regularly by immunoglobulins. Very interesting Hungarian data you can see. Um, in 10 years, the number of the PID patients treated regularly by immunoglobulins, uh, queen type by bed as of five times <laughs> uh, go up, and also the consumed uh, immunoglobulins for these patients from 40 kilograms up to 200 kilograms. I think it's a very good development, but I showed this in, in Germany, you uh, saw in the morning already, it's or, or, uh, about doubled the amount during 10 years. In Hungary, five times uh, was this increase. Here are the biological drugs I already mentioned and cause secondary hypo hypogamma globulinemia. So then also the human albumin uh, uh, use increased. One of the reasons is the withdrawal of hydroxyethyl starch from the market. <coughs> so summarize this part of my lectures we need more plasma, it's evidence. Uh, it is a typical Hungarian story, as I tell you. I visited with uh, Mr. Vela Illés the Biotest uh, Innsbruck Plasma Collection Station several years ago. You know uh, these uh, collection centers don't exist anymore. But uh, at that time, this former deputy health minister was the deputy general director of the Hungarian Central Blood Bank. We visited together, and he was convinced he was a very good organizer. Who it is a good thing. Uh, and he was a medical doctor as well, and he uh, at the um, Rettungsdienst, so the Nino Nino, uh, <laughs> how do you say, I don't know in English words, but uh, emergency uh, was his first job. And therefore, he was very open for, for uh, blood products. And, um, Later, he joined to Human Bioplasma, HBP, um, and uh, he used his excellent political connections and got from the Hungarian parliament a special permission to establish the first uh, source plasma collection centers as a pilot project. 
in 2005. And um, at this time, the legislation was not clear. There was no legislation in Hungary about uh, plasma collections. And then HBP opened his uh, second center in Debrecen, it's an eastern part of Hungary, in 2008. Uh, Biotest Hungary asked the Ministry of Justice and Ministry of Health to clarify the legislation because I didn't want to open uh, and convince my mother company to open a, a, a collection centers in an uncert uncertain situation. And we had to wait some months, but in April, uh, 2009, we got the positive response that plasma collected for industrial purpose is not part of the national blood pool. And in May, we voluntarily signed a cooperation agreement with uh, the Hungarian National Blood Transfusion Service. It's very important uh, that I was proactive, and I suggest also for you, be in other countries proactive. Try to cooperate with the government because nobody asked uh, me and forced me, uh, please cooperate with the uh, Hungarian blood bank. But I, as medical doctor, I know that blood is very important, also whole blood. And therefore, I convinced the uh, managing director of blood transfusion service, we should sign a cooperation agreement. We will help you to collect also whole blood. And since uh, the beginning, we offer our plasma collection centers for <coughs> uh, collect whole blood with the staff of the HNBTs. So not with our staff, but we offer our uh, uh, beds, uh, uh, we give uh, coffee, tea, uh, chocolate uh, for the whole blood uh, donors as well. And our regular plasma donors gives uh, whole blood most likely in, in all nice centers, as for example, in a uh, shopping center. So, and we opened our first uh, center in September 2009. You can see in this uh, map uh, the centers today in Hungary, altogether eight companies, because uh, Vascular and Sana Plasma belongs no, uh, today to Takeda. So uh, eight uh, uh, companies uh, operate uh, altogether 45 plasma collection centers, and uh, some new centers are under construction. Now, currently, the business environment is uh, regulated in Hungary. We have regulations, authorities, uh, companies. Um, the, these are the Hungarian organs regulating plasma collections. The health authorities give the permission for the medical operation. The pharmaceutical authority give the permission for the source plasma collection, storage, and delivery under GMP conditions. Then we have different ministries, <coughs> tax authorities, and uh, the cooperation with the Hungarian National Blood Transfusion Service is very important. Um, as I mentioned, we started this cooperation in 2009 with the blood bank. Then in 2015, uh, CSL and hemaplasma, former cat plasma, signed it voluntarily as well. And then since 2017, um, this, uh, uh, the signing, uh, the cooperation agreement uh, is already obligatory in Hungary. What are the main points uh, of this cooperation agreement? The number of the plasma donation is regulated 45 times allowed in Hungary. The maximum uh, plasma volume per donation without sample and citrate, 750 milliliter. <coughs> The total protein determination is very important at every donation. It is uh, um, currently uh, stronger than the law because we have currently not yet this cross donation system. We will introduce this, and after introducing this uh, system, maybe we can reduce the uh, number of the, of the frequency of this uh, determination. Then also the IgG determination at every five times, uh, uh, every after fifth donations. Donor compensation is fifth times of the minimum hourly wage. Uh, it is tax-free, but it is also possible to give the donors uh, vouchers, but uh, after this uh, we have to pay 50% tax. 
And it's very important, and I think it's a unique situation, but in, in the Czech Republic there are some similar um, <coughs> actions that uh, whole blood donation is obligatory uh, once per year, and it helps not to, to reduce the whole blood, the number of the whole blood donation in the country. And 99% um, of our donors accept this uh, special regulation that it is also uh, obligatory uh, to donate whole blood once a, a year. The, we, as I mentioned you, uh, you have to be proactive, and uh, it was also during the first COVID waves. I read in the newspaper uh, or so that uh, Hungary wants to collect uh, uh, COVID convalescence plasma. Immediately, I wrote an email for the Ministry of Health that we offer our facilities and our knowledge to help you. And uh, uh, in uh, some hours, uh, I got the answer that uh, many thanks, and we were uh, chosen as cooperation partner for the Ministry of Health and uh, uh, for the Central Blood Bank. Hemaplasma also cooperated with the Ministry of In Innovation and Technology with Orthocera together. We collected more than 2,000 uh, uh, from, from 2,000 healthy recovered uh, COVID patients, uh, uh, COVID uh, convalescence plasma. And it was uh, uh, infused, uh, transfused uh, for, for the patient on the intensive care units. So uh, Hungary is one of uh, Europe's top plasma collectors, uh, but doesn't uh, get enough uh, PDMPs in return. I think it's, it would be very important uh, to honor uh, uh, Hungary patients that uh, the healthy people give so much plasma. Uh, it is an, an official information that uh, last year uh, in Hungary were collected more than uh, half a million liter source plasma and uh, approximately 60,000, 70,000 recovered plasma. It means that uh, Hungary is more than self-sufficient. Uh, we need uh, 2,500 uh, kg human albumin and uh, a little bit less than 500 kg immunoglobulins, uh, IVIG and subcutan. You can easily calculate from this uh, volume of uh, plasma how many uh, immunoglobulins and human albumins uh, can be produced. So, uh, the six companies who are members of the Pharmaceutical Association agree on the following in cooperation with the uh, Blood Transfusion Service that uh, we would like to introduce this uh, National Donor Deferral Registry and also a cross-donation check system. There is a law in Hungary. Since 1st of January 2020, we have a law that uh, we should join to this system, but the system doesn't exist. And uh, uh, the implementing regulation was not uh, created. It means that there is a law, but the implementing regulation is missing. Uh, it uh, also two reasons, pandemic, COVID pandemic, and the other reasons is that uh, it's a very complicated, I have to the uh, that the uh, Hungarian National Authority for Data Protection and Freedom of Information criticized this law. So because uh, this law right that you have should uh, uh, mm, uh, add the, not only the insurance number of the, of the donor, but also the name of the mother, the birthday, and uh, a, a lot of uh, things. Uh, and the GDRP, GDRP uh, problem uh, causes. And therefore, we um, try to convince, uh, we have now new governments and these uh, um, six companies uh, make the decision. We will write a letter for the new um, secretary uh, of, in the Ministry of, uh, who is responsible for healthcare and also for the head of the uh, blood bank then we would like to go uh, forward and to introduce this uh, system because it is uh, very important to secure the plasma collection in Hungary and therefore we have to avoid that uh, a donor 
has uh, um, accident uh, or, or life-threatening uh, reactions because uh, uh, give uh, plasma uh, in the morning in a center and in the afternoon or, or another day, uh, second day in, a, in another uh, center, and therefore it is uh, very important. Um, only I, at the finish, I would like only one thing to tell you that uh, uh, I think uh, uh, other countries who doesn't allow the, to introduce uh, the source plasma collections for profit-oriented companies, it's a so-called hypocritical behavior. Because we know that uh, a lot of uh, governments give one or two days off, holidays for uh, whole blood donors. And I think one day free or two days holidays is much more uh, money that, uh, for example, you honorate with uh, 20 euro somebody who travel in Budapest one and a half hour to reach the plasma collection center, spend one hour there, and travel again one and a half hour home. Because uh, in Budapest, it's also in Berlin. You can travel more than one hour. So I think we have task, and we can, I think, if we act proactive, reach a lot of nice, uh, successful things. Many thanks for you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zorinoki. So we will hold um, questions until the end of the presentations. We'll have plenty of opportunity to ask whatever you want. Um, so I would like to introduce now our next speaker, who is Mr. Ahmed Sirak from Griffles Egypt Plasma Derivatives. He will talk about um, plasma collection in Egypt, an example of public-private partnership collection model. So Mr. Sirak is a consultant in clinical pathology and holder of an MBA in healthcare with over 24 years of experience. He has uh, successfully hold, uh, held medical, strategic, administrative, um, and managerial roles in healthcare, operations, diagnostic services, but also quality management um, for blood banks and hospitals and other healthcare facilities. Um, affiliated with the Egyptian Armed Forces. So welcome, Mr. Sirak. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dr. Ahmed Sirak, Strategy and Projects Officer for Griffiths Egypt for Plasma Derivatives, which is a joint venture public-private partnership established between the Egyptian government and uh, Griffiths, aiming to attain uh, self-sufficiency of plasma-derived medicinal products in Egypt. Uh, allow me at first to express my sincere uh, gratitude and sense of honor to be hosted here in this wonderful event of sharing different experiences in our industry, which I'm sure will have a great uh, positive impact and contribution towards uh, securing the availability and accessibility of plasma uh, therapies for patients around uh, the world. Today, the topic of my speech is uh, plasma collection in Egypt, the public-private partnership uh, innovative uh, model. Sorry. At first, I'd like to quickly take you through my uh, agenda, Egypt at a glance the plasma-derived medicinal products and the consumption levels in Egypt and the public-private partnership model for national self-sufficiency. Uh, At a glance, Egypt is one of the highly populated uh, countries in, uh, in the region, in the Middle East and Africa, with a population of over uh, 100 million uh, inhabitants. 63% uh, of this uh, population are aged between uh, 15 to 64, which is our target uh, donor age, and uh, we have a life expectancy of 72.7 years. As we all know, plasma-derived medicinal products are a unique class of biological uh, therapies, 
uh, that play an integral role in the prophylaxis and treatment of a wide range of diseases. In many cases, these drugs are considered to be life-saving uh, drugs, and this is the reason why they were listed by the WHO as essential uh, medicine. The reason why they are considered to be so unique, of course, is the fact that they are the only biological therapies that are solely derived from human biological material, which is uh, plasma. For this reason, um, these, uh, uh, plasma is considered to be a strategic uh, resource, as without plasma, there will be no products, and without products, lots of patients will suffer around the world. In the market, there are over 30 plasma-derived medicinal products, of which uh, albumin, IVIG, and factor VIII represent around 76% of the total market, and this is the reason why we decided to start with these three important products in our uh, project in Egypt. Taking a look at the consumption levels uh, of these three products in uh, Egypt, we find it to be significantly low, especially in IVIG, which is two kilograms per uh, million population. The WHO urges member states to establish and implement sustainable blood and plasma programs aiming to attain self-sufficiency. Uh, and accordingly, the Egyptian government took active steps towards establishment and localization of this industry uh, in Egypt, which has been a long-lived dream. However, in order to establish this project in Egypt, a few challenges had to be overcome. The first challenge we faced was to find the right uh, partner. For years, the Egyptian government entered into negotiations with many of the global uh, players in this industry, and we finally landed with Griffos. Griffos is one of the top players in the industry with a revenue of over uh, 5 billion US dollars, 340 plasma donation centers in different countries, predominantly in the US, and uh, four fractionation uh, facilities with a capacity of over 15 billion liters. Our second challenge was to establish a regulatory uh, framework for source plasma in Egypt. This came with the issuance of the law number eight for the year 2021 and its executive regulations, which came as a result of an intense uh, collaboration uh, between different uh, Egyptian ministries and authorities, including the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Higher Education, the Ministry of Defense, the Unified Procurement Authority in Egypt and the Egyptian uh, Drug Authority. We studied different uh, models, different regulatory models from different countries, and we more or less adopted the US FDA model, which is considered to be one of the most successful uh, models in the world. Uh, after adapting it to meet our local uh, standards and regulations. The law entails a compensation with a ceiling of 350 Egyptian pounds, which is equivalent to 19 US dollars, a donation frequency of 104 uh, times per year at a maximum, with 48-hour interval between donation and uh, a donor volume according to body weight, not accepting donors below 50 kilograms body weight, and the age of donors between 18 to 60 years. Our third challenge was to establish a state-of-art infrastructure for the project. Back in November 2020, uh, the Egyptian government, through the National Services Projects uh, Organization, which is affiliated to the Ministry of Defense and is considered to be one of the very well-established and organized uh, entities in Egypt, so NSPO, uh, NSPO came into a joint venture uh, agreement with uh, Griffles, through which Griffles Egypt for plasma derivatives was uh, incorporated with a capital of 300 million US uh, dollars. The partnership is for 50 years, and uh, the shares are 51% to the Egyptian government, 49% to uh, Griffles. The, the main uh, goals for Griffiths Egypt for plasma derivatives is to improve Egyptian patient access to safe and quality plasma-derived 
medicinal uh, products, and thus uh, promoting the healthcare uh, system in Egypt, and the localization of this uh, new industry to Egypt uh, with all the relevant technology uh, transfer. Through this, we are seeking world rec recognition with the, with the products through uh, having all the relevant local and international certifications and accreditation. So to the project, the five main pillars of the project are having a plasma donation network of 20 plasma donation centers to be located in different Egyptian governorates, a manufacturing facility uh, with fractionation and purification with a capacity of 1 million liters per year, expandable to 2 million uh, liters, a testing uh, lab uh, to ensure uh, patient safety and product quality, a plasma logistics center or plasma warehouse for storage of car and quarantine of plasma, and uh, Griffel's uh, training academy, which offers training modules for uh, our employees to ensure their uh, competence, because as we uh, realize this industry is new in Egypt and we do lack the relevant expertise. In uh, October 2021, we inaugurated our first uh, plasma donation uh, center on the outskirts of Cairo. And uh, this is the first EDA licensed donor center in Egypt. The building does not only include the donor center, but also includes a plasma testing lab, a Griffles Training Academy, and a temporary uh, plasma uh, logistics center. Over the course of the year 2022 and 2023, we are expecting to construct and uh, operate and start operations uh, in the remaining 19 uh, centers, so that by the end of the year 2023, all uh, 20 uh, donor centers will be up and running. These are a few renders of the manufacturing uh, facility uh, that is to be built in the new administrative capital in uh, Egypt. Uh, we are expecting to finish the construction and start operations for fractionation by the end of the year 2025. Our fourth challenge, which I consider to be the most important challenge that we are facing, is the lack of community awareness and um, public awareness with what is plasma, what is the difference between plasma donation and blood donation. What are plasma-derived products? What am I donating plasma for as a donor? Uh, is it safe? All these questions are very new to the Egyptian uh, community, and this I consider really to be a challenge. We are tackling this through a 360 degrees marketing informative uh, campaign to increase donor awareness with everything related to uh, donation in order to secure donor recruitment and also uh, retention of qualified donors through uh, a loyalty program. In terms of collaboration with the Ministry of Health, which already has six established uh, donation centers, the Ministry of Health uh, and Griffiths Egypt are very soon signing a contract manufacturing agreement a consultancy and services agreement and a quality agreement through which uh, the Ministry of Health shall be collecting plasma in its owned and managed plasma donation uh, centers. And this plasma shall be tall manufactured in uh, the Barcelona facilities of uh, Griffiths till we have our local uh, manufacturing facility in the new administrative capital by the end of the year 2025. So finally, Griffiths Egypt is the first public-private partnership in this industry, which could be a blueprint and a role model to be followed by uh, other countries seeking to attain self-sufficiency. Uh, we have the first licensed plasma donor center in Egypt that is licensed by the EDA according to the new legislations, the first integrated plasma supply platform in Africa, and finally, uh, which I'm very uh, proud of and grateful of for uh, being the source, uh, the first source uh, member of the PPTA in Egypt. 
Finally, uh, the National Self Sufficiency uh, Project is a very ambitious project designed for the Egyptian nation. We are committed to improve the quality uh, of life for patients in need and leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sirak. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce the next speaker. I wasn't sure if she would be here, but I'm very happy that she is, because um, currently terrible things going on in her country. Um, Dr. Oksana Muliachuk from Biopharma Plasma will talk to us about plasma collection in the Ukraine um, as an example of private plasma collection in Eastern Europe. So Dr. Moliarchuk is currently the director of uh, Biopharma Plasma in, in Kiev and responsible for eight plasma collection centers. Uh, prior to that, she was the deputy director of Kiev uh, City Blood Centers, and before that she worked at the Ch National Children's Hospital in Kiev, where she was also the head of the Department of the Transfusion Medicines. She holds an MD from the State Medical University and a specialization in transfusion medicines and a healthcare management from the National Healthcare University in the Ukraine. Very welcome, Dr. Maliachuk. Good day, dear colleagues. And uh, I really I want to say that my presentation uh, will with some another points what have another uh, speakers before because uh, February 24 uh, our world has changed I mean uh, world of Ukraine Ukraine people and also about company biopharma all my team and private my life also change um, and when I came back to Berlin two days ago I really have um, I had a uh, mixed emotion because I came here not like refugee, yeah, I came like usual uh, person from uh, plasma business. And uh, today I want to talk about our collection and the hard moment of this presentation for me was talk about our plan, what we had s four months ago. Uh, and we really believe in the, our plan four months ago. And now I really believe that we will come back soon for our plans, but now I just can open for you our uh, collection system and just talk about that plan, what we have four months ago. So Biopharma, uh, it's only one company in Eastern Europe which has a uh, faci uh, fractionation facility. And it's all, also only one company, only one uh, fractionation facility in post-Soviet countries. Uh, we really create uh, not only facility for fractionation and also over network of plasma centers. And uh, I can say that Biopharma, it's uh, organized with two hearts. Uh, one of them is a facility and another one is our plasma centers. Um, we create a really uh, modern biopharma technologies, but uh, the first of all, we also had a huge history. Uh, our history uh, since 1896. It was foundation of Bacteriological Institute, and after that, at 1968, uh, our company developed of technology for production of plasma derived medical products. And two, 2019, Biopharma invested more than $120 million in a new fractionation plant, which close to Kiev, just 70 kilometers. And now in Bilaterkva, everything is okay, but during uh, previous three months, every day we thought about the future of our plant. Uh, so also, we create a network of eight plasma centers, what we had before the war, but uh, our plan for nearly five years was increase our um, plasma centers networks to 25 plasma centers around whole Ukraine. 
We invest more than $20 million for all our plasma centers, and I'm really proud that I can present it now. Uh, what about our products? We produced albumin, it's our albumin, uh, BioVan it's our immunoglobulin, uh, BioClot it's our factor eight, and uh, resoglobulin it's our immunoglobulin anti-D, because we also collect anti-D plasma in our plasma center. Uh, so, <clears throat> the first of all, we spoke today about uh, collection, and uh, I want to spoke, uh, speak about my biopharma plasma centers. Uh, we also worked a lot with our Ministry of Health, and I absolutely agree with all colleagues who spoke before my presentation about hard point with talking with blood donors and plasma donors. It's also a huge challenge for all Ukraine. And uh, 2020, uh, our Ministry of Health uh, created a new law. It's a law of safety and quality of donated blood and blood components in Ukraine. And this new law really took us a lot of possibility to create a new blood system in Ukraine with all GMP standards. This uh, law take, took us possibility uh, have a paid plasma donation. And not only that, also, we have a possibility opening private plasma centers in different various infrastructure facilities. So uh, we can open not only in usual municipal blood centers or cooperate with them, we start started open in different uh, business centers and in different and other places where it's very good for marketing. And all of this period of time from the new law, we providing patients for, of Ukraine with a quality and safe medicine from plasma in 100% of volume of needed. So how you can see on our map, uh, before the war, we had eight plasma centers around Ukraine, and most of them located in eastern part of Ukraine, where I have a military situation now. So uh, we centralized our laboratory in Bila Tserkva. It's close to the Kiev. We centralized the warehouse also close to the Kiev. And now uh, we cannot reopen all of our plasma centers. Just five of them work now and have possibility to have a donor every day. But uh, three of them is are closed. And of course, I hope that we will open it in future. But example, Cherkasy, it's uh, example, Kharkiv, it's impossible now because it's really dangerous for all our staff and all our donors. But in the same time, how you see on this map, uh, we have um, Cherkasy and Sumy. It's a mixed plasma center. It's a blood centers and plasma center in one time. And we have a plasma and blood components donor there. So when the worm start, we work there every day and we had more than 500 donors per day at these uh, blood centers. So about our plan. How you see uh, on this picture, it was our planning for future nearest period of time. Uh, previous year was really successful for all my team because we create a lot of different varieties for all our plasma centers and all, also for donors. We collected more than 170 tons of plasma only in our plasma centers and we have a huge plans for future. Of course, now we understand that we will not have such, such result in the nearest year, but uh, our plan for next five years was to have one liters, uh, uh, million liters of plasma in all our network. Uh, it's a result of previous year. As you can see on the picture, on December, or the previous December, we have a result of 21 tons plasma per month from all our networks. And uh, it's huge than all municipal blood centers had in Ukraine per year. Uh, in generally, we had 172 tons plasma previ of previous year. Uh, our, center, our centers visited more than 51 uh, 51,000 uh, donors, and they uh, donated more than 
170,000 donations. Uh, our main goal was uh, have six donors per chair, and the uh, average number was five donors per chair. In some plasma centers, example, Kharkiv and Sume, because we really are proud about Kharkiv, the donor community in Kharkiv before the war was really huge. And uh, uh, in Kharkiv, they had more than 60.3 donors per chair of in eight working hours. And generally, before the war, we had eight, 150 chairs in all our plasma centers, and we really increased every month. Uh, also, one of the goal is repeat donors, and previous year we finished with number 4.5 donors per uh, donations per donor on average in previous year. Uh, and also about uh, uh, communication with donor. A lot of speakers before me discussed about blood and plasma donors. Of course, we have the same confusion in Ukraine. And uh, we had a lot of job for separate plasma and blood donors. Uh, really, we created last year a special website for plasma donors and uh, draw everything in yellow color because we really want uh, to, to communicate with everyone that plasma donors is also really, really important and it's absolutely another. That's why we use a lot a different web possibilities and special social networks. We really use targeting adjustment and uh, communicate and recruitment with donors. And I'm really proud because we create a lot of targeting and landing pages for different messages for donor and really showed for different marketing consultants that it's really effective. Uh, of course, COVID helped us with this situation and COVID helped us to show that we also can create community of donors, not only, not only using of different attraction, also using internet devices. But uh, of course, we worked a lot with different attraction. And example, last year, uh, absolutely at that same moment, because uh, we had International Blood Donor Day, uh, we create a special marathons and different events for all donors in Ukraine. And example, last year in that moment, I run this marathon. <laughs> Uh, so we really, Biopharma really create during all of this period of time, special community of donor. And our dream was and is now that if you say Biopharma in Ukraine, you mean uh, and you understand donation. And we really do it because uh, people separate in Ukraine donation in Biopharma plasma centers, and uh, separate donation in the municipal blood centers. But in the same time, we had a lot of volunteers donors in our plasma centers, and the form show that it's really effective. So um, 24 of February, uh, which our world has changed, and we had uh, new challenges. Uh, a lot of speakers before me uh, spoke about uh, COVID and the different challenges during the pandemic. Now we had another challenges, and one of them is safety. It's a priority. Uh, so uh, since of the February, uh, we didn't close uh, two of our plasma centers at Sume and Cherkasy because it's mixed plasma centers. We collected blood components at these plasma centers, and really we had such a lot of donors every day. Um, also, uh, our facility worked during all of this period of time because we understood that our military, our army, and all our patients of or, all Ukraine need such a lot of albumins and immunoglobulins. So, uh, during uh, this period of time, our company donated more than me to medicine for more than $2 million for our military hospital. And uh, we organized a lot of different strange process during this period of time. But in the same, we still work and we work in our facility and our plasma centers. 
And in the end of my presentation, I want thanks for all people who is here and who supported Ukraine all day. So first of all, I will uh, really uh, think really thanks for company Protea. Uh, they sent for us more than two tons of plasma paste and we provide 25,000 values of albumin for our uh, military hospitals. But in the same time, I also want Thanks for all, for all companies uh, who is present here and in other companies all over the world because such helping and such possibilities what open all companies and all people all over the world for our country, it's imposi impossible to describe. It's just feelings. I want, again, thanks for all people and I want to say that we, of course, believe that Ukraine will win we absolutely know that Brave is be a donor of Biopharma. It's be a donor in Ukraine now. And uh, I absolutely believe that uh, we will have a victory, but it will victory not only of Ukraine and Ukraine people. It will victory of all communities of people who supported us every day. Thank you so much. And I believe in Ukraine. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moliachu, for this very inspiring talk. Um, the last speaker of our session is uh, Gerard Gogarty from the NHS Blood and Transplant. He will talk about uh, plasma collection in the UK, an example of a um, newly introduced plasma collection uh, model, a public one. They only very recently uh, restarted plasma collections. So Mr. Gogarty is currently the director of Plasma for Medicines uh, for NHS, Blood and Transplant. The role initially entailed the establishment of new plasma supply chain to collect um, COVID-19 convalescent plasma. Some of this infrastructure has now been repurposed to collect plasma for medicines. So previously, he led on strategy and change for blood supply with responsibility for the transformation program. Prior to joining um, NHSBT, he led the successful transformation of centrally founded and local government education functions to operate commercially in the competitive market. Welcome, Jerry Gogarty. Good afternoon. Uh, Thank you to the PPTA for this uh, invitation. It's an honor to speak at this conference. Um, and indeed, it's, it's a delight to be back around the plasma industry table after some 20 years. Um, although I don't relish following the fantastic, inspiring talk from our Ukrainian colleague. Uh, nonetheless, um, we've been away for some 20 years. Um, what I'll do today is just give you an update on where we are in, uh, in England, I can't talk for the UK, but I will ref give you an update on, on the UK position, but I'll be giving a presentation on the activity that's underway in, in England. And HSBT is responsible for organ donation across the UK, but for blood and plasma, just for England. Um, I'll give you an insight into our journey so far and how it is that we're here today. Um, something around our marketing, which I think will be of interest given the discussions we've had this morning around how to attract and retrain, retain donors, um, and also the next steps for us. So making every drop of plasma count is a bit of a mantra for us. Why? Uh, for the last 10, 20 years, our uh, business has really seen plasma as very much a secondary product. Um, we haven't viewed it as the same importance as red cells, platelets, because either we have been directing it to diagnostics or uh, we've been paying to waste it um, because of the ban on, on uh, UK plasma, the risk of ECJD. So we're changing the culture in our organization that plasma has the same status as red cells, the same importance, um, and 
explain to our staff there's patients at the end of all of these products, not just red cells. So a real cultural change internally. Uh, we've got an immediate um, target um, to deliver 20% self-sufficiency self in IG, um, and we'll achieve that in the next year or so. Um, and that will build a foundation to meet a further ambition of 30% and beyond. And we talk about delivering a world-class plasma service to support patients in England. And we come really to this table very humbly because we've not been in, the, in this industry, much like uh, uh, the presentation from Egypt. We're learning, uh, and we're learning from others, and we're really hungry to learn. So in terms of the journey so far, um, in 2020, we were contacted by uh, the NHS, by government, and asked to step up a convalescent plasma supply chain to support two trials. Uh, recovery trial and remap cap, um, which uh, you know, you, I'm sure you will be aware of. To deliver against that requirement, we set up a new marketing capability, an NCC, a contact center capability. We had to set up manufacturing capacity and capability, new freezers. We had to implement new testing. And we implemented plasma collection in over 40 centers. 21 of those were brand new centers. Um, that, um, that we opened at real pace. Typically, it would take us around 20 months from initial concept to opening, uh, to open a new center. At one stage, we opened 14 convalescent plasma clinics in some three months. Um, we recruited around 1,700 staff and trained them, and there was a real focus on changing our workforce. Um, in particular, again, in, in England, um, a lot of the BAME community were really hardly, harshly hit by co the COVID pandemic, um, and we sought to get a workforce that reflected the community we were serving. So normally our um, black and ethnic minority nurses would be 13% of our workforce. For plasma, we increased that to 42%, and for our donor carers, normally 9%. And we've been able to increase that to 26% for plasma. Uh, in terms of training, Normally, it would take us 12 weeks to train the staff. We reduced that to six weeks. So uh, it was an increasing challenge as time went by, as a high level of antibodies can only be found in a ever smaller segment of donors. And by the end of that uh, program, we were sending kits to uh, the public's home to find out their antibody levels and invite them in. Um, we got a lot of help from the industry, in particular, from uh, the ABO, the EBA, the Canadians, um, the Australians, uh, the French Sanguine, who shared with us all their operating procedures, their protocols, their operating models to enable us to set up that supply chain. So we're really very grateful we could not have done it without strong collaboration with both the public and the private sectors. Uh, then um, those trials reported, we supported around uh, 16,000 randomized patients and it was found that convalescent plasma was not an effective treatment uh, for COVID. There is a postscript to that, in that further analysis on the data has found that there is a segment of immunocompromised patients where it may be effective, and we've just restarted that remat cat trial in recent weeks. So our fingers crossed that it will prove to be effective in the long run. Um, and then in April 21, uh, following a lifting of the ban in, U in the UK, around UK plasma for immunoglobulins. We started to transition some of that infrastructure, the convalescent plasma infrastructure that we built for plasma for medicines for immunoglobulins. The MHRA will be reviewing albumin in coming months. We hope to add that to the portfolio. Um, and again, I just want to recognize in pivoting from convalescent plasma to plasma for medicines, the support we've had from the fractionator industry who reviewed and shared us documentation with us, reviewed our SOPs to ensure that we were compliant with, um, with the requirements for immunoglobulin um, supply chain. So thank you for your support in that. Um, we have um, retained uh, a, a small number of clinics, and we're ramping up source plasma. Um, and at the moment, we're going through a, a procurement process to find a fractionator partner, and we're storing plasma at the moment in advance of that, um, that engagement. Today, we have got uh, three plasma clinics, um, plasma-only clinics, 
one in, um, in, Red, in Reading, one in uh, um, Twickenham, and one in Birmingham. Two of those are new um, convalescent plasma clinics that we converted. The Birmingham site was above one of our clinics. We took a floor and built um, a new convalescent plasma clinic there. So we've transitioned those to, um, to plasma for medicines. And we've got three manufacturing sites in, in Bristol, in Collendale, and in Manchester. It's an important week for us because two of those sites this week we're going to the first time seven days collection uh, of recovered. So we're ramping up at the moment um, and really going through a significant scale up. In terms of our foundations, you know, our starting point is 20% self-sufficiency. Um, we've got the three manufacturing sites, we've got around 100 staff. We will collect and we're going to store around a uh, quarter of a million litres by October 23 when we are planning to dispatch that to the fractionator we partner with, um, and we're recruiting around 10,000 uh, new donors, um, and the aim is around five, five donations per year. But really the important point for us over the next 12 to 18 months, I think is less about this activity, but more about a test and learn process, that we understand what makes an effective operation so that when we come to scaling up beyond the 20, 30%, we really understand what an excellent operating model looks like and we're able to scale up with confidence. And we'll be encouraging our team to try new things. And there was sort of a comment earlier on about whether the public sector is up for learning. Well, we are. Um, we'll be trying a lot of things. Some of those will work, some of them will fail. Um, but I think if we don't innovate, then we're not likely to deliver the success that, um, that we aspire to and that the patients in, in England and the UK uh, deserve. Um, plasma, it's in you. Um, what we found is that um, only one in five of the public know that plasma is in you. Obviously, we've not been in this market for some 20 years, so there's a real education process required for us to go out there and work with the public to promote and educate around uh, the plasma requirements. Um, this is a bit of a busy spot slide, so I'm just going to pick out one or two points. Um, but we are we need to leverage the government infrastructure and the NHS infrastructure. We can't treat plasma as a side issue. It's got to be integrated with how we work. So uh, one of the things we've done is the public in England have got access to an NHS app. Um, and a great um, uh, innovation has been that, again, this week and next week, we're getting a push notification to the public via the NH app, NHS app promoting plasma donation. So again, leveraging the wider uh, government infrastructure will be key for us. And that's just one example. Um, Hyper-local marketing is absolutely key because we've only got three clinics. So the focus will be very much around building alliances with local organizations, local businesses, building awareness, and local recruitment. Um, our creative, we've done a lot of testing in terms of what appeals to donors, our staff, other stakeholders, and this is the one which was most successful. And we've had great feedback from stakeholders about this. So plasma is needed to create unique, life-saving medicines, and amazingly, it's in you. So this is a creative that we're currently using. We've had great feedback on it, and we're having that updated to also present a um, promotion for, for women and for female donors. And we've built a sort of vision about what a great donor experience looks like. Um, this is our ideal donor journey. It's the North Star experience. We'll be testing it and we'll be changing it over the next 12 to 18 months. But it does start with an engaging digital two-way interaction, an education on why and what is so important about plasma donation, checking eligibility early on and cutting the time at sessions. And on arrival, a positive online check-in, easy rebooking, and instant recognition, uh, and a summary of how those donations are helping patients. So in terms of our next steps, there has been a few changes in the environment in recent months. We've seen Australia recently lift its ban on collecting plasma from residents who've lived in the UK. Um, in May, we saw the FDA also remove this ban, paving the way, we hope, for more countries to, to follow suit. Um, and in fact, it was in 2019 when 
when the Irish all removed that ban and they were, they were first to, um, to act. So we'll continue to work to alleviate you know, the global plasma shortage that we've been hearing about this morning and to make every drop of plasma count. I think it was in June some 59 years ago that JFK was in Berlin um, where he expressed his solidarity with, with Berliners and with Europeans. Um, it's interesting to reflect on that today. Um, but in the plasma challenge, we as Europeans are really proud at last to make a contribution to strategic autonomy for Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I open it now for questions, so please come forward to the microphone. And um, while we wait for some questions, I would have a question. Um, firstly, to, to Dr. Solnoki, but maybe also to the others. It would be, um, I've seen you have a good cooperation with the, the National Blood Service. Um, and have you seen how this cooperation has influenced in the, the past years the, the blood donations in, in Hungary? Has that been contributed to, to being stable? Have there been fluctuations? How does plasma collection in Hungary influence blood donation? Until, uh, until uh, 2019, the whole blood uh, donation numbers were very stable, a little bit uh, decreased, but also the whole population decreased a little bit. And uh, also it was introduced a lot of, uh, um, for example, laparoscopy operations. Uh, today, a uh, liver transplantation can be made without any uh, whole blood transfusion uh, earlier. Uh, the liver transplant uh, needed uh, 40 units of uh, uh, red cell concentrates. But uh, during the pandemic, uh, the, it was a huge drop down, but also a lot of uh, surgical operation was uh, postponed. So I can tell you that uh, during the normal life, it was no effect uh, for the whole blood donation. You wouldn't think that um, plasma donation influenced negatively no. blood donations. And um, maybe the same question for you. Um, do well, you, uh, you are pretty new, of course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> do you think it, it has an influence? Or I don't know, how is the um, history of, of blood donation in, in Egypt? Well, uh, the history for blood donation in, uh, in Egypt, uh, there are uh, several uh, sectors involved, including, of course, the, the most important and the biggest is the, the governmental sector through the National Blood Transfusion uh, Services. However, there are other parastatal, um, sec the parastatal uh, sector also has a great contribution in blood donation, so there is no uh, reliance on a single uh, sector which is which made things easier during the, the COVID uh, pandemic. As you were saying, uh, we are relatively new to the experience of plasma. We don't have that much donors yet. But what we are hoping uh, is that the, 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 when we start uh, the collections of source plasma, this will not impact the, the, the blood uh, donation that is currently taking place. And I believe it's, it's going quite fine. The, the supply and demand are very close to each other. That's something you can confirm as well, Dr. Liadchuk. Um, blood donations in the Ukraine? I mean, not um, during the war, of course. Uh, uh, when we started uh, create a special communication with donors in Ukraine three years ago, the first of all, we started uh, spoke about donation in general and it's help us in future. Because uh, really, the first of all, we uh, knock in all doors of different uh, NGO organization uh, where we can communicate with different uh, stakeholders who are interested in about the like, help in general. And uh, the first of all, the main uh, target uh, 
population was young people. And when we started to communicate with donors, with young people, we really organized a good uh, communication uh, uh, with donor in general, and it's helped increase not only donor in other plasma centers, in the same time, it's increased donations in the municipal and public uh, blood centers. Because we create such kind of idea, like to be a donor, it's really cool, it's modern, and for young people, it was a good idea, and it was like a good challenge. So, uh, of course, now we more separate between blood and plasma, but our first steps was really showed that it's really important to communicate with uh, all stakeholders, and after that, you will have a good result. Great, thank you. And um, Mr. Gorgati, have you seen um, a difference in, in communicating for the donors? I mean, you have the experience with the blood donors, of course, but now that you have started a plasma collection, have you seen that there's a, a difference? Is it a different kind of donor? I think uh, the donor is probably very similar to the platelet donors that we have. So that's probably the nearest correlation. I think in terms of whether that impacts whole blood donation, I mean, I think if, we, if you have a new strategy as we do and a new product, it should influence that. Um, when you look at our strategic planning, our footprint strategy, it's not right that that stays the same before plasma. So we need to think how we accommodate plasma, especially when we come to scaling up the operation. You know, um, how do we segment the, the, um, the geographically, demographically, um, and also, you know, um, what changes do we need to make in our blood donation, red cell footprint to accommodate plasma? So there are new trade-offs for us, um, and it's, you know, it's a different strategic challenge, but it's a great one to have. Thank you very much. See, there's a question, Matthew. presentation. Is this on? No. I think, yeah. Okay. Um, this uh, question is uh, on Griffel's Egypt. The uh, question is, um, when the fractionation plant is built and, and, and running, is the intention for the products to only be for Egyptian citizens or Egyptian residences or for some of the products where uh, the demand might not be so high, some of the first liter products? Would they be sold elsewhere? Or, and also, if you go to two million liters, would you have more of a commercial-like business? Because uh, this public-private partnership is very intriguing and, and is a new model. So I'm curious what you're thinking about that. Thank you very much for your question. Um, uh, yes, uh, the answer to your question is uh, we are seeking the main goal of the project is to uh, attain self-sufficiency in, uh, in Egypt of these products. Um, when we have, when we do have a surplus and we get all the relevant uh, re uh, regulatory certifications and, uh, and probably accreditations like that from the IQPP or EMA, uh, probably we will be, uh, uh, any surplus will be exported outside of Egypt. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, uh, Sarah Benchery from Politico Europe. Uh, so some of you on the panel have talked about self-sufficiency at a national level. Others have talked about self-sufficiency at a European level. And in my reporting, I've spoken to some patient groups who really don't care so much about the scale of self-sufficiency and they think of it more as on a global scale as long as PDMPs were self-sufficient globally on them and were buying them and exchanging them on a global scale that they don't really mind so much about national or European scales. So my question to the panelists is, um, why should we target national versus regional, say European self-sufficiency, um, over one over the other? Why should we be aiming for national self-sufficiency versus European versus just plain global? As long as we have enough in the world, why does it matter um, the balance? Thank you. Well, uh, let me... Uh, uh, answer that. Uh, I believe that uh, our, our goal in general is to, uh, to improve the availability of these products and the accessibility of patients uh, to these uh, products. So uh, this can be done either through uh, regional efforts or national efforts or, efforts or international efforts. The, the main issue is to achieve that for the patients uh, in need. So what I believe is uh, we are 
for, for our project in, uh, in Egypt, we are concerned for the time being with the national self-sufficiency uh, to increase the availability of these products in, in Egypt. After that, there will be a regional role, of course, uh, for, 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 the, for the surplus, as I was just uh, saying. So I believe that the first step is to secure these, the, availab the availability of these products like nationally and then go to explore uh, different, uh, I mean globally. I mean, I think that in terms of, you know, the short-term ambition, certainly for us where we're at zero self-sufficiency today, to even get off the starting grid, it's important, I think, for us to be able to make the link where we're educating new donors about the patients that it will benefit. I think long-term, I think we'd all align with the sentiment behind your question that, you know, we want to see global self-sufficiency. It's what's the roadmap to get there. So, you know, I agree with the point my colleague made here that, you know, there are some stages and transition states to achieving that. Thank you. Uh, I also agree with my colleagues. Uh, uh, I also agree with my colleagues uh, because, uh, the first of all, it's a question for nationality. It's a question about the needs of patient inside of country. And example, my... Uh, my position now, absolutely strong, that it's really important, the first of all, the population. And we feel at this point, uh, however we felt before, that it's really a question for Ministry of Health and all stakeholders who are inside of this question. And the first of all, when happens such kind of situation like we have now, uh, patients, they don't ask, about the medicine. They're just interested about the possibility to treat. So in, okay. in, Hungary, in Hungary, there is no discussion about self-sufficiency because we uh, collect much more plasma as we need it. We would like to get only back the <laughs> necessary uh, volume of PDMPs. I think one of the solutions would be if more countries, of course, mm -hmm. in Europe contribute and wouldn't be on the shoulders of only a, a, a few. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Adrian Goretsky again from Poland. Uh, and I have a question uh, regarding Egypt because the presentation was very interesting and the whole um, initiative seems very interesting and also attractive, um, possibly attractive um, pattern for other countries, uh, because as somehow in reference to the question that has been asked recently, I mean, many authorities, is, they are caring about the security of their own patient first, and then can, they can also uh, think about the regional and global safety, global um, plasma market. But first thing first, they think about their own national security. And I think that this joint venture can be an example of, you know, a meeting somewhere in between meeting in the, in, the, in the point where in both the uh, re questions regarding uh, national security are answered, the patients uh, are secured with products in their own country, and this initiative can also uh, have a regional or, or even global impact. But my question is, as I understand co correctly, the uh, very vital aspect of this um, project is the uh, safety of the Egyptian patient. I mean, uh, the first aim is to secure the Egyptian patient, and it will last for 50 years. I mean, the company have to offer or sell or whatever it will be the, in the agreement, the product to the Egyptian market, and then the surplus can be uh, sold outside the country. Exactly, yes, correct. And this, this will last for the 50 years, yes? Yes. Okay, so yes, it's... Exactly. Okay, yes. so this was my question. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you, thank you. Hello, Dominika Michtela, PPK Regulatory Policy. This is a question for, for Mr. Gogarty. Um, considering the regulatory decisions in, uh, in Australia, the two revised guidances by the FDA already one in 2020, and previously the Irish Blood Transfusion Service, would you like to comment on the European Centre for Disease Control Risk Assessment on UK plasma that was published uh, a year ago, if you're able to comment on it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so 
So yes, I've, I'm, I'm not sure, I know it's called a risk assessment. I've seen the ECDC guidance, and you know, the ECDC guidance recommends that a risk assessment or a position paper is, um, is considered before um, manufacturing UK plasma. So I think what we've um, agreed to do to respond to that, and I think in the most constructive way possible, is reduce the position paper. So we're working with colleagues uh, in the EBA uh, and the UK Forum uh, are on a document um, which will uh, emphasize the safety of UK plasma, and we're hoping to publish that in the next two to three months. So we're building on that ECDC guidance, I think, in a, in a really constructive way. very diplomatic answer to a very difficult question um, <laughs> because I, I represent patients and uh, and indirectly professional clinical groups I, I, I will just add a comment to that because the ECDC has proved itself to be even more out of touch with these matters than the EMA and indeed with the MHR, uh, MHRA it, it took us in U United Kingdom plasma action three years to get these people to even stop and think about UK plasma. The, the, the concern about mad cow disease was, was a reflex. It, it was no longer passing through the cranium. It was a monosynaptic organizational reflex. So I'm so glad that Jerry and his team are now re-raising these issues because clearly um, all of these ambitions in the UK context only become relevant if we can stop the strange mythology about this strange prion that apparently we've all got. Um, but we'll come on to that rather more tomorrow. My question for this team was in relation to the frequency of donation. Because I think this, after, this morning we've already heard of five times a year is the target for the UK, and twice a week is the target elsewhere. And I just wondered whether, I mean, this is a controversial question, but if, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us, I think the medical colleagues here, um, I'd be very interested to hear what you feel and what the audience feels about the frequency of donation, because it is quite central to all of this, in terms of donor safety and health. So I'll just clarify the English position. So our, tar our business plan target is each donor will donate five times per year. But in terms of um, the, uh, the regulatory position, um, a donor can donate uh, once every two weeks. So that's the potential maximum. But our target is, is for every donor um, five times per year. You know, you know from the CIPA study that uh, 60 times per year is uh, OK. Uh, for Egypt, we, um, as I said, we adopted the U.S. Uh, model for the uh, for the legislation, um, but we are taking it very cautiously for the time being. We are uh, we are in the very first phases of the project, and currently we are accepting donors uh, once every 15 days, and then we will stop, reassess, and increase accordingly. So we're taking it very like cautiously uh, at the beginning. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. If there are no more questions, I would like to conclude this this session. Thank you very much to, you. to all the the speakers and um, whatever system um, we choose, there's probably no optimal system, but we always have to keep in mind that actually we are looking for something that. Um, we are able to meet the clinical needs um, of patients. And as already was said, every drop counts, every donation counts. So thank you very much. But before uh, we, we end this, I would like to ask my colleague Sonia to <laughs> come to the stage because she has a recognition. Egypt, um, it's, it's kind of a historical moment because it's the first time we've had a PPTA member outside of the United States, North America, Canada, and Europe. 
join us. Um, so we would like to recognize Griffles Egypt for becoming a PPTA member, the first member in Egypt. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Sonia. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sonia. So, um, and thank you very much, Alexa. You gave a wonderful panel, and thank you again to the panelists, as Alexa said. Um, Alexa has asked that I mention to you all that lunch will be served outside, um, and please enjoy. And also, don't forget to visit our wonderful members who are exhibiting in the exhibit hall. They've got a lot to show you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. I trust you had a, a hearty lunch to revive your energy for uh, these afternoon sessions and, of course, to um, rejuvenate your uh, blood and plasma. Uh, my name is Leo Senderich. I am the Brussels correspondent for the I newspaper. I'm also the editor of the Brussels Times magazine. I am not formally part of the plasma industry or sector, but I have followed the EU closely over the past 20 years as a correspondent and editor, mainly in Brussels. In that capacity, I have seen the EU's priorities change a lot over time. This year, the EU's focus has been on, uh, dominated by the uh, war on its borders, and uh, the response has been to, uh, to uh, uh, stop some of the imports of uh, the EU's energy uh, from Russia. And these imports, as you probably heard, are sometimes described as the lifeblood of the economy. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you literally represent lifeblood. When others talk about blood in a symbolic way, the plasma sector can say that it really is dealing with it. Collecting blood, separating or fractioning and using it for a variety of diff different applications, including, of course, saving lives. In this session, we will be discussing the policy context around the demand for plasma-derived medicines in the EU. The EU's pharmaceutical strategy launched by the European Commission at the end of 2020 offers a roadmap of actions and priorities to guide policy actions. The COVID-19 pandemic made it clear that the EU has a significant problem when it comes to medicine and medical equipment shortages. According to the Commission, shortages in the EU have increased by a factor of 20 between 20, 2000 and 2018. So how does this affect the plant sector? The pharma strategy calls for strategic autonomy on starting materials for medicines in the EU and less reliance on third countries. The EU depends on the US for 38% of its plasma, around 5.15 million liters. So could increasing plasma collection in the EU contribute to the goal of open strategic autonomy? And how could this improve patient access to plasma-derived medical products? And what is the role of the private sector? All this coming up. But I'd first like to um, introduce our distinguished panel here. Um, we have um, two people coming in, dialing in remotely. But here on the sofas, we have um, to my left, David Bell, the Chief Corporate Development Officer and Legal Counsel of Griffles. He's been associated with the plasma protein therapeutics industry for over four decades and he's been involved in a, a variety of different disciplines. We have uh, Martine Perjean, president of the International Patient Organization for Primary Immunodeficiencies since uh, October 2018, after serving eight years as vice president, and you are a co-founder of I IRISH, the French uh, patient organization for primary immunodeficiency. And uh, on my far right, we have uh, Matthew Hotchko, the president of the Marketing Research Bureau, a noted global expert on the plasma industry. And um, in his capacity as president of the Marketing Re Research Bureau, he aims to provide accurate data and forecasts for the plasma collection and fractionation industry. And dialing in remotely, we have 
um, Stefan van der Spiegel, who is the head of sector on substances of human origin from the European Commission's DG for Health and Food Safety. And we have Carmine Sadat, the GMP uh, inspector um, for the Austrian Agency for Health and uh, Food Safety, um, which means he conducts third country uh, and national inspections at blood and plasma establishments. But first of all, we're going to start with a presentation from Matthew. Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you. First off, I'd like to thank the PPTA for uh, allowing me to speak. And the um, great thing about an in-person live meeting is I can reference some of the earlier presentations and make comments to them versus a pre-recorded one where I have no idea what they were going to say. Um, <clears throat> I'll be speaking about the current market landscape uh, for plasma immunoglobulins, focusing on the European Union. Just a disclaimer, uh, first off, I'm a full-time employee of the Market Research Bureau, and, uh, and then um, the data is mostly collected by uh, my company, Market Research Bureau. Four items I wanted to go over with you today. Uh, first is just a little bit of going over the trends of immunoglobulin usage uh, globally and uh, a little bit in Europe. Talk a little bit about the effects of the coronavirus, COVID-19, on plasma collections uh, globally, uh, as well as on Europe. And then uh, look, at, look at the disparity between the needs of uh, plasma to produce products for immunoglobulin patients in Europe and the amount actually produced You've seen some slides like this, but uh, they're slightly updated. And then finally, uh, take a look at this imbalance and, uh, you know, uh, both regionally, showing all the regions, and then what Europe would need to do, uh, or European Union would need to do to reach uh, regional self-sufficiency, if that were, were the goal. First off, I'd like to start with this slide, just to show you the scale of the growth in the PDMP uh, markets globally. Uh, annual growth uh, the, over the 24-year period, 7.4%. Um, these uh, pie charts are, are shown to scale, so you can visually see the growth of this industry. Um, $27 million in 2020 based on the data that, uh, that my company collects. Uh, but I'll just point out a couple of, I don't think I have a laser pointer here. Um, IVIG and subcutaneous IG went from uh, about a quarter of the market in 1996 to, to about 60% of the market in 2020 and has risen since then. So um, it's really come to uh, be by far the most important, more important than all the other proteins from a revenue perspective of the industry uh, combined. All right. So it's just a little trends. I think some people have touched on this already a, a little bit earlier today, so I might be brief. Um, but it's important to note that immunoglobulin uh, demand has grown faster than most other plasma proteins. Um, and we'll see why that's so important in a second. Um, albumin demand has grown, but uh, according to the data that we've tracked, it's been at a slower growth than immunoglobulins. Um, factor eight and factor nine derived from plasma has very recently been declining, uh, especially in the Western markets, due to recombinant and non-factor read heme libra competition for factor eight. Um, but it's still growing in emerging markets. But overall, that market is likely to decline from a total usage of plasma derived factor eight, factor nine. And then um, the, there's been other other proteins which won't be the focus of this talk, but uh, some of them have. Uh, have been kind of flat or stable. Others have grown, especially those that are dealing with acute blood loss situations, um, prothrombin complex and fibrinogen. It's probably been the two outside of the ones mentioned above that have grown the fastest. So let's look at uh, where uh, immunoglobulin usage. Oh, I'm not, I, uh, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, where does the, uh, wh where are the patients who need immunoglobulins? Where do they reside? By region. Well, half in North America, one quarter, remember that number, in Europe. And this is all of Europe in this slide, so that includes all of Eastern Europe, um, not just in the European Union. 
um, and then other markets. Uh, of course, this is not distributed by population, um, and we don't have time to get into that today, but you, it, it's very uneven. It's very uneven. Most of the immunoglobulin is used in, in high-income countries, and there's, there's a reason for that, because that's, that's, there's only enough supply for that many. Uh, just to look at where, uh, just to show you uh, some growth over a nine-year period, we collect data kind of every three years in most regions, so I have nine years uh, data. Uh, orange is the, the most recent data, which would be um, the right number uh, next to the country, and, and blue the left number um, for, 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 for years. Uh, the trend is pretty unequivocal, especially in the high-income countries or the high-usage countries, a lot of growth in immunoglobulin over a nine-year period. Um, and I will I'll discuss a little bit um, why. Uh, but mostly talk about this trend here and, and why this is important. Because immunoglobulin growth, as I mentioned before, has been faster than most of the other proteins, it has become uh, ever more dominant from a plasma economics perspective for this industry. And that has a lot of ramifications. Um, one is that the, uh, the amount of plasma that, that is projected or needed to be collected is really tailored to meet what the expected uh, sales or demand, patient need of immunoglobulins is. Um, albumin is also important, but, but as I mentioned, less so. Um, so uh, the only way to grow or, or not grow if there were decline demand, uh, immunoglobulin is to grow plasma, grow plasma collections. Um, uh, so, so that is what the industry has done. Um, the industry has been growing at about 8 or 9% per year plasma collections. And when I say industry, I mean um, plasma used for fractionation independent of whether it was collected in private centers or in the public sector. Plasma used for fractionation has been growing at 8 or 9% per year. Um, but then COVID happened, and uh, it's a pretty dramatic change, uh, shown here. Uh, the industry had been growing uh, quite a lot, almost. Um, almost geometrically, uh, until uh, 2020. And uh, for reasons that, uh, that probably many of you already know, uh, plasma became much harder to collect. And it fell, it fell a lot. It fell 14% in uh, 2020. And um, even in 2021, I have only estimate data, it's still down 10 or 12% below the 2019 uh, collections for, uh, for usage for fractionation. Um, just would note that the, the two curves at the top are almost in sync because the source plasma is providing all the growth, or nearly all the growth, more than 95% of the growth uh, in globally uh, for plasma fractionation has come from source plasma. It's really the way that this industry is going to grow and has been growing. Um, recovered plasma has been flat to declining um, based on needs of red cells for transfusions and other usage. To put it into numbers on a regional basis, I have comparisons. First of all, you see on the left, where does the plasma come from pre-COVID? Two-thirds came from the United States. Um, North America is almost all the United States. It's a little bit of Canada, but very little. Um, Europe, only 14%. Uh, Asia, which is 75% China, and has to stay in China per, per their regulations, cannot be exported or used elsewhere. 19% um, or 18%. Um, down, uh, 2020. Double digits in the United States, almost 20%, down almost 10% in Europe and in Asia, mostly China. 2021 numbers, uh, estimates. So maybe the second year of the pandemic was better. Not really. Uh, it was still, compared to 2019, down 16% in North America, mostly US. Europe was a little better, uh, down 3 or 4%, um, but still lower than, than two years prior. And then uh, Asia, due to China, was pretty flat. Switching a little bit to the European Union here, what, what changed uh, between 2019 and 2020? Unfortunately, I don't have uh, 2021 numbers. I, I don't have enough of the, the, the whole continent or the whole union to, to be able to publish those yet. Um, but uh, source, uh, or rather, let's start with public recovered, uh, down quite a bit, the most of, of the three. But public source actually rose. There's a couple of reasons for this, because uh, um, there was part of this was related to the, uh, the need for convalescent plasma that we heard uh, the UK speak about a little bit. This doesn't include the UK here. Um, 
but, uh, but other countries also collected it. So there was a, a little bit more collection in the, in the public side, which is encouraging to see, but that's the smallest of the three pillars in the European um, plasma fractionation industry. Um, and then private source down 10%. Overall, the number was down 9.9%, not good. 7.7 um, .7 million liters. Some of this is already getting a bit dated, but uh, what, what happened? What did the industry try to do? Obviously, the industry is trying to uh, produce products that, that save and sustain people's lives. So when plasma is harder to get, companies respond by trying to get, uh, collect more through various ways, as does the public sector. Um, so uh, in the United States, more than 100 new plasma centers have been opened per year for the last two years. Um, that is more centers that exist in Germany right now on the private side. So just uh, one year's gain is is uh, is more than 50% uh, of the European or more than 30% of European uh, collection numbers. Um, there are now over a thousand FDA registered centers, uh, which is up 24% in two years. So uh, a very big initiative to open more centers in more cities to try to get people who previously would live too far from a donor center to donor donate to be able to do so. Europe has also made some efforts. Uh, it's been different. We already heard from the UK and what they're doing there. Um, Poland, I just point out, has, uh, has a public uh, uh, um, plasma uh growth uh, plan. I heard double, triple the volume. I think you know, there's people in the audience who can, who can confirm that is the goal. I, um, I don't know what the numbers are for 2021, how close they are to that. Um, plasma centers are starting to be opened. Uh, that are dedicated, that's a good start. Um, there's one in the Netherlands. I would argue that one is far too little. You should have 15 at least, um, but, but hopefully they'll get there. Um, and then private companies, uh, of course, as, as this industry have added a lot more centers in the four countries that they uh, are able to do so. So let me uh, now, with a little bit of a review of the plasma collections um, for fractionation uh, trends, we talk about the need for uh, immunoglobulin versus the plasma available in the region. So here, side by side, I have two charts, uh, color coded the same. Uh, on the left, you see where the plasma is coming from, two thirds United States, only 15% uh, in 2020 from Europe. And on the right, you have uh, the usage. Um, so uh, there's a disparity in Europe, which is in orange, if you're providing 15% of the global need for plasma, but needing 25% of the global need and assuming there's no left over, and there hasn't been because there hasn't been extra IG floating around uh, the last couple of years, um, you're importing. And that's exactly what's happening. Um, so this is uh, the trends most recently. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, 2021 data, but uh, IG usage in the European Union, excluding the UK, um, because it's no longer part of the European Union, um, grew almost over 4.5% from 2019 to 2020. The plasma collections, as I, I showed you earlier, dropped 10%. Um, so you can't have both of these, you can't have need growing and collections declining um, for too long, uh, because the only way to meet that is from, from, from previous supply, from, from inventories um, before you're going to run out. And uh, that's what we've seen. Um, or you can import it from somewhere else, but collections declined everywhere, as I showed you earlier. Looking at um, just how much plasma, based on the yields listed there, blended 4.5 grams per liter, how much plasma was produced or collected for fractionation, how much was needed by the patients that year, um, which just was just how much was used by patients that year, never mind what, what might be needed. Um, deficit of 19%. Um, over over uh, two million liters in 19, uh, 2019, and then it, it jumped to, to over over 30% in 2020. Um, 12 percentage point drop. Um, this is this is why we see shortages. Um, how much do, do does plasma need to increase? So this is just taking the numbers in reverse, uh, the inverse. Um, in 2019, the European Union minus the UK, if they could have collected 24% more plasma uh, at this yield, they would have had enough for, for, for the patient usage that year. But the, but, but the pandemic had a big effect, and, and then the next year was 44% increase would have been needed, right? That was uh, in just over 2 million liters more in 2019, but then 3.4, and then 2021 numbers, based on my estimates, around 3 million liters deficit. Um, 
which is uh, 35, 40%. Um, so a few more slides here, and then we're done. Um, so here, I just uh, I just want to point out uh, the countries that have um, surpluses in, in the European Union. We already heard from Hungary; they have more more plasma collected and used in fractionation than, than the country needs for immunoglobulins. Um, but so do Germany. We also heard about them, um, and uh, Czech Republic and Austria. And then I, a couple other large countries in in Europe here uh, have deficits, uh, France, Italy, Spain, and Sweden. But I, I, sh I should note that I think every other country has a deficit except for those four on the left. Um, but there's a, there's a commonality here. Um, the four on the left have public and private um, plasmapheresis programs, uh, or at least pr private plasmapheresis programs and public um, plasma use for fractionation. Uh, and those on the right do not. Um, so, so clearly, there, there's a material difference there. So, regionally, just to show how all the other regions are doing with plasma and plasma needs, um, the United States is the uh, global supplier of plasma. Um, uh, they have obviously a robust network. Everyone knows that. Europe is deficit. It's hard to see some of the other ones because uh, in Latin America, I've given a presentation on this. Very little, very little is used or collected. And so almost all of it's imported. But uh, the other markets are also in deficit. So really, one, one, one country, one region is really providing the deficit for all the other rest of the world. So with conclusions, um, collections decreased. I, everyone knows that. Um, but it's, uh, it's, 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 caused, it's caused a real problem with supply. Um, Clinical need has grown, uh, at least pre-pandemic, to 2020. 2021 um, was a market of decline in uh, immunoglobulin usage for, for uh, a number of reasons, but mostly uh, restricted supply. And, uh, but, but it didn't fall as much as plasma collection, so there, there was a deficit. Um, European Union self-sufficiency or, uh, or uh, amount needed for its own patients dropped quite a bit from pre-pandemic to, to 2020, and 2021 wasn't much different. Um, 2021, 70, 75% of uh, the IG used was uh, collected on the, uh, in the region. And um, so what do those absolute numbers need to be? Uh, in 2020, it would have been 3.4 million liters more. Um, 2021, about 3 million more liters of plasma, and it would have needed to have been collected to meet the needs of all the patients in the European Union. And uh, lastly, uh, while it appears the United States uh, will be able to uh, export plasma for fractionation and, and IG products made from in, uh, United States collected plasma, um, it's, uh, it's susceptible to some of the same challenges that other, that other countries are. And um, while well, expect I expect improving patient access in the coming year, um, it will come at a higher cost, which I don't have time to speak about in this presentation. Finally, thank you. Um, it's my contact information if you want to know more about more about the markets. <laughs> thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, yes, please take a seat. Um, while you're here, um, I'd like to just quickly ask you a question about uh, your very your fascinating in, um, presentation. So um, we can see some trends there, but how do you think looking looking ahead into the future? I mean. Um, how do you see IG dem supply and demand if things don't change? Yeah, so this is a good question. So um, I didn't have time to get into it in this short presentation, but for a whole lot of reasons uh, that others have mentioned, uh, there's likely to be more um, need, uh, more patients needing immunoglobulins in Europe and globally uh, in the future. And um, I, I don't see uh, the way the current European Union or Europe abroad uh, collecting plasma at a, as fast a pace as immunoglobulin usage growth will, which means the deficit will, will increase unless something changes. Um, UK is certainly uh, making a big change. That's going to help. Um, but it can't just be the UK that has a, has a big change in, in what it's doing. Um, otherwise, uh, the, there will be more imports. Okay, thank you. As long as there are the product to be imported. We're going to ask our technical team if they can bring in our, our guests online. 
So we have um, uh, Stefan and Carmen. Um, Stefan, leave your, are you, uh, I, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear and uh, see you. <laughs> Thank you very much for dialing in. So um, I'm going to start with you. Um, I wonder what you could tell us about the revised EU flood directive and how, how does it relate to our experiences in the pandemic and to the pharma strategy? What can we expect? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. And, and thanks again for organizing this uh, event and for inviting uh, me to participate. Um, yeah, I, I'll focus mainly, I think, on the on the on the blood uh, part and the, the blood uh, directive legislation. I think we also have Karim in the room who probably can also add some views on the pharma side. I, I'll try to to cover both but with a focus on on, uh, on blood. Um, for the blood directive, uh, well, as, as you all know, uh, we, we are in the final stages of adoption. Um, we are expecting that to be placed, to take place uh, somewhere half of uh, next month. But it's uh, final admin steps now, so we, we, we uh, yeah, there, it's not in our hands. We'll, we'll have to see, but that's the, the, the general expectation. Um, on um, Blood legislation. I think it's important to keep a bit in mind um, what it is and what it is not. Um, the EU has a mandate to legislate safety and quality in the in this sector. Um, the EU itself uh, and the Commission is is not directly active in uh, the organisation of healthcare like uh, blood services. Uh, and actually, the EU even is explicitly not having a mandate to interfere in those organizations' part. So I think it, that's important to manage uh, your overall expectations uh, a little bit uh, on what is to be expected from the from the blood uh, legislation. That being said, I think there are a couple of um, key elements that we we can work on, and and uh, I think. Um, I said safety quality is our mandate, but, but shortages or disruptions for patients who are dependent on those therapies are seen for us indeed as a safety quality concern. Um, our, our focus of attention can, uh, as, as we don't interfere directly in, in the organization or the collection of healthcare uh, or, or the collection of plasma, sorry, we uh, our focus can mainly be on on making sure we we monitor well what's happening understand what's happening have a, a quick view on uh, the member state have a quick view when there would be shortages and also be uh, prepared for that um in addition i think that the the framework will try to really bring some facilitators to to allow us all confidently to um, to collect more plasma and, and then to get more plasma derived medicinal products I think the first key area there is uh, strengthening donor protection. Uh, in particular, I think that the private sector, which is highly dependent on, on a limited number of frequent uh, donors, I think for that part, it will be very reassuring to have stronger uh, donor protection uh, rules so that uh, we know that uh, those donors uh, are really um, well followed up and, and that their safety remains uh, the prime concern also. Um, and of course, a second element that will come uh, strongly forward in, in the framework, which will uh, will also facilitate, is the the strengthening of the of the interface between the, the Soho framework and the pharma framework, because you have the particularity here of having um, being subject to two legal frameworks, so uh, one for collection and then one for the manufacturing further putting in on on the market. So I think that's from from a legal side what can be expected from the blood directive. That doesn't mean that there's not uh, non-legal actions uh, possible on the more organizational side. And actually, we see an increasing interest and activity in in the uh, with the actors, um, the the health services who are active on uh, on um, on collecting uh, plasma. Um, but of course. Getting in the end plasma drive medicine products will, will require actions not only from the collectors but also from the manufacturers, from the donors themselves, from the, from the from the patients and, and the doctors who prescribe it, and and from the authorities, both in public and private sector. Um, so th there are some initiatives there that that we are seeing increasingly uh, being taken, and I think Matthew referred to what's happening in the 
UK and the Netherlands and Poland. So I think that are initiatives that are attracting a lot of interest in the in the, the services uh, of the member states. So that there are um, there are different initiatives uh, possible. As said, as Commission, we are not we are not uh, interfering in uh, in how um, public uh, authorities decide how this part of healthcare is being organized. I think we, we need both. We need uh, more collection in the private sector. We need more collection uh, in the public sector. So I think as an intro, I think that's uh, what I can, uh, what I wanted to bring here. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'd like to turn to you, Carmen. Welcome. Um, you heard, you've heard the, um, uh, Matthew and uh, Stefan, and I, I want to get your your take on this in in your um, in your position. I mean, what sort of um, do the unique aspects of human plasma need to be framed more precisely in in legislation, or does it matter? Um, well, uh, yeah. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, I wish I could be there in person. I was really looking forward to these face-to-face uh, um, -face meetings, but I just returned from a U.S. plasma inspection tour, which which kind of fits the whole topic here, which is becoming um, uh, the major bulk of our uh, workload, really. As uh, So to the point of the uh, previous presenter, um, uh, we, can, we can see the increase of sites here in the US, um, also, also from our everyday work. So um, uh, one, one thing that, that stood out the most, I think, in the presentation uh, from my perspective was um, the differences of public and, and private companies and, and how much they they actually collect. Um, it was very interesting to see or to get some insight on that. Uh, I think um, one of the one of the biggest reasons here um, is pretty much a legal framework in the countries that that uh, allow for for public uh, companies to to collect. So so one of the major aspects I think here is um, probably the compensation of Donors, um, which which is pretty much uh, the basis for um, public um, apheresis centers or a source plasma centers. So th that that's one one big topic. Um, uh, I, I think that um, that will be interesting to discuss. Um, as far as the the self sufficiency goes, uh, I, I cannot really speak to that um, because uh, I, I, we don't have a really. Um, or we, I don't have a stance here to represent here for for the agency. Um, as our major concern is, uh, also as uh, Stefan said, the major concern here is the quality, safety, and um, and and also donor health here for us. Um, whereas the uh, the self sufficiency part is probably a um, a policy um, question, which needs to be discussed uh, at a different level. But. Yeah. So um, that being said, uh, I, I think there, there's definitely some some clarity that can, could be added uh, as far as, um, as, as as the legal framework to allow for public companies goes. Um, in in your capacity as someone who's who speaks on the, who who knows the patient's point of view very well, I wonder if you can tell me. How, how, how do you think policies around plasma collection can be both donor and patient-centric? Well, I think that things are moving slowly, but um, for years we had um, a bit the same story that we will improve, but nothing happened, to be honest. And now, and for years also, we know that um, the needs are growing, and this was said by yourself, um, Matthew. And I think that now we have an agreement that the needs are there, and now we need to agree on the fact that plasma is a very special resource, that it needs maybe to be clearly defined, and especially plasma for fractionation, uh, because many uh, stakeholders don't know about this specific uh, material. Uh, that is so important for the patient at the end of the day. 
and, and for their whole life, I have to say. So I think that it's really important now to, first of all, uh, define uh, the importance of plasma, plasma itself, but also the, plasma, the importance of plasma for fractionation, and also enhance that um, public and private sector are both keys to achieve this goal, uh, so to meet the, the patient needs. And we absolutely need to, and maybe that could be, I understand what you say, Stephen, about the fact that um, the Commission has no role in, uh, in the countries, but maybe you can support in sharing best practices and see how one experience in one country can be helpful in another one, not to be copy-paste, but just to be inspiring and see how together we can find and get inspired uh, by some countries to find a specific solution in another one. And I think this is really important to let people share about that in a very smooth and uh, uh, efficient manner, uh, because at the end of the day, what we speak about is the life of people. Thank you. And David, um, you've been a, um, long been an advocate for de developing uh, new plasma proteins, and I wonder if you could just elaborate and share with us your, your view of why it's so important to develop treatments to fight unmet diseases and other rare diseases? Well, I, I think there's a number of things that go into that, uh, that question. Uh, but one of the things that comes in there is, is there sufficient plasma uh, for further manufacture? And I think that's, Martine hit on it yeah. for a, a very important point, and that is that there is a difference between the collection of blood for transfusion or plasma for transfusion and plasma for further manufacture. And what we're really talking about here is a collection of plasma for further manufacture. And the rules and regulations in some jurisdictions are different for plasma for further manufacture. They allow compensation, they allow other types of things, uh, putting donor safety and patient access first. But that really needs to be the focus of where we go from here. And that is to understand and appreciate whether there is sufficient plasma for further manufacture to meet the growing needs of patients, the growing diseases that these pro types of products, and I say types of products because there are other products that, other than the current proteins that are out there that will ultimately come from plasma, uh, those growing needs and growing concerns about uh, ongoing supply. I mean, we've, we had a very cruel experiment with the pandemic that demonstrated that when there, that there can very easily be disruptions in supply that dramatically affect the supply of plasma proteins uh, and affect patients' lives. And as we go on and develop even further uh, you know, products and, and that these products are available for further treatment, that shortage, that deficiency in supply, that miscalculation or whatever you want to call it of uh, uh, of relying upon one country as opposed to another will become uh, amplified significantly. Uh, it's, it's something that we really need to look forward to in the future. You made the comment about uh, donor and patient-centric collection, and I think that is really where we have to go. Up to now, everybody has talked about the coexistence of the public and private sector, and we should change our paradigm. The paradigm should be uh, that what do we need to do to collect plasma for the benefit of access to patients and ensuring uh, the safety of donors without regard to whether we coexist or not. Coexistence has to be a given. I think it's been established clearly that in those jurisdictions where both the private and the public sector work together, that uh, the supplies of plasma for further manufacture are heightened. When they don't work together, and the private sector is not allowed to be there or the public sector uh, is there alone for whatever reason, that there is not sufficient supplies. And when there is a constriction of supply, those are the places that, uh, that suffer. Those are the patients that suffer. We need to look at this for the benefit of patients and for the benefit of donors and assume that we will coexist. Thank you. I, I'm going to stay with you, David. Um, there has been discussion about the ethics of compensation, um, and that you heard from the Commission that uh, that, that that has to be part of the equation. 
how, how, how much do you think people should be compensated? How much, is, is there a, a level, is there an ethical question to be answered on this? Uh, I recall about five years ago, we had a presentation by some medical ethicists, a panel just like this, and the statement was made that it's not just ethical to compensate pla for uh, plasma, but it's unethical not to. Mm. And I think that that word of being unethical not to doesn't mean that it's wrong to accept that there's a voluntary system. But as un I think it is unethical to be against, and I think this is what the purport of the, yeah. of, uh, the researcher was, it's unethical to be against the compensation of plasma on ethical grounds uh, because these donors give up time mm -hmm. uh, and we are asking a lot of them. Mm -hmm. There are benefits to donation. Uh, the benefits donation are not just altruistic, but the health of the donor, I believe, uh, and I think the research has borne this out and is bearing it out more, that by having go undergoing low volume plasma exchange essentially over a period of, uh, of months, years, decades, mm -hmm. can be very helpful to your health. Uh, we've seen research that demonstrates that various things such as cholesterol, uh, blood pressure, uh, those things are corrected in donors who frequently donate. It's a question really that comes down to, is the private sector the, using compensated plasma a necessary requirement in order to be able to supply and guarantee access? And I think that it's been demonstrated that it is. Uh, again, that doesn't take away from the voluntary side of donation. I think that there's an absolute need for voluntary donations. Blood donations and other, that's why I segregate out the idea of blood and plasma for transfusion from blood for further manufacture. Blood for further manufacture is a raw material. Yeah. And it's, our donor centers are like small factories that are collecting a raw material for further manufacture. And we have to look very carefully at ensuring the health of, uh, of those donors that contribute that plasma. Uh, how you determine what, uh, how much to compensate them is policy decisions by by people other than myself. Uh, you've got governments who put limitations on the amount that you can, you can contribute. I think that the compensation should not be attached to an hourly wage or anything like that. I, I don't agree with, uh, with the way that some countries have compensated for whole blood donation by saying, we'll give you some, some payment for your hours or an mm -hmm. extra day off. I think that, that that's not necessarily the appropriate way to do it. But you do have to understand and appreciate that there, there are many things that donors give up from the standpoint of their time, the amount of, of uh, sitting and waiting and, uh, and doing things that they would not otherwise do. Uh, it's, whether it's $10, $20, $50 is a question of what's necessary to ensure that the patients are, the demand is, is fulfilled. Right. Stefan, I'd like to go back to you. Um, we, we've just been talking about the, the, uh, whether a donor should be compensated, and uh, you've been examining that question. I wonder if you could share a bit your thoughts on, the Commission's thoughts on this, because I presume it's not the usual policy discussion they have within the Commission uh, about incentive. That's not that often what, what you have to consider, but now you do, because it's, uh, that's, that's how we get our plasma. Mm -hmm. No, indeed, and th thanks for bringing this up. This is, a, of course, a key discussion. Um, I, I think the, 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 the core of the whole discussion is in uh, trying to achieve kind of financial neutrality. I've been hearing uh, statements about um, it's not ethical uh, to pay, and I have now also no. heard the statement, it's not ethical not to compensate. Um, the, 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 the solution is uh, probably somewhere uh, in the middle with, with aiming for a financial neutrality. I think um, most member states uh, would accept that there is a kind of compensation um, as long as that is really in line with the efforts done and um, is, is not becoming a kind of an income for the for the donors. Um, it's about finding that balance, and that balance um, can only and best be, be defined at member state level. 
Um, so this is a, an overall broader discussion that we have regarding in the preparation of our revision also with stakeholders from the public and private sector. And we, we feel that this is a, a broadly shared um, position in the middle that can be defended uh, and, and that probably uh, offers a way forward um, to make sure that there is indeed um, sufficient plasma collected, but that it is not at the the expense of, of donors and, and, uh, and, their, and their concerns. Thank you. Um, Matthew, I'd like to go back to you. Um, is there, looking at the data and the trends, um, what, what, what does it tell you about the balance that needs to be um, found between um, voluntary donations and uh, compensation? Is there anything that we can learn about that? At what point, perhaps, you have to bring money into it? Well, certainly um, uh, the existence or the addition of, of commercial yeah. plasma collections makes a big difference. Um, uh, a lot of people who donate, at least especially uh, in the United States, uh, who, who donate plasma at commercial centers and are compensated, they're not the, the same kind of, uh, they're not someone who's interested in donating whole blood. Mm -hmm. So it's really a different demographic. Um, they uh, have different concerns. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there isn't as much overlap uh, as, as one might, might assume mm -hmm. uh, without having seen the experience. So um, you know, adding, adding in um, commercial, commercial centers captures, at least in the US experience in most cases, perhaps also here in, in Europe, uh, a segment of people who aren't donating any plasma or blood, and, and, and then they start doing it, um, perhaps first for, for commercial reasons, but as we heard the, uh, a donor before, um, come to appreciate all the other benefits uh, um, that, that are, are uh, possible when, with, with donation. Okay. Leo, I think it's also important to look not just at the the donor side, but how that donor gets there to begin with and how their plasma is collected. Because what we've looked at, uh, if you look at what the public sector can collect and recovered plasma, or even if they collect source plasma, there was an earlier presenter that talked about the investments necessary to scale up to be able to collect sufficient amounts of plasma to supply the needs on a global basis. And the fact of the matter is, I think that on the public side of things, the ability to invest the amount of money necessary just isn't there. And uh, I think we've seen that, that, that you, you have countries that have tried to scale up plasma collection and just have not been able to do it without significant, significant investments. And that's something that the private sector does bring to the table, and that is the ability to, to make those investments and significant amounts of investments have been made as you said uh matthew over the past two years there have been 200 donor centers that have been opened in the united states that's a lot of money it's a lot of money it's probably the uh the gdp of some of the developing countries we're trying to support martina i wonder from a patient's point of view does it really matter whether people are compensated or is does it all go into the, as far as patients are concerned, go into the same pool? From the patient perspective, what matters is the safety and the availability of their treatment. So, because if you are sick, and I think this is the, kind, the, the, the thing for every of you, you just expect to get the, the treatment that will um, save you or let you recover. But in the case, save you. So I think that's... Uh, of course, the patients are really um, anxious on the fact that they get safe treatments, but at the moment, in the patient community, safety equals availability, because we suffer from luck, because we trust the, 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 the immunoglobulins we have at the moment. Yeah. I, I would like to have a word on, on compensation, if you allow me, sure. just because I, I, I have to say that this is something I can't get. I can't understand why there is so much discussion around this. Because to my knowledge, every donor is compensated in a way or in another one. And I don't understand why we speak of money more than on cooking lessons or 
tickets for the movies or the, the theater or whatever. That, I, I don't understand. What we need is a framework that allows people to be safe as a donor, but why would it be so important to give 20 euros, 30 euros, I don't know how much, as when it is framed? Um, if you work too much, uh, you can lose your health. If you donate too much, you can lose your health. So we just need a framework. So I don't understand why we focus so much on that, to be honest. Um. Carmen, I'd like to talk about product safety, um, um, not product, well, plasma safety and, and for donors and, and, for, uh, and for patients. Um, you heard about that with, with plasma, it is technically possible to donate every week. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, people coming in, potentially giving, giving donations every week. Is that something that you feel comfortable about? Uh, this is a, a, it's a very good question, um, very tricky topic. And there's there's uh, different stances here, uh, different countries. Some some are a lot stricter than others. Um, the United States allow for two donations a week uh, now with new programs uh, out there with uh, a lot more amount uh, to be collected. Um, Austria's had the same uh, normal gram. Uh, so the same amount and the same uh, number of donations a year that are allowed for for a long time. I think there is there is some good experience there. Um, it it is definitely a question where uh, different different countries and decision makers um, are divided. So um, scientifically, I cannot I cannot really answer that question. Uh, there is a trend of collecting more plasma now, uh, which. Um, uh, I'm concerned about a little bit, of course, and which needs to be observed and monitored. Uh, also, the, the uh, quality of plasma um, may decrease uh, theoretically if you if you uh, donate too much, because uh, you know the donor gets depleted of their immunoglobulins, so the raw material will also um, pro the quality of the raw material may also uh, lessen throughout. Uh, uh, the time, you know. So this, this is a very interesting topic, and there needs to be a lot more research done on this. Okay. Stefan, um, I, I, I wonder if you can tell us a bit, uh, without giving away everything in the, the, the blood, blood um, uh, uh, proposal, but how much is um, awareness raising part of it? Because um, people are aware of um, blood donation, but uh, as we've heard, when it comes to plasma, there's a uh, there's le less under a public understanding of what it, what's involved. Do you see the need for some awareness raising campaign? Um, we can't hear you. Thanks for the question. Yeah. I, I think, yes, it's a key pillar of um, getting more uh, plasma. It starts with building awareness with the donors and, and willingness to donate. And then, of course, it also requires uh, organizational capacity, whether that is a public or a private uh, organization. And, of course, from our side as authorities, we, we can and try to provide uh, facilitation through the different uh, rules we're setting. So on, on, on awareness, I think it is a key element. And of course, today on World Blood Donor Day, it's, it's a very important point uh, to bring up. I think uh, as commission also consistently in the last years, uh, we, we are um, making smaller or bigger statements on the, on the need for more collection of blood as well as of plasma. And at, at least as far as I hear that, um, uh, that is also something uh, that is coming through increasingly in, in, the, no, in the local and national campaigns uh, on awareness building. Obviously, uh, awareness building is something, maybe as Martin said, that you could support as EU to, to share best practices. It could be one of those areas. But it's not immediately something as, as Commission where we have the, the biggest impact just because of the setup of the EU with the different languages, different 
healthcare systems uh, and of course different cultures that uh, um, are sensitive to different messages. Um, but uh, yes, and say it, it, it is the, the point with which everything starts, so it is mm -hmm. an, a core element to, to uh, work on. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wonder if you had any thoughts on how awareness it, um, uh, raising campaigns might work. You've lo looked at the history over the past 20 or so years and seen the trends. Are there? A, uh, does the data tell you anything about um, uh, the intervention of pub um, um, public awareness campaigns, or, or does that give you any in insight into that? Um, not really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert for sure on, 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 on awareness campaigns, but um, a couple of countries require blood donation before you can donate plasma. That certainly would be uh, a, a way, way that uh, to, to, to coexist both of them. But um, uh, generally, to the, the point of an earlier panel, um, if you can't even tell people why uh, they might want to donate, um, uh, or some benefits that might be, it's going to be harder mm. to get them to do so. Um, I can certainly imagine a lot of people would be first intrigued by um, by a payment, but yeah. but but stick with it for many other yeah. different reasons than that. That that's a way to get people's attention, but yeah. not not going to be the sole reason why they would continue to be a long-term donor. And David, I want to put it slightly differently for you. Um, we, we talked about the in, the perhaps the incentive of, uh, of compensation, but of obviously they need to be aware that it exists and it matters. What do you think are the, the most powerful messages that both public and private um, uh, collectors can give to encourage people to donate? That the donation you make may save a life. And I think it's as simple as that. Uh, when you get to the question of awareness, uh, we found in our in our own donor centers mm. that when a donor comes in, they may come in because they've heard about compensation. Right. But uh, the way you get new donors is not just by your own awareness that you're creating, but uh, or advertising or what have you, but also the awareness that you give that donor about what his pl his or her plasma is going to be used for. Many people truly do not have an understanding that medicines can be made and are being made out of plasma that save lives. And when they go to a donor center and they donate, one of the most important things that we do as a company is to ensure that that donor understands what's happening with their plasma, that connection between the donor with the patient. And when they understand that, they not only feel much more comfortable donating, they come back more frequently, plus they get their friends and family to donate as well. And that's what's very important. Right. Martin, I want to ask you about um, what were the lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic when it comes to plasma collection? What were, um, there was obviously a decline. And um, what, 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 do you, what did you take out of this whole experience of the, the pandemic when it comes to um, collecting plasma and, and raising awareness for it and trying to raise awareness for the overall issues for, for patients? Having a, a chronic disease is a burden in itself. Having, in addition to that, a, a chronic treatment is an added burden. And then comes the pandemic, where we, we, you, you, you fear from the virus because you are uh, susceptible to infections, and in addition to that, you are not sure to get your treatment because we had that kind of thing. People who couldn't get the doses or have to wait longer or even for new diagnosed treatment, uh, patients, sorry, uh, they couldn't uh, get the treatment at the beginning. So um, what kind of lesson? <laughs> I think that we need to have a mix. First of all, um, of course, well, a, a mix with awareness, education, convenience for the centers and advocacy. Um, awareness, because as you said, um, David, um, a lot of people don't know about patient, uh, about plasma and plasma for fractionation, and including uh, in the healthcare professionals. A lot of them don't know about plasma. And we need to educate them as well, because if we 
as patients, we raise awareness, we testimony, we, we thank the donors, because of course they matter very much to us. But then the family goes to the centers, and they are told, no, no, it's not possible to give plasma. And they are really disappointed. So convenience in the centers are also, also very important. The day, the, the, the fact that you are um, welcome for plasma donation and things like that. Advocacy for the framework, I already said that. And the uh, last one uh, was about um, um, well, education. Oh, what was it? I can't remember. Anyway, three. Then. And I think that uh, from this all, uh, we, we need to, to, to work together. But awareness won't make everything if there are not the facilities behind this. This is just a process, a long process, and not only get people know about those, uh, those products and the fact that they uh, can donate. And uh, if they are refused for donation, this is a really bad experience, and this happened in a lot of countries. Thank you. Carmen, if I can turn to you. Um, obviously, the EU does import a lot of plasma from uh, the United States. Now, I wonder if you could tell me, I mean, how do you, how, what can be done to reduce the obstacles when it comes to um, harmonizing inspections between the EU and say the FDA, how do we improve mutual recognition of uh, blood and plasma products? Um, so that's, a, that's another very good question. I, I think uh, when we start talking about uh, mutual recognition, um, we should establish uh, where we are right now, what, what the status quo is, uh, where are the differences really between the, the US collection sites and the European individual countries' collection sites. Uh, we should really need a, a, a good um, gap analysis, actually, to see why uh, the mutual recognition in the first place with the US, there, there is a, a mutual recognition with the US for pharmaceutical products or medicinal medicinal products, I should say, uh, but that excludes plasma. So, so what the reason is and um, how these these differences can be overcome, or if they can be overcome in the first place. So, so this is this would be probably the first step uh, to have the basis for discussions for uh, extending that mutual recognition agreement and trust one another enough to to be able to um, to exchange um, inspection outcomes really, uh, and, and find a, a legal framework or a legal foundation that will work for, for both parties, basically. Uh, one thing that, that probably hindered that uh, a lot is um, countries with, with certain risks for certain diseases that um, uh, you didn't want to spread in between, so, so you, did, you always wanted, so there, there's some, some concern with, with blood products and, and uh, sources or you know, raw materials from because because of those diseases, um, I think this needs to be discussed, um, and and see where we where we go from there, basically. Right. Stefan, um, we all know that the um, the your work has been informed by this uh, the pandemic and the the need to to have some strategic autonomy. I wonder if you could um, uh, tell me tell us um, share with us what. Um, how that, is, how that has been brought into the discussions. I mean, we saw, uh, it, obviously we've seen at the beginning of the, the pandemic, there was, there was uh, uh, a rush for, for essential equipment, but when it comes to um, blood products and plasma, um, what, was the, what was the response, what was the understanding in the within the commission and amongst the member states about, about that and how it becomes a strategic resource? You're on mute at the moment. Thanks for the question. So um, th this is an awareness that already predates the COVID uh, crisis. I think the work we've been doing in the course of 2018-19 to map out concerns on the current blood legislation and digital health legislation uh, have clearly identified uh, this concern that we are highly dependent on uh, plasma collected in the U.S. for EU citizens to be uh, to be treated. I, I think the 
COVID crisis has uh, confirmed that indeed. And I think in terms of, um, at least again, as I said, there is a level of awareness and, and, and donations itself. There's a level of uh, the organization of the collection, and then there's the level of the authorization stream and the, the, the for, for actors like EMA and ourselves. I think on that latter level, we, we really have seen quite some increased um, coordination between the different authorities in the Soho sector and in the um, pharma sector on the field of, of plasma. I think there is a an important initiative in the pharma field on a structural dialogue on, on shortages of, of medicines in general. And I think plasma derivatives there have taken a, a prominent uh, place. I think there's good awareness of that. And with that has increased the awareness of, of uh, the need to work on different aspects across the chain from donation to, to utilization. Uh, and I think we, we've seen that mirrored in the increased collaboration between the different authorities that on the one hand are in charge of the donation collection parts and on the other hand are in charge of the, of the manufacturing and, and further distribution aspect. Um, we have also tried to align some requirements. There have been some flexibilities built in across the framework that concerns um, some donor criteria as well as some uh, inspection uh, practices. Um, yeah, so I, I think the overall awareness that this is a strategic concern was there already. What COVID has done is really started to bring people together to uh, across frameworks and, and start to think together on how we can uh, uh, improve and optimize the access to those therapy. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, open this discussion up to the floor for any questions. Um, I don't know, I think the microphones are right there. If um, anyone has some questions, uh, please step forward. And if you give your name and um, indicate whether you want one person or the whole panel to answer. My name is uh, Florin Hozok. I'm coming from Romania. I'm president of Donan Plasma Association. And I have one comment, and then maybe an answer um, from anyone. <laughs> so just to remind you something that is very, very interesting. 35 years ago, on 12th of June, a, uh, 1987, here near the Berlin Wall, the American president, Ronald Reagan, said, tear down this wall. Now, these days, maybe you don't see, but I see. There is a wall that's, that there is a, a, a wall of, of hypocrisy that divided Europe in two kinds of countries. Countries that are considering they are the good guys because they ban the private plasma collection, and countries that they are considering they are the good guys because they allow uh, coexistence of private and public. And because this wall is still in Europe, uh, for more than 10 years, no other countries, after uh, Czech Republic and Hungary, no other country opened the market for private uh, collection because this wall is here. And please let me tell you, behind the wall, in my country, in Romania, in the first five months of this year, 12 kids died because they had no access to IVIG. 75% uh, of the Romanian patients have no access to IVIG this year. So my question is, OK, I fully understand. We cannot push countries to choose one system or another. But let's do it, let's, let's do it like, like we're doing um, 
we are making when we talk about climate change or we, when we are talking about green energy. And let's say to all the countries, and to Romania too, because Romania does not collect plasma for fractionation, n not zero, yeah? By the way, sometimes, some years, they throw some, some, some plasma. But let's, let's tell them, in 2025, you have to contribute, all the countries have to contribute to plasma pool, European plasma pool, at least with, I don't know, 15 uh, uh, kg per million. And then you push countries to choose one system or another. Because for the moment, because there is this wall, there are countries that do nothing do nothing. Can we find a way to move forward? Thank you. I, I'm going to ask you, Matthew, to um, try and answer this, because given your, what you've uh, told us about the market, is this, do you recognize uh, the, the market as described there with, with a Berlin Wall running through it? It's a, it's a, it's a good question. Is uh, yeah, when it comes to um, the, the usage of immunoglobulin products, it doesn't line up with those that collect the most. One, some, of the, some of the wealthiest countries, um, such as Denmark and France, use some of the most immunoglobulin, uh, um, but they don't have the coexistence of the two systems, and they import uh, the difference between their, their, their respective uh, localized collection. So it's, it's not the same on the immunoglobulin usage. Mm -hmm. um, there are other factors, of, but um, in, in Romania, um, there has been a challenge for, for, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and would, it has been my observation in countries where there is a movement towards more plasma collection, there also is more product available and some more is used in those same countries. So it would, it would lead to more, more availability, I'm sure. Um, apparently desperately need it. Leo, if I could make yeah. a quick comment on that. I think Jerry uh, from the UK uh, made a quick, uh, during his presentation, he said that uh, their plasma awareness campaign was based upon the fact that it is in all of us. The power to heal people is in all of us. That medicine it is all in all of us. Uh, our work in Egypt, our work in other countries, and I think that many countries I know the U.S. does, I know Egypt does, and I know what other countries as well, think of plasma as a very significant aspect of their national security, and that they are preserving the national security of their own people by ensuring that they collect enough plasma to support them. And it is within the power of every country, whether they do it through the private sector, through the public sector, to collect plasma for further manufacture. And whether or not you develop your own fractionation capacity or capabilities, there are many com uh, companies that will fractionate that plasma for you if you, in fact, are able to collect it. The policymakers within countries need to rise to the occasion to understand that they have the power, whether or not you call it a wall or not, they have the power to ensure that the patients within their community are properly serviced with product. It is in all of us. Martin, I wonder if you had um, any thoughts on that because you know, it seemed like a, uh, um, a very difficult situation and, and uh, we don't want to, the last thing we want is another Berlin Wall. Yeah, yeah. This is crucial to speak of that, and especially because Romania, as an example, is a EU uh, country. And of course, this is the truth that people are dying at the moment, uh, not only there. Um, on the other hand, I think I was saying that um, something is in the air, something is happening at the moment. Maybe the lines are moving a little bit. And so I don't like to speak of a wall because, especially in Europe, where we have so many countries and, so, and different cultures, and also. Um, discrepancies. I, I think that every country should have its way uh, to improve that. But with an open mind, um, thinking out of the box, because if we continue to do what we do for years, nothing will change. And then 
we will end to speak of the wall. But at the moment, I would prefer to be on the positive side and to see that things can happen everywhere. Just let people think of that, raise awareness, educate, and uh, fortunately, we will improve the situation step by step. Thank you. We have another question. Thank you, David. David McIntosh, United Kingdom Plasma Action. Um, I don't quite know how to put this, but, but bear with me. It seems to me that one looks at the American situation and for whatever motivations, an enormously generous population is providing the rest of the world with huge amounts of plasma surplus to its own requirements. Now that's very laudable and there's many other parts of the world require those products. But where are they going? They're going to another rich, privileged Western region, Europe, which is absorbing almost all of it, while our friends in Romania are, are short. The rest of the world is probably, I think you will know better than I from the research, but the work, rest of the world is probably 70% underdiagnosed. The size of the problem we've looked at today, uh, it's a much bigger problem than we've looked at. You will notice the maps that we're shown have got, have got huge areas where most of the world's population lives, and they're not even addressed. I, th I, I think the, the figures go roughly like this. In North America, we've got 300 kilos, and in India we've got 0.5, and in China we've got 0.1. I mean, we are talking of orders of magnitude of greater problem here in terms of not only the, the, the in inadequacy of the plasma supply to meet current Ig demand, but the total inadequacy of the current Ig to meet all the undiagnosed demand that we ought to be addressing. And, and what I was hoping we might consider, I'm not not suggesting that I've got the answer here, but what I, I would love the panel to consider and for the rest of us to discuss is a notion in which the rich, well-invested Western nations have a goal of being not, not just self-sufficient, what on earth is that about, but make enough plasma for their own needs and a great deal more to meet the needs of all those poor underprivileged countries where they're getting absolutely nothing. And I think my, my colleague from, from Romania put it very well. You know, I mean, there just is one vast, great unmet demand out there, which at the moment we're not addressing. We're addressing the balance between America and Europe. Ah, come on, you know, so what? We're all rich and famous. We can all deal with this. We've all got the surplus. Well, no, we haven't. And the rest of the world is desperately short. That was my mm -hmm. first point. My second point, though, is component therapy. I mean, there is a lot of blood being used in the world today, which is still whole blood. And we're not getting the plasma out of that. So I would urge people here not to just entirely focus their requirements on, uh, on source plasma. There is more recovered plasma out there that we could be doing more with if we were doing more about component therapy. So, so just some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think for the first question, Stefan, maybe I can go to you. It, what, what, what he was saying was um, it reminded me of the debates we've had over the past year or so um, when, with the rollout of the vaccines and within Europe, we were fighting with perhaps Britain about where the, who should get the vaccines first and then somehow forgetting what was happening in poorer countries. Um, is, is that something which you think that the EU should consider as well, not just how to secure its own supply and, and regulate its own supply and demand, but also what's happening outside, or is that perhaps a bit too much? Thanks, you're asking a, a very important but a very difficult question. I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer this, to mm -hmm. be honest. At least not from where I, I'm sitting on the on safety and quality aspect. But I think I, um, yeah, I, I see the concern. We, we indeed, we have from time to time already within the EU concerns from member states that uh, report not to have sufficient immunoglobulins, and I think Romania is an, is an important country in that context. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, a lot depends on um, and that is not my territory, but I, I know what the colleagues are looking into that, that there's a, a lot dependent on, on the eventual pricing and, and reimbursement decisions uh, taken by member states and the negotiations they're having with um, companies in the end to be able to, to offer certain pharmaceutical therapies or not. Um, and, and that is, of course, an, an area that is really a core mandate of, of member states where the EU 
cannot really intervene a lot, and it would also be very difficult, difficult because I think every member state has a very, very different position here and possibilities in terms of uh, economics. Unfortunately, it's a lot related to, to economics also. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I can elaborate much further on, right. on that myself. Okay. I see we've got quite a few questions coming up. Uh, I don't know who was first, the gentleman in front or the lady behind? First. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sarah Taser Ben Sharif, health reporter at Politico Europe. My question is addressed to Mr. Van der Spiegel. Um, the BTC proposal is much anticipated, and my colleagues and I had been told by the Commission that we could expect it by the end of June. I think a question that is top of mind is if we could get a bit of clarity, um, very simple question, but a bit of clarity as to why it's been delayed. Thank you. Yeah, it's just about um, <clears throat> the, the substance discussions have all been uh, finalized. This is just an administrative process that needs to take place. There's translations that need to be organized. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of um, uh, other EU legal proposals in the field of, of health, uh, which also are to be administrated and, and translated before they can be adopted. So it, it is really the... the later steps in, in the process. There's no real uh, changes on, on substance that are driven this, uh, this delay uh, anymore. But so that it's really the, um, the admin process that needs to, that needs to run now. And, and I said even half July, it's my best um, estimate. I, I think it's, uh, it's really the overall commission um, administration at this moment that, that is uh, defined, that will define the, the timeline. Okay, thank thank you. you. Sir. Rainer, mm. Rainer Mook from Octopharma Plasma. Uh, frequent uh, plasmapheresis is the um, most important uh, issue to ensure the plasma supply. And I can tell you that it is safe provided that the donor is closely monitored, especially for the IgG. We have some information uh, about um, the European Commission that uh, there may be some restrictions to the number of plasmapheresis as well as to the volume. Uh, maybe that uh, Stefan might give an answer to, to this. Uh, how will it be in the next uh, future? Any idea about this? Go ahead. I'm sorry, but I cannot comment on this. And, and to be honest, I'm surprised that you come with this question. Right. Um, Madam, I think over there. I don't know. No. Yeah. My name is Otilia Stanga. I am a NIPOPI board member and also the chair of the Romanian PAD patient organization. I'm sorry. We talk so much about Romania, but <laughs> I am also the mother of a, of a 16 years old PID child. Um, it was a question before about how, how patients do feel um, about, uh, about donors or compensating donors. Well, I can tell you that patients don't care if, if donors are uh, uh, compensated or not, they only feel gratitude to, towards donors because, well, they not uh, donate only plasma, they donate life to patients or to our children. And uh, also, uh, some patients in some countries like mine, they feel fear, a lot of fear for uh, tomorrow if they will or not uh, have access to treatment anymore. In the last 10 years, uh, this is the second IG crisis Romania is facing, and it's uh, just exhausting. I don't have a specific question for you. I just want uh, everyone uh, to, to go home with the question in the head, what can I do more today so tomorrow will be better? Thank you. My name is Hans Hartmut Peter. I am a clinical immunologist from Freiburg University Hospital, and uh, 
I want to throw in some observations and arguments in this debate, mainly in, in favor of this joint uh, solution of private and public uh, blood and plasma donation. I know from our hospital that it would be impossible for the blood bank to, in addition to collect blood, also to, uh, to run a plasma center. We would not have the personnel to do this. Uh, second is that um, as a university hospital in a rich country, it would certainly not happen in Freiburg that patients with primary immune deficiency would not be able to get immunoglobulins because the state is rich enough to buy it. And you can buy it on the market, and if you pay more, you get it. This is one of these uh, ethical inequalities which I uh, deplore. And finally, I think the regulators should not actually look away from this intensive uh, frequency and the volume increase in plasma donation. Because uh, I visited several centers for plasma donation and I heard from the, the people, they say, oh, the, if they get infections or sick after plasma donation, they won't come again. So what you study is the, the, the end of the, the healthy people that donate, but those who actually suffer from donation, and there are certainly a number of uh, patients or donors who go beneath six grams per liter of IgG, uh, and particularly in those situations where they do it for economic reasons, we should not actually allow this on the side of the regulators. Thank you. Can I ask you, Carmen, to respond to this? Because um, uh, it's a question really about regulation and, uh, and I suppose, ensuring product safety. Um, I wonder if you, you you've obviously have to deal with this all the time. Um, what is your response? Do you have a response? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, well, I, so first of all, if I understood correctly, um, I would say that, uh, it, of course, it should be the objective of regulators to determine how much a donor can uh, can donate a week because that's a donor safety issue, clearly, um, more than it is a, a product quality issue even. Um, both both aspects are very uh, important and, and both aspects could be uh, compromised by too many donations. This is definitely a regulatory issue. Um, now the question is how much is, is healthy and, and how much can a donor donate really? And this is, like I said before, this, there's different opinions on that. So, so there should be really firm scientific, um, a firm scientific basis for that and, and there needs to be a lot of research done to prove that it is safe for the donors to donate because uh, we, we do not want to create uh, another generation of patients with with the donors also, right? That will be counterproductive. So, so donor safety should be the prime objective here. And that, that needs to be uh, regulated by uh, an objective authority, not the industry, of course. Thank you. Let me, let me make a comment because I agree wholeheartedly with the doctor who asked the question. Uh, any evaluation of donor safety has to be able to withstand rigorous scientific, scientific review and you can't just look at the people who stay within the system. It has to be a controlled follow-up with those people who come out of the system, and that is what we try to do, because to do otherwise would bias the studies. And I think that it's something that my company lives by. It's the, the mantra of as important as it is to save a patient, you should never do so by harming a donor. And that is something that is of extreme importance and should be throughout the entire industry, whether you're involved in the public sector or the private sector. I think we'll just have a time for one very quick question, sir. Well, two quick comments. One on donation frequency. We, we've seen a range of frequencies discussed today from 104 times mm -hmm. per year to five per year from the, from the UK. The fact is, if you want to take less, if you want to decrease that or change that, yeah you either take less plasma from more donors or more plasma from less donors. So the only way to change that 
is to have more plasma donors. And on, on the COVID-19 impact, it was interesting to see the urgency uh, in terms of, of, of collecting convalescent plasma. Mm. Suddenly governments were pumping in resources to this. All of the rules changed. Now, if, if convalescent plasma had worked, you would have seen Europe probably stepping up to the plate and, and collecting a lot more plasma in the last year or two. So convalescent plasma was potentially for the benefit of everybody. But here we talk about rare diseases where there's a, a, a huge deficiency in terms of access. So perhaps the same sense of urgency that was there when they start talking about the potential use of convalescent plasma should be used in the future to address Europe's deficiency in collecting plasma. Martin. Yeah. Did you want to comment on that? No, no, I, I just second what Brian has said. I, I think that uh, when it comes to uh, get a solution from a big problem for many people, then there is no criteria anymore, uh, unless safety, of course. And uh, nobody cared if it would come from compensated or not. Uh, they just would take the solution. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, uh, we're going to have to leave it here. Um, it's been a very uh, engaging uh, discussion. We've talked about the market and the trends, supply, demand, public and private, the regulation, the European Commission, product safety, and, and many other issues in between. I'd like to uh, thank our, our panel, David, uh, Carmen, Stefan, Martin, and Matthew. And um, I wonder if you could all show your appreciation for our wonderful panel here. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. For those of you who have just joined for this session, I'm Leo Senderich. I'm the Brussels correspondent for the I newspaper and the editor of the Brussels Times magazine. I will be uh, moderating this session. For those of you who have stuck with us until now, you know that we've been discussing this morning and this afternoon the needs of the plasma sector, the market situation, and the role of policy, including EU policy. Uh, one of the most important objectives of the European Commission's pharmaceutical policy, um, uh, strategy for Europe is securing open strategic autonomy for the EU. This is seen as um, critical for medicines and for related um, EU manufacturing abilities. This implies um, for the Commission, quote, bringing back manufacturing of uh, critical medicines to the EU, and plasma-derived medical products are, of course, <coughs> critical medicines. But what are Europe's current manufacturing abilities as to plasma-derived medical product products? Europe currently has around 20 plants. It is a leader in the world in terms of plasma fractionation capacity. In this session, we will look at the opportunities and the challenges of setting up fractionation plants by both public and the private sector. Some countries are keen to build fractionation plants, but do they have enough supply? Is there a risk that they will be wasting resources on building plants that fail to meet basic production needs or fail to meet technical standards? We will look at some of the past experiences as well as some new initiatives. Before we begin our debate, I'd like to introduce our panel uh, Radzislaw Sierpinski is the, um, is the Polish Prime Minister's High Representative for Development of Biotechnology. He is a doctor specializing in management in the medical sector, including some uh, clinical trials. And since last year, he's been president of the Medical Research Agency in Poland. Uh, Sinisa Varga is the former Minister of Health of Croatia. He has a background as a dentist and was a volunteer in the Croatian War of Independence. And he's also a con consultant for the Commission, the WHO, and the World Bank. Rude Sudhout is the representative of um, uh, Profia Biosolutions. He has a long experience in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, in particular with commercial and transition um, measures. And we have um, Adrian uh, Goretzky in the middle here, uh, president of Healthcare Education Institute Poland. 
he represents the uh, patient view. He was formerly the head of the Polish Association for Patients with Primary Immunodeficiency. But first of all, we will start with a presentation by Patrick Robert, who is a consultant uh, from the Marketing Research Bureau. Patrick has over 30 years of experience in the field of blood and plasma, having worked in both nonprofit and commercial sectors. He was the former president of the MRB and currently serves as an MRB consultant. Patrick. Thank you very much <coughs> for this uh, nice presentation. Today, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank PPTA for having invited uh, me and the Marketing Research Bureau to present some data and information on uh, the past and the present on plasma fractionation in Europe, current situation and past experience. So I'm going to talk about the past. Uh, usually, uh, I used to speak about the future. Matthew is talking about the future. And I'm going to cover the past. You think it would be easier, but in fact, it's much harder. You, when you talk about the future, nobody can, can dispute you. But in the future, when you talk about the past, people will come back uh, to me when I'm done. And they'll say, oh, no it's, no, it's not like this. It was not like that, and so on and so forth. And for the present, you can ask our new colleague, Dana. And so we compete each other, future, past, and present. Um, so um, in this presentation, uh, I will cover four topics. First, the uh, landscape of the plasma fractionation in Europe. Then some facts and figure, figures on uh, the industry and how it uh, evolved over the past 40 years or so very ambitious program. Then I will address two uh, case studies um, that occurred in the Czech Republic and Greece. And after that, uh, we will discuss the uh, causes for the failure of projects and, and the life cycle of fractionation plants that came and went, and a brief conclusion. So <clears throat> first of all, the number of plasma fractionation plants in Europe um, is provided here as a result of a survey that we conducted we, three years or so, in which you see here that uh, Europe has 19 plasma fractionation plants. I'm talking about front fractionation, not purification, which is why uh, the data that you see here may di differ slightly from those that are presented on the PPTA website. Uh, nine plants in uh, the United States and as many as 43 in Asia and Pacific, uh, mostly in China. And in China, I believe it's about 30 to 35 plants, of which only uh, 10 to a dozen are for real, if I may say so. The others uh, being small plants which uh, uh, operate uh, slowly or intermittently. Anyhow, uh, in terms of the size, uh, North America has only nine plants, but they are very large, uh, middle size, so to say, in Europe, and rather small size in uh, Asia Pacific in general. Of course, Australia being different, as you probably know. In terms of uh, throughputs, um, the situation has changed uh, recently. Uh, because the fractionation facilities in North America has expanded, and new plants have been built, so that now North America, and that's essentially the U.S., uh, fractionates about 45% of the total uh, supply of plasma for fractionation, Europe 35%, and even though uh, Asia has 43 uh, plasma uh, fractionation plants, it only fractionates 19% uh, of the volume. So uh, Europe with 19 plants and a uh, very significant volume of plasma is in a good position to, um, to fractionate enough plasma for its uh, patient needs. So now I'm going to talk about <coughs> the past and uh, what happened uh, with the many fractionation plants that were in operation um, many, many years ago. This slide has been provided, has been borrowed uh, from uh, Paul Strangers of IPFA. 
and I thank him for his generosity. And you can see it's very crowded, so I'm not going to stay too long on this. You can see that there are many, many plasma processing plants. There were many in 1993, and a good number of them disappeared. And in fact, here you can see a slide which is also pretty crowded that shows the, the fractionation plants that were closed in the past four decades. On the <coughs> left side, uh, the plants that were in operation in Europe uh, are listed, and uh, they, there are those who no longer exist. Of course, I'm not going to go uh, through the list one by one, but I can tell you that each one of these uh, fractionation facility, uh, facilities are a whole story and an interesting one, uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have time to go into that. That's just a, a small uh, comment um, on uh, Germany and France. Uh, in Germany, uh, there were, if I'm not mistaken, eight uh, fractionation plants operated by the German Red Cross. And these were plants which, in many cases, were close to uh, regional blood centers and uh, had a fairly small fractionation capacity. And they had to close because they just were found not to be efficient. And the same in France, where there were, uh, I think, about six or seven so-called uh, regional transfusion uh, and uh, fractionation facilities. They were all closed, one after the other, because they were just not efficient. And the same in other countries. But we'll go over some some examples. On the left side, on the right side, I'm sorry, plants that closed um, in the U.S., Canada, uh, Latin America, and um, Asia Pacific, and the Middle East. China is a case where uh, very little is known uh, before, let's say, 1980 or 1970, uh, because. Uh, plasma fractionation did not exist as we know it now. <coughs> so um, before going further um, with more details, I want to talk about maybe not all of the uh, plants here, just uh, a few that were interesting. Let's go to uh, Hungary, um <coughs> where, as you know, right now, um, Kedrion and <coughs> as a, a plant, um, but before that, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, the uh, National Blood Transfusion Service uh, had a small fractionation plant, and actually uh, uh, Hungary already back then had a very active and successful uh, plasma pheresis program, which, uh, which helped uh, hemophilia patients were, who had access to cryoprecipitates and that was uh, quite uh, dramatically important to save the life of many hemophilia patients in that country. Maybe we turn to Finland, uh, had a small fractionation plant operated by the um, Finnish Red Cross, small size, and it had to close because uh, bringing it to the new good manufacturing practices after a number of years of operation was just too expensive and also the markets uh, did not support, did not uh, provide enough funding as the uh, price of albumin uh, dropped between 1996 and, and 2001. And then maybe uh, Scotland, so same situation. The um, Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service had to close essentially because of Creutzfeldt-Jakob uh, Creutz, um, disease. Just incidentally, a few uh, words of history. So after uh, fractionation was um, developed by Dr. Cohn in 1941, um, nothing really happened to the plasma industry until, let's say, 1968, with only uh, albumin and uh, hyperimmune globulin salts during that period, 1968-69 coagulation factors, plasma-derived coagulation factors came out. 
and then IVIG, which uh, was first licensed in the US in September 1981, to be very precise. And then, um, then there were a number of crises uh, caused by um, pathogens in the plasma supply. First, hepatitis in the 1970s, uh, that uh, occurred in the uh, US plasma supply. And then, of course, HIV in the late 1970s, 1984. And then Kreutzfeld Jakob in the late 1990s. And all these, along with other events that shook the industry, caused huge disruptions uh, in the structure of the plasma industry that led in at the beginning of the 2000 uh, decade uh, to a concentration, vertical integration, and essentially because of Kreutzfeld Jakob, a rush. On the on part of fraction fractionators to acquire plasma centers very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so let's go to two uh, case studies of projects that came and went. First of all, Seva Pharma. Seva Pharma was an offshoot of the Sevac uh, vaccine, Seran Vaccine Institute, which was a public health in institution which fractionated a very small volume of plasma, 28,000 liters per year. And um, at some point in the late 1990s, uh, SEVAC decided to build a new plant, uh, but uh, so uh, contracted with a foreign fractionator, I believe it's Kedrion, but I'm not 100% sure, uh, in to, to, to get a technical know-how transfer. And uh, the goal was to expand the production volume and diversify the portfolio. And so uh, construction started. But unfortunately, some problems um, occurred quite rapidly, uh, which uh, brought the management to question the uh, validity and uh, feasibility of the project as a whole. Um, there were quality assurance problems, which uh, uh, increased the cost of the projects. And facing that, there was the issue of uh, securing, securing plasma for fractionation. As I mentioned, 28,000 liters was totally in, uh, insufficient. And of course, in the Czech Republic, uh, which collect now 500,000 liters. This was years ago. Uh, the volume of plasma available was very small. And uh, facing that also a declining I mean, prices, which put in question the viability of the projects going forward. So by the end of the 1990s, the facility, facility was standing there with the various parties involved discussing uh, do we go ahead, do we don't, do we not? And in the, ed in the end, uh, it was decided that it's a no-go. And a company, uh, I believe it was Baxter, acquired the building for um, production of vaccine, which had its own story in itself, but that's not the subject here. And the second case was Greece, a uh, project which I know a little bit better. So in, uh, in 2002, the Hellenic uh, Ministry of Health got about $10 million uh, uh, subsidy from the um, European Union to build a fractionation plant north of um, Athens in a place called Tatoi. And it was uh, meant to be a fairly large uh, facility with 100,000 liters fax, uh, fax, uh, fractionation volume for the uh, processing of recovered plasma. <coughs> so uh, the construction went ahead. The equipment was ordered and installed. But there were a few problems. Uh, there was a first problem was uh, plasma procurement. Uh, there were also difficulties in getting uh, staff, uh, technical staff, which was not interested in uh, going to work 40 miles or 40 kilometers north of Athens or 20 kilometers every day. 
and all kinds of um, logistical problems. But the main one uh, came from the supply of plasma. At that time, the Ministry of Health uh, did not have any uh, over, over, over uh, sites on the plasma uh, ovenoid blood centers. They were all uh, operating independently, very safely, but independently from each other. And the Ministry of Health, for some reason, did not have a direct uh, operational uh, say on the way it should be conducted. So when it came to securing the recovered plasma to the plants, uh, a good number of uh, uh, blood centers said no. We do not want to share our recovered plasma with these uh, plants. Uh, we want to keep it for our uh, hemophilia patients. And incidentally, that was somewhat justified because uh, hemophilia care in Greece is, has been and is uh, one very, very good, if I may say so. Uh, I don't like to give judgments, but looking at the figures. And also, they had no, the blood centers had no incentive. They would not get any uh, payment, uh, you know, for the work done to collect this plasma, to separate it, and they had no obligation. So uh, the majority of the uh, blood centers just did not share the plasma with the Tatoi plants, which uh, stayed idle for 10 years and served as a warehouse where plasma that was secured, that was gathered by the Ministry of Health for toll fractionation, contract fractionation in, in the Netherlands was stored. And that was the situation at the end of the, of the uh, decade, at 2009. And at that point, uh, the project was abandoned. So uh, actually today, as far as I know, and I think it's been confirmed, the Tatoi facility with all the equipment on the wrap is, is used as a warehouse. Attempts uh, to uh, revive it uh, have failed, and that's the situation. That was very unfortunate, but that's one of the, and hopefully uh, the most uh, uh, blatant uh, failure in, the, in, in this kind of uh, uh, situation. So <clears throat> let's analyze the causes for the closing of all these plasma fractionation plants. The main, well, I have a list here, a long list, and I've tried to rank them, but really uh, there is no uh, number one, number two. It all depends on the circumstances, on the location, on the timing, on the uh, personnel, and so on and so forth. But there is a good number of them that were just not able to invest in the uh, necessary investments to comply with the uh, good manufacturing practices, which were becoming stricter and stricter, uh, especially in the 1980s when virus inactivation was, uh, was mandatory and also a virus removal uh, at the time, of course, of the HIV uh, uh, epidemic or pandemic, if I may say so. Then uh, many of them also uh, found themselves with insufficient volume of plasma, just like uh, uh, Seva Pharma. Uh, many of them uh, survived, tried to survive with only two products, uh, some uh, uh, polyvalent immune globulin intramuscular and hyper, a few hyperimmunes and albumin. That was not sufficient to bring enough money to, to run the, the plant. And a small plant with two or three products just does not survive. So that was the cause for many of these plants to close. And I'm talking about uh, precisely these plants in Germany, France, but in many other countries that, that, were, uh, that had a capacity uh, of 20,000, 50,000 liters, they just could not survive and eventually uh, they had to close. I'm thinking of uh, Staten uh, Serum Institute in Denmark. Um, uh, Scotland was also a case uh, in points. Uh, Novo Nordisk had a fractionation plant 
and many others. Other reasons were staffing, uh, difficulty to uh, locate uh, personnel, and here I include also some of the ongoing projects, for example, the one in, in uh, Brazil, Hemobras, which has been going on for many years now. Uh, back then, the Ministry of Health decided to, to uh, set up a plant uh, in the uh, Pernambuco uh, province in Recife. And one of the problems was that uh, they had difficulties in getting technical staff uh, willing and able to, to move to Recife. But there were many other problems. And then, of course, unfavorable uh, market conditions. Um, the uh, challenges for the reimbursement of PDMPs and uh, price variations. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, in the mid-1990s, the albumin uh, price uh, tumbles because of the growing success of non-plasma-based uh, plasma uh, replacement solutions. And so uh, revenues from albumin uh, also uh, were, were com considerably reduced. And that was also um, um, uh, the, reason, the cause by the famous, um, um, the name escapes me, um, a meta-analysis uh, in 1998 um, that uh, determined that albumin was uh, not, uh, was uh, caused more mortality than, than the uh, dextrans and other solutions. Cochrane review, I'm sorry. And that uh, caused the albumin markets to collapse. Uh, the markets uh, the in, in England, in the UK, went down 50% from one year to the next, as it did in also in uh, continental Europe. So there were a lot of uh, uncertainties and, and movements in the supply of um, uh, plasma um, uh, PDMPs, uh, also caused by recalls and uh, missed uh, batches, caused by uh, kreutzfeldt jakob So it was a very turbulent uh, situation. Uh, there was also the fact that uh, the number of plasma fractionation plants had been inspected by the FDA as a result of some uh, contamination in the mid-1990s, which resulted in the closing of a few plants that caused shortages, etc. I unfortunately have no time to go into details. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, compromised plasma supply, HBV in the 1970s, HIV and CG. Um, I want also to mention that um, some of these projects <coughs> failed because of government changes. That would be the case of Hemobras. And so new governments, uh, new uh, priorities, and therefore uh, resources withdrawn or reduced, financial resources, staff resources. And also that I just thought without having the time to include it here, what I call dilution of decision-making uh, process. So many of the plants that closed uh, actually were divisions of larger companies and the larger companies had managements which just did not understand the plasma industry. So, for example, in the 19, I don't know, 1980s or so, uh, a large company, a large fractionator in the U.S. called Armour Pharmaceuticals, which became part of CSL Bering, uh, changed hands, and it was owned for a while by a bus company a uh, very large bus company, the Greyhound bus companies. I let you can understand that the uh, Greyhound management had no idea how a fractionation plant uh, operated, and then they sold it to Revlon, which is a, a perfume company, and so on and so forth, until it fell into the hands of a pharmaceutical company and, and eventually uh, became long later, a long time later, CSL. Uh, there were some other examples, but that was the reason for the closing of a number of uh, plants. 
some regulatory issues, uh, price, price control. Here I want to give you the example of uh, a plant in, um, I think it's called Ter Teresiopolis in, in Brazil. It was a Huxt plant, a German company, which was quite fine. It was the largest plant in, in Brazil in the 1970s. Unfortunately, the province's um, government uh, put very uh, low price ceilings to the uh, PDMPs, and unfortunately, that really killed the plants because they just could not operate uh, uh, at these uh, low prices. And then uh, other situations where the um, registration of products were delayed, refused, or declined, and so um, that was the end of the, uh, the plant. And then, of course, unexpected events, such as manufacturing accidents, uh, that happens. Uh, I will not elaborate on that. Poor management, misuse of resources, and simply bad luck, or sometimes good luck. So, um, some uh, defying uh, stories on fractionation plants um, projects. I spoke Patrick, with yeah. um, just, uh, I, I, it's okay. great stuff, so but uh, I do want to hear some from the other panelists as well. So, uh, conclusions. Um, <laughs> availability of sufficient uh, volume of plasma, government support, financing, which is questionable, uh, the technical staff and market access. Thank you very much. And <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have, um, I'm, I'm going to start with you. Uh, I wonder if you want to um, yeah, quickly give your, um, um, uh, I think you've got one, two slides, um, yes, please. Radoslav. Um, do you want to use the podium? Yes, sure. please. Before we will see the slides, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation and for very warm uh, welcome here. Uh, I'm very happy that the Polish government, as uh, I am representing, uh, I can show you some uh, ideas and some uh, directions we would like to undergo in future. Uh, I hope you can, you cannot, uh, I hope you can see the slides for a second, because I would like to give you some general overview about our plans for the next few years. Um, before we will see the slides, I would like also to say that I'm very happy about uh, some sites meeting and um, the discussions we made uh, during, this, uh, during this time, so I hope we will uh, collaborate in future. First of all, I would like to say that, oh, that's probably the beginning. Uh, first of, like, uh, of all, I would like to say that we are all aware that current situation on the plasma market is, let's say, insufficient. We, we know that European Council is giving us the warnings and the prognosis that there will be a shortage of plasma. Because of that and because of the international situation, I mean the COVID pandemics and uh, the, the aggression on Ukraine done by Russia, we are aware that it might be a priority for Polish government to be self-sufficient and to be safe in the field of uh, plasma uh, from the point of view of our citizens. Um, that's why we would like to create uh, the program which will ensure the safe access to the blood products for Polish patients uh, to, to, to give us the self-sufficiency in the blood products and also uh, which will give us the self-sufficiency in the processing and producing, uh, production of the blood products. Of course, uh, it is easy to build the, the factory. Probably it's the easiest part of the, um, of the plan. Uh, but uh, we would like to ask you for some help and to use your international experience uh, to not only build the factory, but also to change the ecosystem uh, of uh, the donation of the um, uh, plasma centers and, of course, uh, to create the friendly ecosystem which may be succeed uh, using also the um, teaching center, using also the R&D uh, facility which will support the proper uh, plasma production. I hope we will start the production in 2026, uh, but currently uh, we are starting, of course, uh, the legislation work. I will give you also some um, uh, action plan for the next months. Um, of course, the 
problems and the reasons are the same everywhere. I think uh, every country, every country is uh, using the same reasons to be self-sufficient, to have the plasma factory on its soil. It is the same in Poland. And of course, we are aware that the role and the use of the blood product is steadily increasing, and that's why we have to be prepared for this future. That's the action plan. And currently, we prepare some general model for that. We are currently making the legislation, which will create the, a specialized governmental agenda, which will be responsible for creating the factory, for a decision which model is suitable for Poland. We saw the great um, uh, case of the Egypt. I don't know if we can make succeed again in this model. But still, we are working on the legislation, and I hope after the holidays, um, the Polish parliament will undergo this legislation, and we can uh, start a discussion. So probably the next year will be crucial for us to decide what should be the next steps to do the construction, all the infrastructure to change the ecosystem of the donors' uh, centers in Poland. That's for now. I think uh, it's quite enough uh, to give you just the overview about our plans. It's a kind of priority for, for Polish government, and we are determined uh, to do it. After many discussions, after some side meetings, I think that the crucial, the, the key word for this Congress, which I am happy to do with you, uh, should be the partnership. So I believe that uh, partnership between our parties uh, can give us opportunity to create the let's say, European team and play together to give better access to the European patients uh, to the plasma products. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Dimitra, you. Thank you, and uh, I want to wish to thank the CPTA for inviting me to speak today at this meeting here in Berlin. Uh, my slides are up there, and I will also be giving a very short lightning talk as an introduction to our panel, so I think during our discussion we'll be giving a, a little bit more details. So I'm speaking after a speaker from Poland, which is a country that is 10 times the size of Croatia. So when we're talking about sufficiency and self-sufficiency, I think it multiplies by 10 the problems that we have in Croatia compared to what the problems are in Poland. But uh, despite this, uh, for a very long time, we've had uh, a, a history of uh, immunology institute in Croatia, which started with vaccinations in the, uh, in the early 19th century. And uh, this was making for almost 40 years uh, blood derivatives from uh, plasma until due to, uh, due to uh, GMP questions, it was closed in 2013. Um, uh, despite this, we still have a very high uh, rate of blood donations, uh, and this is something, uh, the big level of solidarity between the nation and, and uh, as mentioned before, the, uh, the memory of the war in Croatia also brought about a lot of this uh, solidarity, so voluntary blood donations is very, very high, and uh, uh, the, the, this is the, most of the plasma that is collected it, today is coming from, from this source. Um, but since 2016, since it is being collected, it's being sent abroad for, uh, for, uh, uh, for being uh, uh, used to produce uh, uh, medical, medical, uh, medical drugs from, uh, from plasma. Um, so there's currently no, uh, no institute or no institution in Croatia that is doing plasma pharesis. Um, we're looking at self-sufficiency in this in this area, and by law uh, today, a current law uh, regulates that no mon monetary compensation can be given for any type of blood or blood component. The the only benefit that anybody gets is the day off from work for for giving blood. Um, so, what are the current needs of patients in Croatia? We we for the current level of clinical application and clinical use. Of, uh, uh, of these products. We use approximately 140 kilograms of immunoglobulin and 1.4 thousand kilograms of albumin, as well as coagula uh, coagulation factors. Uh, approximately half of this is produced from the 20,000 liters of plasma from Croatia. The other remain remainder is imported. Uh, and as I stress, the current level of clinical application and use in Croatia is fairly low and is expected to rise in the coming years. 
Uh, we have a plan that is running out right now, so it's been in place since 2019 to 2022. Some of the parts of this national plan have been put into play, but most of it has, uh, it has not. One of the things that was mentioned was that the increase of plasma collection was to be done through uh, plasma ferrises, but only in transfusion centers, and none of these transfusion centers began to do this, uh, do this service uh, during this period. So in the future plans, we, uh, right now is being drafted the next four-year plan. Uh, I think all our former socialist and uh, Slavic countries are very good in, in writing these plans without really fill filling them out. Um, uh, one of the plans uh, is for make uh, new plans for the Immunology Institute for the production of immunology products. This is uh, vac vaccines uh, for snake bite venom and also for, pl for uh, 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 the, the production of plasma products. Um, so the plan is to process between 60 to 100,000 liters of plasma domestically uh, collected in the first phase, and as clinical indications and applications expand, more plasma, of course, will be necessary. Uh, it uh, again raises the question, as we had in our side meeting, with the raising the question of uh, feasibility studies and economic uh, reasoning behind this. Uh, this is something as a government political uh, political uh, decision a lot more than an economic uh, decision. Um, currently the plant is being planned in, uh, in Brescia, but it has some uh, legal problems concerning the land and might, might be moved to another location in Rubica. Both are very, very close to Zagreb. Rubica is the location of IKEA, so I, if IKEA can survive there, so can a plasma. Uh, plasma production plant, right? Um, uh, we have also the uh, potential of regional uh, cooperation between the countries of former Yugoslavia. Some, have, some discussions have been made in this direction. And uh, financing will be uh, placed either through EU funds or self-funds, self and even uh, some public-private partnerships have been discussed in the past and maybe also discussed in the future. And I thank you, and I look forward to discussing more and have, hearing your questions from the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the invitation. I also got some slides, so I hope that you'll be able to see it. Uh, very shortly. Uh, my name is Adrian Gorecki, and I'm a president of the Healthcare Education Institute from Poland. It is an NGO and a think tank taking care of uh, mostly things related to rare diseases, uh, patients with rare diseases, also including those treated with a plasma derived product. Uh, so I'm in the business for uh, more than 12 years. I was the president of the Polish National Patient Organization for patients with immune deficiencies. I was also a board member of the APOPI. I'm a lawyer by profession, but last uh, not least, I am a patient myself, a patient receiving PDMPs every week as a patient with uh, primary immune deficiency. So I can give a perspective both as somebody involved in healthcare issues in Poland for over a decade, but also a patient um, myself. So this is why I'm here, to give you a little perspective on the patient view and also the situation in Poland in Central Eastern Europe. But the first thing I would like to say that I'm really happy that we've got Minister Sierpiński here with us because this is a clear sign that Polish authorities are uh, seeing the, the issue, the need of delivering more plasma and securing needs of patients uh, using PDMPs as us, patients with immune deficiencies and other patients. And there's a clear signal, the presence of Minister Sierpiński here is a clear signal that they understand the need. Uh, when it comes to Poland, uh, we've got a great potential. And this is something that I would like to underline here, that Poland has a great potential to collect plasma. Uh, we did a report for PPTA last year uh, about Polish plasma market and PDMPs market. And in this report, uh, collecting data from various sources, we indicated that, for example, when compared to Czech Republic, of course, who has a one of the um, different model of plasma collection, but this is just an, this is an example. Uh, there is a collection per capita. Uh, uh, it is several dozens times more. I mean, Czech Republic is collecting several dozens times more 
plasma per capita than Poland do. So uh, this is uh, not an issue. This is a sign that we've got a great potential in Poland. I mean, when, after encouraging Polish society to donate plasma, we can reach such level like in uh, Czech Republic per capita, but in total, that means that we will be able to uh, collect enormous amounts of plasma that can be used to treat firstly Polish patients, but also contribute to the European uh, need of plasma to make us as a continent, as a European Union, less dependent on plasma from the US, but also to uh, contribute to the global need of uh, plasma. So we've got a great potential as a country, and I am really happy that there is a chance that it will be used in the next couple of years. But from a patient perspective, um, the situation is maybe a little bit different, but because from a patient perspective, it doesn't matter what is the brand of the product. The only thing that matters is the product. I mean that we have an access to product as patients, no matter if we talk about patients with PADs, but here we have no other option. We only get PDMPs, but also other patients uh, using plasma-derived therapies. We need life-saving therapy, so we need a guarantee that we will have an access to this product. This is the most important thing. But there's another one, it's safety. We need a product, we need an access to a product, but we need a safe product. So it uh, doesn't only mean that it's made from safe plasma. For example, I am sure that Polish plasma is safe. I know that Polish plasma is safe. I'm, as I said, I'm dealing with, with um, this topic for over a decade. But it's not enough. As you all perfectly know, there are uh, pathogen inactivation methods, uh, both for uh, blood products, but also for those for fractionations. For example, PPTA members, as well as, in, as, as far as I know, use at least two methods of inactivation. So we as a patient have a, um, we are aware that the product is inactivated, that this is great from our perspective. So not only uh, those things listed in the, in the uh, first line, but also those in the second line, I mean, safe collection, but also safe fractionation. So we need a product, we need a safe product, but uh, last but not least, we need a choice, or rather we need a variety of product. I mean, mostly because of the fact that there are different routes of administration, for example, of immunoglobulins. Not only different routes of administration, but different um, ways of treating patients. I mean, patients with immune deficiencies can be treated with IVAG mostly uh, at home, uh, at a hospital, but they can be also treated at home with subcutaneous immunoglobulins. So, and many research, also our research in the Institute regarding on Polish patients, but many other international research show that um, patients treated at home are happier, are more healthy and report better um, prospects for the future. Uh, they are just more positive, so we need to have product, we need to have a safe product, but we need to have a choice. What is the road administration, what is the type of the uh, treatment. Regarding the situation in Poland, uh, I will say more, you can find more information in our report, which is available online at plasmainpoland.com. I can also send you if you would like to do it. And well, we've got a great potential. We need a guarantee to have products in Poland, and I believe our Views are universal. I mean, all patients need a guarantee of supply, a guarantee of having a uh, safe product. And I really hope that this meeting will lead to developing um, some actions to ensure that the level of plasma collection is higher and higher in Europe. And uh, I'm really thankful for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ruth Sudhout. I'm an employee of Proteo Biosolutions. Proteo Biosolutions is a new kit on the block. It's a new name uh, in the field of the well-established uh, plasma fractionation companies that are there for many, many years. Um, but our history is rich. We come from uh, the Sanguine Blood Foundation, the manufacturing uh, assets uh, from uh, Sanguin in Amsterdam and um, in Belgium, uh, in Brussels, the former CAF and, oh, I need to do it by myself, sorry. Yes. Um, 
is called uh, CAF and lately uh, PIBE. Uh, those have been acquired by a new group of investors in this, uh, in this field of, uh, of, of making medicines available from plasma. Um, although our history is rich, uh, I am asked to, pre to share with you some experience that not always, even recently, have been successful. And uh, one, Patrick Robert provided a nice overview of all the things that need to, uh, needed to be in place to be a successful company in this, uh, in this field. And uh, what I can share from our own experience uh, in, in terms of um, what is needed to run a successful plasma fractionation plant, um, it is clear that you need to have access to plasma. And the problem with uh, companies that have established a domestic plant, uh, they receive domestic amounts of plasma. And if you really want to run an, an, an operation profitable, sustainable in the long run, uh, you have to have a certain scale. And uh, I'm coming from a Dutch, uh, uh, the Netherlands, which is a small country, uh, 17 million uh, inhabitants. Belgium is a small country as well, um, 10, 11 million inhabitants. All together, it is um, maybe significant but the amount of PDMPs needed uh, and the amount of plasma needed uh, is too small to run an, uh, an, a manufacturing site uh, efficiently uh, and, uh, and sustainable. You need to understand that building a facility is one thing, running a facility is something completely different. It's a different ball game. I fully understand uh, the, the need for uh, self-sufficiency, fully understand that need, uh, the patients need to be treated, but if you set up certain projects, re uh, think about how to run the business as well. Building a plant, you can do it by engineers. Building a plant, you can do it by uh, financial ne uh, uh, needs. But running it, that's something completely different. Making sure that the state of the art is always being addressed, that is something that needs to be fulfilled. That's an expertise. And uh, one of the words that came across from the uh, previous speakers, partnerships, Really, that's it. Our experience, um, three countries, I think Finland has been addressed. Uh, in the past, a an, an domestic fractionator in Belgium and the Netherlands as well. Today, Finland is a complete open market. They collect plasma, they sell the plasma to uh, the fractionator that wants to have it and is willing to pay the right amount of money for it, but there is no obligation to bring back the PDMPs made from it. Belgium, the situation is different. The Belgium uh, MOH is tendering the plasma with a requirement to for 100% in return of albumin and 50% of IVIG, 50% to be brought in the open market by uh, companies for their own risk. And this is a way to provide uh, a choice for uh, the, the clinicians to provide the right product to patients. And in the Netherlands, it is an open market. Um, the um, so plasma that has been collected by Sanquin, and the foundation that is still in charge of collecting uh, plasma in, in the Netherlands, they provide via a long-term arrangement to Protea uh, the plasma. And the obligation for Protea is to provide the PDMPs back to the Dutch market. It is still an open market. The customer makes their choice. And if it is not accepted, then we have the opportunity to export it. That is at least the, the situation today in those three countries. Um, that it didn't work out, that uh, was for, uh, uh, for two reasons. One, we didn't have the plasma to expand international to become, to work on a larger scale. So please think about that if you setting up, set something up locally Think about what you need to have as an operational scale. If it needs to be bigger and you need to have plasma available for international uh, expansion, um, don't underestimate the way you collect locally versus the availability of plasma internationally. This has, one be this has been at least one of the topics in our organization. If you always say you need to collect voluntarily non-ruminated plasma and you want to expand and you need to have access to other plasma as well, then you have this internal potential conflict to address as well. Um, 
We uh, managed to overcome this situation for many years um, by having contract manufacturing in place. Contract manufacturing means that we are not the owner of the, the raw material of the plasma, but a partner is bringing in the raw material and we were processing it. That gave us another 20 years of successful uh, business, but in the end, um, um, we were so successful in one product, the C1 inhibitor uh, product, um, that grew very fast, but in the end it was replaced by a monoclonal antibody and a large part of the revenues uh, fell away. And at that moment in time, the board of the foundation decided this is not uh, something we want to continue our business with. And therefore they divested it and Protea stepped in. My message is, uh, is again, having access to plasma, that's crucial. And secondly, if you want to build a plant, think about that you need to run it in an efficient, uh, sustainable manner, that you can always develop new products, that you can always maintain the GMP uh, that, is, uh, that is needed for that. I think all those items have been uh, addressed. Um, in addition, uh, timelines are long. Uh, we believe it is uh, at least five to seven years, developing plants, buying land, et cetera, et cetera, get the right permits. The investment is huge, not only for building the plant, but also for uh, the operation itself. Uh, it's a high amount of working capital that is needed. Don't forget about the regulations, um, not only the manufacturing license, but also um, the licensing of the, the plasma acquirement, uh, the product registrations, all these things. And again, my focus also on the operation. Um, access to plasma is, is vital as well. And that would be my core message for, uh, for now. Thank you. Thank you, Ruud. Um, I'm going to get straight into the questions and start with you, Redslav. Um, Poland has announced plans for a uh, plasma fractionation plant. Um, that's, we've, we've, heard a, we've heard a bit about um, the difficulties in this. And, it is a risky in, uh, enterprise. <laughs> Can, how much Polish pr plasma will you need to collect to operate an economically successful mm -hmm. fractionation plant? Uh, well, of course, thank you for this question. Uh, we are aware it is not an easy process. Yeah. We are aware it is uh, probably the establishing the factory is the easiest part. You yeah. can use the bricks, you can use the plot, and so on. But to create the sustainable ecosystem, you have to see all the helicopter view, I mean the whole picture, yeah. how to have the centers for the nation. Currently, we are taking only the whole blood, so maybe there is a space to create the mixed um, uh, ecosystem in the, for the donors. There should be also a discussion about um, some kind of compensation for the donors in the plasma market, because as Adrian said in his uh, presentation, there is a huge potential in Polish market, and we believe that we can at least two or three times multiply the number of plasma collected on our market. And according to our analysis, to be on the green field and to have the sustainable business, we should collect at least 800 liters of plasma every year, and it is possible from the Polish point of view, because as it was mentioned before, we are almost 40 million people country, so the population is quite big. And of course, we are also thinking about uh, international collaboration because it might be a kind of hub for the Eastern Europe where there also can be uh, some potential for that. All right. Okay. But if um, you, you mentioned 800,000 uh, liters of plasma, um, is, that, is that what you estimate to be the, uh, the break even point? Because I've heard um, others saying giving it 1.5 million liters. Well, of course. The, Many years ago, there was the estimation that 400 liters is quite enough. Currently, it is two times more or even three times more. That's why it is not so easy process. We decided to create, firstly, the group of professionals, yeah. like the governmental bureau, the Agenda, which will yeah. be responsible for uh, some kind of analysis for Sir Prime Minister to create the proper model for Poland, yeah. to decide which way will be suitable for our country, and then we will make all the decisions. So. Again, the partnership probably is the key to, to, to the future, and we are also looking for some benchmarks and uh, some experience. We saw so many pitfalls yep. and uh, collapse, 
and that's why we, we need your experience or your advice how to move forward and how to have win-win situation in our country. Thank you. Sinisha, I'm going to turn to you um, because you've been uh, studying the, the explaining the, the experience of Croatia. I wonder if you can tell us about the key challenges Croatia uh, faced when it tried to set it up and what were the um, what were the lessons you learned? Okay, so we're at very early inception phase right now as far as the new plant is concerned. And uh, right now the current situation, as I said, is similar to the Belgian situation. Yeah. It's being sent abroad and we're getting products back <coughs> according, according to contract and some financial agreement between the fractionation company and, and our immunology institute who's, who's doing the yeah. mediation between the hospitals and, and the external fractionation plants. Uh, future plans, it's very difficult to say which direction is going to go, especially when uh, the Minister of Health is not alone in the government. Okay, so he, once he gets his plans all set up, then he has to get the okay from the, mini from the Minister of Economy and the Minister of Finance. Yeah. And this is something that they will be scrutinizing very much the feasibility of the project, the long-term sustainability of the project, et cetera. So this is something that uh, it's, it's a public outcry that Croatia has uh, self-sustainable self uh, own pr production plant as it has for very many, many years. Um, but this is something that uh, it could be decided in the near future that it's not sustainable and it won't, it won't come around. But I'm not, uh, uh, as my colleague is an uh, advocate to the government and the president of Poland, I'm not representing the Croatian government. Um, this is something that is just publicly known uh, 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 from uh, newspaper articles, et cetera, where this is being discussed and it, it is planned uh, and plans are being made. Uh, however, uh, decisions have not been fully, fully made so far. Thank you. Adrian, I'm going to turn to you. Um, there are different patient treatment um, profiles for immunoglobulins in terms of the tolerability of certain products. How can we meet these divergent needs for patients and doctors and for public health? Well, <clears throat> as I said uh, during my short presentation, as patients we need to have an access to a variety of products, not only because of the root of administration, but, but also about their profiles, for example. I mean, as also probably most of you perfectly know, immunoglobulins, for example, cannot be uh, treated as biosimilars because they uh, have, uh, patients have different tolerance of, on every uh, single product. Mm -hmm. So even if we've got the one leading, let's say, product in a given country, because there are examples like this, patients need to have an access to other products yeah. in case this one is not tolerated well. Even my personal story is like this. I had to change my, one of my subcutaneous sorry, products from one to another because of the, uh, some kind of side effects yeah. made by the product. So it's, of course, my personal experience, but I will say the president of the organization, it was quite common, yes, that patients need to change the product because of the tolerance, even though if it's still immunoglobulinum humanum normale, yes, it's the same substance, but uh, this is the this is the case. So, as I mentioned, wide variety of products. So, access to treatment at home, access to treatment in the hospital, IVAG, subcutaneous NG, for example, but also an access to alternative if the first prescribed treatment by a physician is not tolerated well. This is also a part of let's say safety for patients. Yes, we need to have a safe product, but if something's it's not so well toler tolerated. Patients need to have a choice to, uh, to change the product. Thank you. Rude, I'm going to turn to you because you, you, you've been involved in actually setting this up. And, but your, um, uh, your institution made a very crucial decision um, to sell its manufacturing part of its uh, foundation. And what, why did that happen and what was the turning point? Uh, I think there were two moments in, in, in time. Um, one was uh, already in the beginning of the century yeah. um, that um, they realized that the scale of operation was simply not enough to maintain a new uh, product portfolio, to maintain a facility that was state of the art, etc. Mm. Uh, you need a certain scale revenue to do those investments. Um, and and um, yeah, the, the Dutch market was simply not, not big enough. So therefore they were looking for expansion. To do, to realize that expansion, you needed plasma, 
And uh, yeah, that didn't work out. We could not find the right amount of plasma yeah. uh, to successfully do that. We overcome by contract manufacturing, like I said. Um, and But yeah, in the end, uh, that also didn't work out due to that uh, one of the, the big successes um, producing C14 not only US but also the rest of the world mm. was being replaced. And again, there was the acceptance of the board of the foundation to say, okay, this is not our cup of tea, we step out. Right. It needs professionalism, it needs skills, it needs uh, experience. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to open this up to uh, questions, if there are any, from the audience uh, about the uh, process of setting up fractionation plants. Do we have any questions from the audience on this? for your patience. Uh, just a quick one. It's, it's occurring to me listening to this discussion that we haven't really talked about different phoresis arrangements, new machinery, uh, the, the tailoring, the more rapid collection of plasma, the ability to collect plasma and red cells in the same unit on the, on the same day, depending on requirements. And it seems to me if we're talking about extending plasma capacity, particularly in smaller countries, we, we shouldn't be using this huge industrial model. We should be thinking more about kind of local blood bank, local centers, and certainly the, the phoresis machinery industry is, is coming our way in that respect. The machines are getting more efficient, they're getting more flexible, and it seems to me that has advantages both for red cell collection and for plasma collection. I just wondered if people would like to comment on that. Um, Rude, since you've been actually involved in this, do you have a any thoughts on that? Uh, this is about plasma collection. Uh, my expertise is more on fractionation, the manufacturing okay. facility. Yeah. Um, in that case, Patrick, perhaps you can tell me, say something about that. Well, uh, there are some attempts to do that. I'm thinking of uh, the uh, the um, operation uh, managed by a doctor, um, a doctor in uh, Egypt at uh, Shabra Wishi Hospital, where uh, he collects uh, blood, I mean, it's a blood center originally, but he collects plasma and uh, makes some uh, uh, small volumes of uh, coagulation factors and IVIG, but uh, the cost uh, involved is not clear. Of course, he does not have to pay for the plasma, which makes a difference, but I, uh, I think it's a uh, pretty involved in terms of uh, um, staff and uh, the very meticulous. So it can be an initiative on a local basis, uh, but I'm not sure that this can be expanded and be considered as a solution for, uh, for self-sufficiency. I mean, it's very small and complicated. In fact, I think I remember uh, asking him whether this has been duplicated and I believe that uh, there were some attempts to do that in, I think, Costa Rica, and somehow it didn't work out. So there are some, some solutions, but um, it's not a proven uh, uh, solution, I, uh, seems to me. All right. Are there any other questions? In that case, it seems that I'm going to ask you, you something. I mean, I mean you've heard about the... Um, the um, the Polish plans and, the, uh, and, and from the panel, and I'm wondering if there's anything that has been said and done which you think could be applied to Croatia. Well, I, I think our, my Polish colleague said the magic word, which is partnership. So it's, you know, pan-European partnership from Portugal and how far east you want to go. Um, it, it, it's a question of what Brussels is mm -hmm. planning to do on, an, on a pan-European level from one side, uh, and what legislature through directives and regulations are, in, are going to be in place in order to ensure uh, a, a good supply of plasma in the, in the coming years. Um, then fractionation as such, maybe it should be more planned on a European level. Uh, I know and everybody knows that uh, according to the contract of Rome, et cetera, et cetera, 
uh, uh, healthcare is not uh, is not an EU level question. It's a it's on national levels. However, uh, cross border healthcare directive already went and and, tr and struck down a lot of these barriers. Um, unification of Europe and financial models, et cetera, et cetera. COVID, for example, uh, uh, war preparations due to Ukraine and, and Russian war. Uh, things are changing in Europe, making it more unified. Maybe a healthcare is one of the things that is, has been too, too broken down between uh, barriers between countries and should be more unified. Uh, maybe plasma is one of the glues that could put uh, Europe more more together and uh, make sure that not only plasma collection but fractionation is is on an EU level uh, so that no, but no country goes bankrupt because of uh, requirements of, of uh, uh, plasma, plasma products or, or due to collection of, of, of plasma. You know, may, maybe this is just an idea. Um, but, you know, uh, from, from EU legislature, uh, from the idea to get through U EU Parliament, it's a long, long road, and, and, and I'm, I'm not too uh, optimistic in this area, but I think uh, NGOs and, and uh, patient organizations, uh, physician organizations uh, could get together and push Brussels uh, in this direction. Adrian, I'd like to ask you a question about uh, security of supply for uh, PDMPs. Do we need a, a variety of suppliers to ensure that? Generally speaking, uh, yes. As I said, they may be a dominant one because there are countries where are, there is such kind of model. Right. But generally speaking, we need an alternative, not only because of tolerance, but also because of a situation when there are uh, issues with supplies of a specific brand, for example. Because we experienced a situation like this a couple of uh, years ago, there was an issue of suspicion, only suspicion, but. Nevertheless, uh, suspicion of uh, Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease that the donor had the Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease in, in Hungary, as far as I remember, and the whole batch of products were withdrawn from the Polish market. For example, so there, th th there need to they need to have an alternative, and even very recently in Poland we experienced uh, access issues to several uh, brands of immunoglobulins because some suppliers uh, managed to uh, deliver immunoglobulin contracted even contracted immunoglobulins and other. Uh, PDMPs to Polish market and other didn't, even they, if they get contract because of COVID-19 and the drop in donations. So this is why we always need to think about alternative, even though we get that there is a leading product, no matter what is the model of, of plasma collection and fractionation, there we need to have it, keep in mind that patients might need an alternative, also because of to tolerance, but also because that the they, there may, may be an access issue, there may be an accident, there may be a potential contamination in the factory, and many, many other uh, things can happen. Uh, we need to have an alternative as patients because this is a treatment can, that cannot be replaced. It can be, cannot be stopped. We need to have a constant supply of, of medicines. Right. Um, Radoslav, I'd like to ask you a question about, um, do you think your, the future plant in Poland can on its own should cover the growing clinical need for PDMPs in your country? Well, the, as mentioned before, I don't think it should. We should play together, and I think the, the, the supply chain should be together with other countries. So our idea, our general direction is not to be self-sufficient in 100% and nobody else. We would like to be the member of the European team to work together with the biggest players and to use the experience according uh, to the best. Yeah. So we will see what the future will happen, but it is not the general idea for this, for this project. All right. And I'm going to end with you, uh, Ruud. Um, uh, the public sector and private operators have different aims and different approaches. Um, where do you see the differences in both uh, business planning and in operational excellence? Yeah, then I need to characterize somewhat uh, bluntly. Uh, but, uh, but the public sector, uh, especially with a domestic focus, is offering all the products yeah. from domestic plasma. Yeah. Um, and the only ambition is to supply, which yeah. is, of course, uh, good. Um, but if something happens, and, and that was uh, addressed uh, already, yeah, then there is no supply at all. Because mostly, most of the yeah. times the markets are protected or not interested 
interesting for uh, the, the, the companies, the profit sector, to, to compete. That, that might be a problem. Um, I think if you want to do it in an efficient, uh, economical way, then you make choices about your, your product, uh, about the scale, uh, about additional plasma that needs to come in, uh, and you also take care of that there is a choice of products uh, that can be made by and the patient and the physician. And typically that is, a, yeah, uh, to highlight the differences, that, that would be it. Okay. Well, thank you. We're going to have to leave it here for, the, for, for this afternoon. I think this has been very, very interesting to hear about the different plans and different approaches to, uh, to dealing with uh, plasma and fractionation. Um, we, we, we've heard about the, the, the stories from uh, in the past of, of different fractionation plants across not just in Europe but around the world, and we've heard about the different needs and uh, the challenges that in, 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 in Poland and in, in Croatia, and of course the, uh, the, 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 the almost the business side of things. Um, it, do hang around because we, we're, we're going to have uh, we have a little uh, uh, presentation afterwards. But for the moment, can I ask you all to give your thanks to our panel here for giving their insights and sharing our, their views with us? All right. So we go. We uh, we're going to go. We're going to leave the stage, and the others are going to come along. Okay. <clears throat> So, can you already hear me? Okay, wonderful. Uh, very briefly, good afternoon, uh, almost good evening. Uh, my name is Oliver Schmidt. I am working for CSL Bearing, but today I am here and on behalf of the European Board of Advisory Committee of PPDA. And uh, who is attending this conference, not only since today, but uh, already the last years, so you might have already seen me. So there might be a link between my presence here and uh, the award we are going to, uh, to present. The uh, award I am talking about is the award of, uh, which takes the name of Joachim Hilfenhaus. Joachim Hilfenhaus was uh, a well-known virologist. He was the chairman of the AIPPI. So and uh, heavily involved in the safety and continuous, let's say, efficacy or improvement of efficacious treatment of plasma derivatives. So, unfortunately, uh, Joachim Hilfenhaus passed away relatively early, much too much early, and therefore uh, PTA decided already in 1998 to uh, create an award and. Uh, this award then should be given to uh, physicians, specialists doing the utmost for improving, improving the, the therapy of a patient suffering from rare diseases treated with uh, plasma derivatives, different types of plasma derivatives. Uh, you might remember some of these famous uh, physicians, professors, which cover the whole area of rare diseases. So the first one in 1998 was Ingmar Nielsen from Sweden. Uh, after that, we had uh, a long list of very important names such as Professor Brackman. So then we, wa we went uh, to another area. We had Professor Manucci uh, in the area of uh, hemophilia. So Professor Arroyo and Professor also Bernardi covering albumin therapies hepatologist. So you ask now, who will be the person this year? And someone knows already, this gentleman. So normally we did it differently. So I was here and was trying to create a business customs. So now already, because the, we see, Jan, you're, you're still here, but you're lacking regarding the last thought of the organization. So normally then I, do, uh, I told about the name uh, briefly introduce the person, and uh, this was today is slightly different. So 
Uh, today's winner is Professor Volker Wan, who's already to me on stage. Uh, Professor Wan, I think. <laughs> so here, I have to be honest, this is a relative long list of numbers, despite the fact that I'm, I'm a commercial, so I remember numbers pretty well. So here, uh, just a few numbers which try to uh, resume what Professor Volker Wan did. So, um, first of all, I have to thank Professor Wan that he is today around because he was sick till a few days before. And uh, thanks to the fact that today we are in Berlin, and Berlin uh, is not only the place of residency of Professor Wan, but also the, the area where he uh, terminated a long, very long uh, year, a year of important assignments, so working at the Charité. A hospital in the area of immunology. But before that, a very brief summary of what Professor Wan did. So uh, he became a physician after uh, studies in Heidelberg, if I remember correctly, in the year 76. So then became a specialist in, in allergology as well as in pediatrician, as a pediatrician, as a basic and allergology and pulmonology. Uh, moved over the ocean, over the Atlantic, spent two years also in a research area of cancer uh, at uh, New York, at the uh, SLEM University Children, oh, this was a difficult one. You, you will help me on that. What was, <laughs> <laughs> what was the exact Memorial thing? Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Thank you very much. So I'm very happy that you're here also for that. So after that, uh, he moved uh, to Düsseldorf where at University Clinic uh, did a very long and important contribution to both treatment as well as, as, well as research till 99. In between, he became professor and moved from uh, Dusseldorf to a clinic in Uckermark, which was a step in between Charité, where you spent the last seven, eight years of your university career a specific uh, treatment, treating immune, primary immune deficiency. So if I understood correctly, you're also at that point part of the Jeffrey Model Foundation as a center, which you already, you already had it since uh, the beginning of the years 2000. So a very long list of important activities, which Professor Wan will briefly uh, show and introduce to you. Uh, he with PBDA has a very long-standing collaboration, which I think has to mention here because this is an outstanding example how our industry can work together with academy in order to better, let's say, research and specifically diagnosis of treatments. Uh, what I'm talking about is Find ID, and I'm pretty sure, Professor Wan, you will tell us about others also about Find ID. If there is any other point you would like to ask afterwards, Professor Wan will be with us uh, also after this uh, talk, uh, when we will meet after his, uh, let's say, presentation outside to have, let's say, a uh, brief aperitif for dinner. So having stated that, I should also have Melanie. Thank you very much. So, so normally we have a, thank you very much, Melanie. Normally we have an award award with a very nice sculpture. The award is also what both a value as well as a, a symbol uh, sculpture. This sculpture, yeah, in these days where supply is an issue, has not arrived in time. We ordered it in time, but it's still there. I don't know now why. So therefore, this is what we are currently using as a kind of compromise for Professor Wan. I do know that we do it like that here. So, yeah, uh, thank you very much and very happy that you are today's 2022 Hilton House Award winner. So, please take this for that. Thank you very much. The, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you, Oliver. And I would uh, also like to thank the jury uh, for considering me for this prestigious award, <coughs> although I don't really know why I received it. it. I just did my work and so nothing special. Uh, but the jury might know. 
So I'm a person interested in primary immunodeficiencies and I would like to share a very few thoughts uh, with you before we all will enjoy the reception. This is a severe damage and it has nothing to do with patients, of course. But once you see this car crash, you think about it, wouldn't prevention have been better than waiting for this crash? So this is a human situation, it's another crash. It's a baby with severe combined immunodeficiency developing a pneumocystis pneumonia, which requires mechanical ventilation within a very few hours. And for these children, of course, we do have a solution. We have a newborn screening program since 2019 in Germany that works as effectively as in other countries too and has saved many lives. What we do is we take blood from the heels and analyze them for the tracks, the T-cell receptor excision circles, which correlates with the number of mature T-cells in the blood. So that was the good news. The bad news is that there are many other patients with primary immunodeficiency that we do not detect with this method. Only a very small amount is detectable by screening. So we need to do something about the others. The others have problems too. This is a three-year-old boy with a combined immunodeficiency developing a bilateral pneumonia and also already shows bronchiectasis. This is a 10-year-old girl with an IgG subclass deficiency with a destroyed lung. This is an adult with common variable immunodeficiency with bronchiectasis filled with pus. And we need to do something about the others. Wouldn't have a PID diagnosis and early treatment have been better than waiting for these conditions. We know that IgG treatment helps in these patients, but it requires a diagnosis. We're not in very good in this respect. I selected three papers dealing with the question of diagnostic delay. And the authors showed that within a range of four to 15 years, the diagnosis is delayed. So we need to do something better. This is a boy with chronic granulomatous disease, not IgG deficient. And you see that is a, in a really bad shape. And again, the question comes up, wouldn't a PID diagnosis and early treatment have been better than waiting for that condition? We saw this patient in Berlin and after a long course of treatment, including stem cell transplantation, he is a healthy young man. So, in order to develop things in Germany, we created the Find ID network, which Oliver already mentioned. This network tries to bring together all doctors of various medical subspecialties interested in the field of PID. And for those, we have developed several brochures specifically for these medical subspecialties. Two further brochures are supposed to be released in this year. In addition, for the experts in PID, we have the website immundefect.de, which provides information on how our immune system works, um, gives you information of normal values, age dependent on immunoglobulins, IgG subclasses, CD markers of various uh, cells, 
And in addition, we have a news ticker, which news every day. And once you think this is an interesting paper, you can directly approach the abstract in PubMed. So early detection of PID is useful and possible. Just let's do it. Thank you.